Uh, good morning, everybody. And that's good morning to people who are sitting here with us in the RI Auditorium and also those of you who are with us virtually. It's a bit strange to, uh, to be doing it this way, but at least we've managed to uh, have our sixth Underwood Symposium, which of course was postponed from last year. Um, for your reference, financial disclosures are available on the symposium's live web stream webpage. If at any time during this activity you feel there's been a commercial or promotional bias, bring it to our immediate attention. Please answer the questions about balance and objectivity in the CME activity evaluation. Now, as regards questions, for those of you who are here in the auditorium, you can just put up your hand and go to the microphone and ask a question uh, at the end of the session. Uh, for those of you who are virtual or who are actually here, you go to pollev.com forward slash Methodist, submit your question to the speakers. The questions will actually come up here on the main screen and the, uh, the two moderators will select these questions uh, as, we go, as we go along. There's free Wi-Fi available to all guests and conference participants. It's network, uh, the network is Methodist Guest Wi-Fi. In terms of evaluation, the, uh, an email will be sent from Houston Methodist CME the week following this activity with a link to complete the course evaluation and claim your CME credits. And we thank you in advance for providing feedback for future um, CME programs. Now, very importantly, the presence, the, all the presentation slides will be made available in PDF format. And if you follow these screens, you will see the URL, which I'm not going to read out. Um, um, which will show you how to, to uh, reach those. I should also tell you that the entire session will be archived and will be uploaded hopefully to our, the Underwood web, uh, website and also to the CME website in the future. So it will be available uh, in, in continuity. Uh, we've done the disclosures. Um, I should warn you also to please silent your cell phones. Um, now, the last thing and very important thing I want to do is to acknowledge our exhibitors. And we gratefully acknowledge the following companies for participating as exhibitors at this activity, AbbVie, Boston Scientific, Bristol-Myers Squibb, and Takeda Pharmaceuticals USA. Without their ongoing support, this and other programs that we have would not be uh, possible. So with those brief announcements, uh, we get off to an early start. And I would like to welcome Drs. McFadden and Comissay uh, to moderate the first session. interest in alcoholic liver disease. So I really am um, very excited that to hear him talk about alcoholic liver disease in the next uh, 30 minutes or so. So let's welcome Dr. Shetty. I guess I should look over here. Uh, thanks, Dr. Nkomse. And uh, thanks, Dr. Quigley and the organizers for inviting me. So we'll talk about uh, alcohol-related liver disease today. I uh, have no disclosures. And uh, here's the outline for the talk. We'll go through some epidemiology of alcohol use and then uh, uh, talk about alcohol-related liver disease, spectrum, screening, and diagnosis and prognosis, talk about treatment, and then go into a little history of transplantation and uh, some recent studies and uh, let's start there. So epidemiology-wise, alcohol, it's widely used. Uh, and the degree of consumption is variable depending on the area you look at. Uh, the graph here shows the per capita ethanol consumption in the U.S. over the last uh, several decades. And you can see that we peaked in 77 and started dipping in mid-90s and have slowly picked that back up in the last decade or so. The consumption has, again, continued to rise, specifically in the last year with COVID. And uh, you know, nationally, um, about 40 percent of the patients across all subspecialties who come see doctors experience problems with alcohol use at some point or another in their life. And worldwide, uh, looking at studies from the last decade, 6% of global deaths were attributed to alcohol use, and the annual economic cost of alcohol use, this is for all comers, not just for medical use, is estimated to about be around $250 billion in the U.S. Uh, when you compare that to the sales, um, you know, it's a quite a robust industry, and you can see why it's promoted uh, socially. 
Looking at some trends in U.S., uh, you know, the summary of these slides is really to say that a lot of patients do, meet and do tend to meet uh, alcohol use disorder. Up to a third of the patients in their lifetime who tend to see physicians across all subspecialties will meet alcohol use disorder at some point. And uh, U.S. national surveys suggest that 53 percent of patients uh, who've been seen by uh, physicians in the last 30 days most likely abused alcohol, and 23 percent of them may have likely binged on alcohol. And it's the third leading cause of preventable death in U.S. and uh, reduces uh, years lived by about approximately about 30 years. And uh, looking at trends over the last two decades, uh, alcohol-related liver disease is now the leading cause of hospitalizations among patients with cirrhosis. In particular, um, mortality and morbidity uh, has risen significantly, particularly among young individuals, uh, as represented in this graph. Um, patients aging 25 to 34, their rates of mortality have nearly tripled from 1999. A similar rise has been seen among females. And uh, there are some safe limits that have been suggested by NIAAA. Uh, these are more than a couple of decades old. More recent study from five, six years ago that looked at uh, the global burden of the disease, so not just the medical burden, but also looking at the social and financial burden of alcohol, suggested that no amount of drinking was safe. So it's important to recognize alcohol use disorder early prior to the presentation of alcohol-related liver disease. Uh, this has been a key part of the more recent update to the WASLD guidelines recommending early screening. And uh, there are multiple tools available for screening, CAGE being among the uh, well-known ones taught in medical school. But the more prevalent one used and probably the more concise one to use are the audit and audit C, which are validated in the VA population. And my favorite one is the audit C because it's short, uh, limited to three questions. Uh, can assess alcohol use of patients within the last year by asking them simple questions such as, are they drinking at all? And if they are drinking, how many drinks do they drink typically? And how often do they drink more than five drinks, suggesting binge use? And if screened positive, uh, the most important thing to consider is some kind of intervention. This often gets overlooked, the importance of doing some motivational interviewing and some counseling from physicians and uh, referring these patients. Uh, key part is to consider referring them to addiction medicine. This is not always available at all institutions. Uh, but if not addiction medicine, consider referrals to rehab or uh, informal support groups such as AA, and if they have underlying mental health disorders, to consider psychiatry consultation. So we'll switch gears and uh, talk a little about alcohol-related liver disease now. Um, so a big change in the last five years, maybe, uh, has been the change in terminology and trying to avoid using the term alcoholics, because uh, it stigmatizes patients and, um, you know, impinges on their dignity. So a trend has been uh, suggested to stop using the term alcoholics and to actually diagnose them with the disorder of alcohol use disorder, and instead of calling it alcoholic cirrhosis or alcohol liver disease, to reframe it as alcohol-associated liver disease. The term alcoholic hepatitis still hasn't been modified. The expectation is that it'll change in the upcoming guidelines. Uh, this is brief pathophys. Um, you know, use of alcohol leads to increased metabolic stress and increased fatty acid synthesis leading to steatosis, which then can progress to inflammation by activation of the innate and adaptive immunity. And inflammation can then progress to fibrosis and cellular cells. A uh, key part of the slide is to show that the process is reversible with abstinence. However, if advanced fibrosis starts setting in or cirrhosis starts setting in, the reversibility decreases dramatically. Uh, what are the risk factors that increase risk of alcohol-related liver disease? Uh, drinking heavily, clearly. Uh, there are certain patterns that are worse than others, so drinking while fasting or binge drinking tends to be a lot worse than um, low amount of daily drinking. Women in particular are more susceptible to alcohol-related liver disease, and there are certain genetics that are uh, commonly seen to advance uh, NASH uh, are also associated with increased risk of accelerated alcohol-related liver disease, in particular the lipid droplet genes such as PNPLA3. Having a secondary liver disease clearly will add to um, alcohol-related liver disease and its progression, and smoking is uh, equivocally bad. What are risks that uh, prevent progression of alcohol-related liver disease? They're limited. Uh, coffee consumption has been shown to be uh, very helpful. Ideally, drip coffee, one to two cups per day. And there are a couple genetics uh, or single lipid droplet gene uh, listed here that helps prevent onset of steatosis and fibrosis. Other questions that often come up uh, among patients are what kind of alcohol is safe to drink? Uh, really, uh, there's no good data to suggest one alcohol is safer over another, although red wine has had some 
uh, positive studies in patients who do not have underlying liver disease. And then a moderate amount of, there's questions about whether moderate amount of alcohol use in patients who are overweight, is it safe or not? Uh, the, we still need further data to kind of give us clear answers on this. Alcohol affects multiple organ systems in our body, and not just the liver, uh, creates significant social challenges, loss of productivity, but also leads to significant mental health issues, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, and pancreatitis and dementia and such. The clinical presentation uh, is variable and often nonspecific from a symptoms perspective. Patients usually present most commonly with fatigue, but depending on how advanced their liver disease is, they may present with some muscle wasting and abdominal pain. Alcoholic hepatitis tends to have a pretty classic presentation where patients appear septic, have right upper quadrant pain, fever, jaundice, often are confused to have gallbladder issues or biliary liver disease and get unnecessary procedures. Um, so diagnosis has been discussed. I'll go over that in just a second. Uh, and imaging can be quite variable depending on the stage of their presentation. It can be as simple as just steatosis, may progress to have hepatomegaly and cirrhosis. So I was referring to this particular section about alcohol hepatitis. It's important to diagnose this. Uh, we've moved away from biopsying patients in the last couple of decades uh, with the biopsy really not being considered essential unless they have significant confounding variables. So a classic presentation tends to be onset of jaundice within the last couple of months. And these patients often will have stopped drinking at the time of presentation. They often stop drinking because they're feeling poorly. Usually abstinence is less than two months again. ASD and ALT ratio often tend to be two to one, and the enzymes are not going to be very high. Uh, they're going to range between 50 to 400. And bilirubin often tends to be elevated and usually is above three. If they meet these criteria and lack the confounding factors, confounding factors could be if there's a clear suspicion for drug-induced liver injury with a culprit drug identifiable, or if they have concomitant liver diseases, then your suspicion for alcohol hepatitis will be a little lower, and in these patients, a biopsy may be considered. So what are some of the prognostic scores? Matter use description function is well known. We have a lot, lot of experience with it. Uh, is used in uh, multiple studies as a key inclusion criteria. And matter use function greater than 32 carries a significant mortality. Uh, other scores like MELD and Glasgow alcoholic hepatitis scores are also useful. I often use them in combination. And Lilly's score helps us assess whether we should continue steroids or consider stopping them after a week's worth of use. So treatment of alcohol hepatitis absolutely starts first with abstinence, and it can't be stressed enough. Uh, it's very important to, again, remember to refer these patients to addiction medicine or a psychiatry or some form of informal support group. This often gets overlooked, and it's just an expectation that we have out of patients that when they're sick, they will consider being abstinent, uh, but really can't be stressed enough. Aside from abstinence, uh, other treatments are not as effective in uh, alcohol hepatitis. Prednisolone uh, has been studied over and over again in multiple trials, with the largest being the most recent STOPA trial, uh, which did not meet its uh, study endpoint. Uh, recommendations are if the matter function is greater than 32, and they don't have any contraindications within the first three days of presentation, such as infections, renal failure, or GI bleeding, or are severely sick with multi-organ failure. Uh, you should consider holding steroids in these patients. Uh, if they don't and they meet the criteria, I will rarely use steroids. Uh, I usually am not in favor of it, primarily based on the STOPA trial. But the STOPA trial did have a postdoc analysis supporting the use of steroids for, for some benefit in the first 30 days. So for those who support use of prednisolone, uh, there is some benefit uh, shown by the study. Nutrition is an essential part, and nutritionists should be consulted at pre initial presentation. They should be encouraged, ideally, to eat. Enteral feeding is far better than uh, intravenous feeding. And uh, ideally, these patients should be on a high-calorie, high-protein diet. Outside of steroids nutrition, uh, a few other medications have been studied. NAC, in particular, has been studied in Europe, with uh, often co-administered with steroids. And it's shown to decrease the risk of infections and HRS in early studies. However, we need further evaluation of this. Uh, so it's a good consideration, because uh, risks associated with NAC use alone is low. Um, Nupogen has also been studied with speculation that it helps uh, both with an immune response and helps with uh, stimulating liver regeneration. However, the studies uh, are limited to just a pilot study and hasn't really uh, taken off. And then pentoxifiline, uh, studied in the early 90s, showed uh, uh, great promise of studies from uh, Southern California with both improvement in short-term mortality and decreasing the risk of developing renal failure. Follow-up trials since then have not really reproduced these results. TNF inhibitors have also been studied, and the trial was discontinued due to increased risk of infections. 
So we'll move from there to transplantation. Uh, and cirrhosis and alcohol-related liver disease tends to carry a similar course to other related liver diseases. A uh, key point to make here is that when patients are decompensated, uh, refer them early for liver transplantation. And the decisions on patients' candidacy should really be limited to the transplant center. Avoid trying to make decisions about transplant candidacy uh, outside of the review boards. So coming back to the stigma associated with alcohol-related liver disease, um, it's often been described, you know, it's, it's quite controversial, uh, often been described as a self-inflicted disease. Uh, these patients are considered to be weak-willed, and uh, um, because they can't seem to help themselves, why should we help them by offering them a liver transplant in the setting where liver transplantation is such a limited resource due to lack of sufficient organs? And this dates back to early days of transplantation. So what is the history? Looking back at uh, the pre-cyclosporin era, the first 10 transplants that were done in Pittsburgh, um, out of the 10 patients that were transplanted for alcohol-related liver disease, 9 out of 10 of them died in the first four months. And the blame was placed on extrahepatic manifestations of alcohol in these patients. Uh, however, follow-up studies in the next decade in the 70s showed that uh, it was really probably the immunosuppression. Once immunosuppressants, immunosuppressants that were available improved, uh, we saw survivals as high as 70% within the first year, which led to the first uh, NIH consensus conference in 1984, where alcohol-related liver disease was accepted as an indication for liver transplantation. Uh, a key stipulation was put in place where the patients had to remain abstinent for a specific amount of time. They didn't uh, essentially, they, they didn't really clearly state how long do these patients need to remain sober. And then this was further validated in the 1991 uh, financial administration meetings for uh, health insurance uh, where they approved alcohol-related liver disease in, in, as an indication and would start paying for it, but again put in a stipulation that a significant period of abstinence was required. This then led to the adoption of the six-month rule, uh, where looking at studies from the insurance companies from 1990s showed that all insurance companies, or majority of the insurance companies, required a six to 12-month period of sobriety prior to approving liver transplantation. And the justification given for the six-month rule by uh, physicians was that it gave time for the disease to potentially improve to assess and see which patients actually need transplantation. And then it also allowed the patients to complete rehab and assess which of them are more likely to relapse versus who are going to remain sober. This led to close to 85% of the centers in 1990s adopting the six-month rule to the extent where in 1997, UNOS decided to make this a universal requirement across all centers. Uh, however, this failed when uh, a legal battle took place and the lawyer said that we really can't enforce this particular rule. And then um, <coughs> looking at, you know, Moving from 1990s to 2000s, looking at the referral disparities, uh, studies from Europe showed that only 5% of patients who were dying from alcohol-related liver disease and cirrhosis ended up getting a liver transplant. And a 2007 study from U.S. showed that only 4% of patients with alcohol-related liver disease in the U.S. were actually listed for liver transplantation, with more than 90% of the patients who had alcohol-related cirrhosis not getting a referral to transplant center due to the outside providers making a decision that these patients did not meet transplant uh, candidacy. Uh, estimated deaths from this was approximated about 12,000 annual deaths. And if you move forward to this decade, a recent study from last year uh, showed th uh, this was an online survey um, and it included close to 300 physicians that were across multiple subspecialties. Only 2% of them were transplant hepatologists, 8% of them were gastroenterologists, majority of them were internal medicine, family medicine, surgery, and other subspecialties. And 63% uh, of these physicians during their training were trained at a transplant center. And one of the key questions asked was, at what point would you consider referring these patients with alcohol-related liver disease for transplant candidacy? Uh, only 31% said that regardless of their duration of sobriety, they would consider referring them because they did not want to make the decision of uh, uh, considering patients for their transplant candidacy. And close to 70% of patients, 70% uh, of physicians said that they would not refer the patients and would require at least a six-month, if not a one-year period of sobriety in 26% of the group, and a small fraction choosing not to refer patients who use alcohol at all for liver transplantation. So what has changed since 
the 1990s, as we've shown uh, across multiple studies, that liver transplantation, regardless of period of sobriety, uh, is doable, and specifically in patients presenting with severe alcoholic hepatitis. Um, this was the initial study, uh, it's a multicenter trial from Europe, where early transplantation was proposed for patients who failed steroids, and uh, they did carefully select the patients based on their psychosocial profiles. 26 patients were enrolled and showed six-month survival was excellent at 77 percent, and uh, the rate of recidivism was quite low at 11 percent in these patients dating out to two years. This is, since then, we've done multiple more studies in the U.S., including at centers at Mount Sinai and Johns Hopkins, uh, all showing similar support for good outcomes within the first year and third year and low rates of recidivism. Our center participated in the American Consortium for Early Transplantation for Alcoholic Hepatitis. Uh, 12, 11 other centers were included in this, and 147 patients were transplanted uh, during the time period of the study. And one year survival was excellent at 94%, and three year survival was just as good at 85% uh, when compared to other etiologies for liver disease. And the rate of recidivism was quite low, with one year rates at 10%, three year rates at 17%. Now, rates of recidivism in the other studies that I mentioned earlier is a little higher, closer to 20%, depending on which year you're looking at from a follow up standpoint. But they supported that the six month rule really shouldn't be put in place, and we should really reconsider. Uh, the duration of sobriety that we request of our patients based on their psychosocial profile. Again, these patients were carefully selected. And based on these studies, since the early uh, initial study from 2011, we've seen a significant change in, uh, across all centers in the U.S. where the rates of transplantation for alcoholic liver disease has significantly taken off. Uh, dating back to 2012, we've seen a significant rise uh, uh, up until 2019, and 2020 data is still Pending, but we expect a similar uptrend in patients being transplanted for alcohol-related liver disease. So a quick look at the recidivism discussion. This often comes up, and uh, looking at rates of relapse, we'll try to compare general population to post-transplant patients. Uh, general population, so these are patients who are untreated, as in they're told after their initial presentation to physicians that they need to be sober on their own. 84% of them tend to relapse within the first year. 82% at three years, and up to 90% in their lifetime will go back to drinking heavily. And if you then look at Alcoholic Anonymous, um, when they refer to this, 50 to 75% of patients, after completing their 12 steps, will go back to drinking at a one-year time point. Now, the studies are variable depending on which studies and the strengths of their studies. Lastly, if you send patients to more formal treatment, like CBT, like cognitive behavioral therapy, depending on the studies and the duration of follow-up, some have been as short as 12 weeks and others have been as long as one year, 30 to 70 percent of the patients tend to go back to drinking after completing cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's a challenging disease to treat. Relapse is expected. Um, a, a key difference in the, in the transplant setting is that they have a lot more support. Uh, so looking at relapse rate within alcohol-related cirrhosis, uh, and, and another point to make is that patients who are selected for transplantation often tend to have better psychosocial profiles. We are mindful of trying to uh, address these things in the uh, medical review board when we're assessing their candidacy, but the annual relapse rate in patients who are transplanted for cirrhosis tends to be at about 5%, with 10 to 50% rates, depending on the studies we look at over the last one to three years. This rate is slightly higher in alcoholic hepatitis patients with relapse rates postulated at about 20 to 40% in one to two years. And if you compare this to uh, recurrence of other liver diseases, uh, the rates are not significantly off. Uh, fatty liver tends to often reoccur, up to 100% of patients, if you, depending on how long you follow the study. Autoimmune hepatitis similarly tends to reoccur. And uh, same with other biliary uh, diseases and HCC, all indications for liver transplantation. And all uh, um, are challenging diseases to treat after, but regardless, we choose to continue treating them. So important to kind of refocus and understand that alcohol use disorder is, is a challenging disorder to treat, but in the transplant setting, these patients have far more resources, uh, have, don't just have their individual providers and their individual caregivers, but often tend to have uh, transplant coordinators, social workers, a hepatologist, uh, behavioral medicine team, often providing a lot of support. And, uh, with that, I'd like to end and say, you know, alcohol use disorder and associated liver diseases on the rise. 
uh, patients with alcohol-related liver disease really have two underlying disorders. Transplantation only fixes the liver disease. The alcohol use disorder persists and needs continued treatment. Early screening and intervention are essential in alcohol use disorder, and treatment often starts first with abstinence. So variety requirements have really changed, and there's increasing acceptance for early transplantation for alcohol hepatitis, and the decision for transplant candidacy is best decided at the transplant center. Post-transplant, these patients often need continued treatment for their alcohol use disorder and to prevent relapse. And I'll save the questions for later, and here are some of my sources. Uh, excellent talk, and uh, we will um, save questions for the uh, Q&A session. Thank you, Dr. Shetty. That was, uh, that was an excellent overview, and certainly um, a good perspective, not only <clears throat> currently, but historically. And I think that uh, it's nice to know that trends have actually uh, starting to lift as far as the stigma of alcoholic liver disease. We're going to switch gears a bit, but nevertheless, still a very vexing problem that hepatologists have to deal with, and that is with uh, ascites and hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, Dr. David Victor, <clears throat> who has been here one year short of my uh, nine years, uh, comes from Johns Hopkins, and he is going to talk to us about ascites and encephalopathy and define the problem and maybe what's new uh, currently and on the horizon. David. Thank you all very much, Dr. McFadden, Dr. Nkomase. <clears throat> Each year I do this uh, symposium, uh, Dr. Quigley challenges me to do something more difficult than the last. This year it's to combine two completely separate talks into 20 minutes. <laughs> so we'll get started, uh, hopefully. Uh, so we'll start with a case. This is a 43-year-old female who presented to my clinic uh, with new onset ascites. She'd been seen in the ER for the last two weeks uh, with progressive dyspnea on exertion and was diagnosed with ascites. She was told she had cirrhosis. She underwent a paracentesis times two in the ED over the last month. Her past medical history was fatty liver disease, hyperlipidemia, a history of obesity, hypertension, insulin-dependent diabetes. Uh, she had no history of IV drugs, but did have an extremely social alcohol uh, history with six to 12 beers three to four times per week. Uh, on exam, she was ill-appearing. Her blood pressure was slightly low. Her BMI had uh, descended to 27. Uh, she had a firm distended abdomen with a fluid wave. She had two plus uh, bilo uh, bil uh, bilateral lower extremity edema with decreased uh, shoulder bulk. Uh, she had stigmata of dis uh, liver disease. Her labs, as you can see, reflect a low sodium, moderate elevations of her AST and ALT, uh, total bilirubin of 4.3 and a moderate uh, INR. Her paracentesis fluid is shown to the right. We'll discuss that in a minute. So cirrhosis is the most common cause of ascites, but this uh, Pac-Man uh, appearing does have a mouth that has other opportunities for uh, ascites. So just because they have fluid in the abdomen does not mean they have liver disease alone. Uh, peritoneal malignancy, heart failure, tuberculosis, less likely in our country, but worldwide still a problem. And other problems are uh, actually something you must consider. So when we go back to her studies, you can see that her albumin it was one with a SAG or serum albumin gradient of 1.8. She does not appear to have uh, an infection, and her total protein is 1.9. When you look down, our, uh, this slide uh, is from the AGA a long time ago, but still works. It shows that a SAG of greater than 1.1 with a protein less than 2.5 is most likely caused uh, by cirrhosis. So we were confident that this young lady had uh, cirrhotic uh, ascites, and we had to figure out what to do. So we initially placed her on diuretics, which is the standard management, encouraged her to follow a two gram sodium diet, which actually, if anybody has to do that, it is more than saying eat low salt. You have to actually counsel them on how to read a label. We encouraged her to have some protein supplementation because she was actually cachectic below her ascites. 
and we tried to tie, uh, and we set her up for another paracentesis. Uh, we gave her five liter maximum with 25 grams of albumin because of the concern for kidney damage uh, or uh, 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 paracentesis related complications. We titrated her uh, spironolactone and, Alda and Lasix to 60 and 150. She had acute kidney injury and cramping uh, higher than that. She began to require paracentesis every week. She said that her life was miserable. For those in the audience, if you look at the cartoon to the right and those online, this is how she really felt. She felt normal for three to five days after a paracentesis. She felt terrible for about a week. She would fight for the, and complain and try to get her paracentesis done shorter, and then she would have her paracentesis every other week, feel well for maybe a day or two completely, and then begin the cycle again. She was literally wasting away under her paracentesis therapy. So what are her options? Should we just continue doing her paracentesis over and over and over, or should we uh, consider other options? So the pros of paracentesis is it's somewhat helpful and it's relatively safe. Anyone can do it and it can be done anywhere, but it does not change the physiology of her liver or the ascites. Whereas we know the other treatment that's most common in ascites is uh, a TIPS. It decreases the portal pressure, it can dissipate her ascites, uh, but it's contraindicated in this lady because her MELD was greater than 18 and it has multiple other complications shown here. She did not have any regurgitation or heart failure, but we did not, were not able to pursue paracentesis for this patient. So is there more we can do? Oh man. Is there more we can do? So this is a study highlighting the use of rifaximin and mitodrine to improve uh, clinical outcomes in refractory ascites. I include the schematic to the right because Dr. Quigley really enjoys these uh, diagrams. But it shows uh, the study set up where they compared a two to one or four to one ratio of uh, uh, patients on rifaximin and, uh, and mitodrine. And they were able to show that it improved both their mean arterial pressure, sodium, urine output, creatinine clearance, they had a weight loss, and 78% of the patients had response, a complete response, meaning no further paracentesis on this therapy, with only 30% having complete response in the control group of diuretics alone. More interestingly, only 4% had no impact in Zyfaxin and Mitodrine in this group. It also had a significant improvement in their overall survival. So this is something we can do more in our existing patients. And that will be the trend and theme of today is what can we do with our existing technology to try to reappropriate it in a different way to assess these difficult and common problems that are very uh, difficult, uh, they're very challenging for the clinician. Well, we want to know is there something more than albumin? Is there something better to do? In Japan, this is very common at this point for malignant ascites, but is being applied now to refractory ascites, which is concentrated ascites reinfusion therapy, which is where we take the ascites out of the patient, place it through a multiple filters, as you can see on the right, and consistently remove fluid from it to concentrate the patient's own proteins and give them back instead of giving them uh, synthetic albumin. The benefit to this, as you can see uh, in the graph on the bottom, that they're de they uh, require less albumin. They also uh, are requiring less paracentesis in some studies. But in this one, it highlights that there are some complications in that passing it through multiple filters, these patients are more likely to bleed. So this is a technology that we may see but is not currently utilized here. So I don't think there's anything better than albumin yet for this patient. This is the constant question when patients are frustrated. Why can't you just put a catheter in my side and I can drain it myself? The radiologist said I can. In the radiology literature, you read it and it will read that they are technically successful and have the same complication rate as other peritoneal catheters. In the hepatology literature, you read uh, infection rates up to 40 to 50% in these cases. But this is a recent series that uh, was actually, I highlighted, stopped because it was run by a bunch of hepatologists that they couldn't find patients who were adequately safe to provide this for because they did not meet uh, exclusion criteria. 
or they uh, had complications with the Plurex. So what they found was that they were successful in four patients uh, out of the eight that they, or out of the six that they uh, placed in the Plurex arm. They were successful, but two were removed in, uh, uh, due to infection. So these are options for patients, but in carefully selected patients who understand that the risk of infection and the frequency of changing is something that we must do. So this is an option, but it's not my favorite. Um, as you can see, it had no real change in the two groups, so it was as effective as paracentesis, however. So the question also comes up, and this is um, often asked by patients who uh, want to be fixed, is why can't you just put a shunt in me? Well, Denver drain is an uh, option where you place a peritoneal catheter and then insert the other end into the vena cava or uh, right heart in trying to allow the patient to manually pump fluid from the abdomen into the systemic circulation. These are pretty effective. In uh, about 83 to 87% uh, of the patients, they will have decreased uh, changes in their uh, paracentesis. Uh, but they will also require, have multiple rates of complication, including catheter occlusion, uh, simple ascites is required, they have an increased risk of variceal bleeding, and they have post-shunt coagulopathy that can be challenging. They also, in high-risk patients, are challenging to put in because of the subcutaneous uh, edema and bruising. So there's got to be something better than a Denver drain that's been around since the 60s or 70s. So in Europe currently, there is a technology called Alpha Pump. It is a subcutaneous diet device that moves uh, ascites from the peritoneal uh, uh, cavity into the um, uh, urinary bladder. It activates every 15, 10 to 15 minutes so that you constantly don't feel like you have to pee, but it is in also inactive at night for the same reason. It is minimally invasive and has been shown to be somewhat effective in decreasing the need for paracentesis in these patients. I highlight that these patients were child's B and C patients, so they did not have uh, the, the healthiest of the sick, and they did have decreased requirements of both the number of paracentesis and the volume that they um, uh, required in these paracentesis. They did have a rates of infections that were improved with surgical technique in their two cohorts. The long-term follow-up of this uh, technology has shown that it is a durable response with decreased numbers of patients having paracentesis both at three and six months, and the amount of volume required for paracentesis was much less in the two groups. The problem is, is that when you read through it, only three patients out of the 36 that they followed for two years made it through the entire team, uh, uh, study. There were multiple withdrawals for transplantation, but multiple withdrawals for complications of the technology itself. So it's, there is something to it, but it's not quite ready for mainstream, I think, for everyone. So last is what's old is new. Now, I'm from Kentucky, so the lady on the left was pretty cool when I was in middle school. Uh, acid wash denim, I never thought would make it back, but seems to have been around again. So nutrition remains the mainstay that I preach. If you talk about something that really works, but is the most challenging, is nutrition. This was a study that showed that uh, if patients were able to be compliant, which only 50 out of the 450 were able to comply with an exercise and a protein supplement uh, regime. If you were able to do that, they did not have an improvement in their overall ascites, though if you look in the middle um, here, there was a trend toward that, but it was not clinically significant. They had an improvement uh, in uh, their, mel their MELD score actually did better, their hand grip strength improved, and the patients who had no refractory ascites were trending towards significance as well. But most importantly, they had an improvement in overall survival and were more likely to be transplanted. So nutrition remains important. Now, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit, so I apologize. Uh, so the patient improved because she made significant lifestyle changes and is now uh, tolerating uh, life without paracentesis. 
So hepatic encephalopathy is a patient uh, presents to the ER who has recurrent uh, encephalopathy, as you can read. The more important thing here is to note that he didn't do it because he was being dumb. He did it because he had to participate in his life. He held his lactulose and did not want to have uh, multiple stools during his family's uh, funeral. This is the uh, underlying general pathophysiology. This is being explored and probably not uh, well characterized at this point. The causes of hepatic encephalopathy we all know, but it should not be that it's only liver failure, infection, uh, too much or too little stool, GI bleeding, uh, electrolyte abnormalities, drug problems, renal problems. Our current treatment, everybody in here, even our fellows probably know this, that there's lactulose and zyfaxin. I think every ER doctor, third year medical student knows the treatment of hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, the, uh, also we have older treatments which are antibiotics. The actions, oh I apologize this didn't come out well, the actions of lactulose and the antibiotics. Uh, the antibiotics decrease urease producing bacteria whereas the uh, lactulose works by scavenging ammonia and turning it into ammonium which is passed out. These are the current uh, active treatments for hepatic encephalopathy. These are exploratory as well as uh, multiples that we already use. So we're going to focus on three today because I don't have time to get two lectures in one. We're going to focus on albumin, fecal mo microbiota transplant, and polyene, poly polyethylene glycol. So albumin for hepatic encephalopathy was a concept until I read about it didn't make a lot of sense. I know that uh, albumin does improve the uh, oncotic homeostasis and that it decreases oxidative stress in the body. Early phase 2b studies showed that it did decrease overt uh, uh, hepatic encephalopathy events, but larger studies have shown that it does not actually improve your rates of hepatic encephalopathy, but does have in patients with ascites. Uh, improvement in survival with just albumin inf uh, infusion alone. So fecal microbiota transplant, I want to let everybody know when I uh, applied for this job, uh, I guess uh, Bob brought up I'm almost getting close to a decade here at Methodist, I was talking about a uh, fecal microbiota transplant for hepatic encephalopathy and everybody thought that was gross and funny and silly. Now we are actually doing it. So we're doing it because the fecal microbiome is different in cirrhotic patients. There's a deficiency in protective bacterial taxa, and the patients with hepatic encephalopathy are more likely to have pro-inflammatory gut microbiome populations. This is the first uh, trial for uh, hepatic encephalopathy done by uh, Josh Bajaj in um, uh, Richmond. But what I want to point out is they did use a rational stool donor. I don't know if an irrational stool donor would have been <laughs> less effective. <laughs> However, what we see is that their Shannon diversity index, which diversity here is bad, less diversity is good. Also their uh, cognitive testing improved, both the Stroop going up is better and the PHSS is, or PHES going down is good. So they showed uh, improvement overall with just infusion of rational stool. The long-term effects were shown again in 2019 by the same group that showed that the, uh, the number of hepatic encephalopathy episodes in the standard of care versus fecal man uh, FMT were much decreased. This was also shown in their 12 to 24 month changes. Again, their hospitalizations were much less, though the standard of care group here uh, contracted as well. Their changes in their cognitive scores were improved in both the uh, FMT groups. And for those that know all your bacteria uh, taxa, all the good bacteria were increased with, a decrease, with an in, with a, uh, increase in bad bacteria in the non-FMT group or the Firmicutes uh, group. So, that shows that there may be benefit as we move forward in stool-based therapy or uh, fecal uh, FMT for patients with hepatic encephalopathy. The last study we'll go over, and I apologize for the speed, um, is the HELP study. 
polyethylene glycol or uh, our cathartic uh, for uh, colonoscopy prep, whatever flavor you like, was used at UT Southwestern uh, to randomize 25 patients to lactulose and standard of care or polyethylene glycol. These were patients admitted with overt encephalopathy. The patients were given Zyfax, where no patients were given Zyfaxin in this study, but they were given an infusion over 24 hours of uh, Go Lightly. Uh, they were then uh, placed back on standard of care therapy, and as you can see, the polyethylene glycol had a decreased time to res resolution of hepatic encephalopathy versus lactulose. So it is, this is actually yesterday's technology tomorrow, the idea that a rapid catharsis may be as effective, if not more, than lactulose, which is as supposed to be an ammonium scavenging uh, 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 mechanism. So some conclusions. It takes a lot to put two talks into 20 minutes, so I apologize for the brevity and the speed. The pathophysiology of, uh, of both ascites and hepatic encephalopathy uh, are developing. We will see new uh, developments as this becomes more clear. We will use both old and new techniques uh, for these conditions, and as you notice, Paracentesis is not new. This is from uh, 1693. This is describing their mechanism for paracentesis. And the microbiome will likely be our instrument for both. And I can't uh, stress uh, that nutrition in all these patients is key. Thank you very much. That was excellent uh, overview of uh, two big topics under 20 minutes. Excellent job, uh, David. It now gives me a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, is Dr. Mark Gobrel, who will be talking to us about the 1,000 transplants at UC Methodist, what have we learned, and what is the future. Mark has been a transforming leader uh, since he joined Houston Methodist uh, from UCLA. He's really pushed the envelope and uh, has made Houston Methodist one of the leading liver transplant programs in the country. I'm um, happy to really invite him to give this talk. Uh, welcome, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for, for this kind of invitation. Um, now, it, it, it's always been a pleasure to come and, and, and talk to the GI group, who are very much responsible for a lot of what happened on, in the liver arena and, and liver transplantation. So, um, and uh, I just want to acknowledge all the, all the people that have participated and worked there. Two of them have been here, and, and definitely David and Dr. Quigley and many others in Methodist. So. I'm not going to take the credit for those 1,000 transplants uh, uh, at Houston Methodist. Uh, I'll start by saying when I came here about 2008 to interview with Roberta Schwartz, at that time uh, uh, there were no liver transplants happening at uh, Houston Methodist. And I asked Roberta, and I said, Roberta, how many transplants do you want us to do? And she said, 20, you break even. And I said, how about 50? Ah, I'm definitely going to see that day in a very, in a very Roberta Schwartz fashion. So the day came and went, and we accumulated 1,000 transplants. So with that, let me just go over <coughs> a few, a few uh, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, aspects. Um, I'm going to talk about the clinical program, and then, and then I'm going to talk about how the liver allocation affected us, uh, what are the outcomes in the transplant center, what are the differentiating elements, and, and I'm going to touch a little bit about our research efforts in this, in this program. So 20 transplants was the, uh, the expectation. We did 40 in the first year. And I think this year we're on track for about 190 liver transplants. That would put us in the top three you know, um, um, uh, programs in the United States. Uh, this is the number of uh, the liver wait list. Despite an increasing number of transplants that we've done over time, our wait list is expected to be 397 this year. I think we're about 410. And, and uh, last um, um, uh, medical review board, we were sitting in there and about 15 new patients were coming in just for evaluation. So this has been a, a definitely an increase in the, uh, in the activity, and, and that goes with the increase of the other activities um, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in several of the hepatology offices in our center. So this year, we're, we're probably going to be more than 1,000 new patient referrals uh, coming to, uh, to us uh, to be evaluated for liver transplant. Um, you've heard a little bit about the metabolic program that David was talking about and the same other programs are happening with other people but the number of patients coming to us have increased. Now, we cannot always take credit for that. Having said that, 
with this last year, we did 173 liver transplants. We were number three in the United States. And I don't, wanna, I, don't, I don't say that with a lot of pride. This is where I was at UCLA. It took us a little bit, and we were just one, one, uh, one transplant ahead of UCLA last year. Um, uh, and we keep marching on. Um, in, the, in the region, we used to be the last in the region. Uh, <coughs> this year, we do 173. The, the, uh, the, the, the program behind us is uh, actually uh, Southwestern, and Southwestern was a small program, and then it exploded over the last three or four years. And they're way ahead of Baylor University, Baylor Medical you know, at, at Dallas, and Baylor Dallas has dropped quite, quite a bit. Uh, and this is because of the rise of the uh, uh, Southwestern. But we've, we've maintained our, our position. So in brief, we're number three in the United States for liver transplants. We're number one in the region for liver transplants. And we're the third largest um, uh, uh, wait list program in the United States. Uh, ahead of us is uh, University, uh, UCSF in San Francisco. And the second is uh, UCLA at 450 patients on the wait list. And that comes up with a lot of hepatobiliary uh, procedures as well and other things. Why did that happen? Not because we're so good. We're pretty good, but not, you know, you cannot take all the credit. It happened because of this, the obesity. Uh, when you look down here, this, this, this area is the, is, the, is the largest. I'm not going to say, say otherwise, it's the largest uh, BMI in the United States of America. And, and of course, be talking in liver or a GI conference, you know that this leads to cirrhosis and, uh, and, and cancer. And, and Texas is actually, uh, has a lot of things that are um, uh, <coughs> uh, synonymous with Texas, but also the child obesity rates are extremely high in Texas. I've never seen a kid with a BMI of 60 uh, who's 12 years old until, I, until I, we, we started here. So the, the obesity uh, uh, pandemic or endemic is really uh, one of the factors that causes liver, liver disease and liver cirrhosis and liver cancer. So here, the highest incidence of liver cancer is in Texas. And when you look down in the state of Texas, you find that Houston is sitting right there. This is the highest incidences around Houston area, uh, the Valley, and also in San Antonio. So not surprisingly, we're seeing a very high incidence of liver cancer in here. The highest incidence of liver disease in, in, in Texas, the highest incidence of cancer is in the liver Texas, in Texas. The highest incidence of death from liver disease and the highest incidence of death from liver cancer is in the, uh, is in the state of Texas. So, so with that, there is no reason why we should not be one of the largest programs. And helped with that, the problem is when I came in here and said, where are you going to get the livers from? You're going to manufacture livers? No, I don't know. We, didn't man we don't manufacture livers, but we did a few things. The United Network for Organ Sharing came up <coughs> um, uh, with, with, several, you know, with, with several elements to say, how are you going to distribute organs? And that is based on the, uh, what we call the final rule. The final rule was something was established by the United States Congress, and it said that organs are not to be owned by any state. Organs are to be owned by the patients. Organs need to go to the sickest first. But, but they come and they say, but don't put it in the people who are going to die. But, so how can we predict the people are going to die between the people who are not going to die? So, so the fairness, so the fairness is, is, the, is the principle and not the, equ no, it says the equity and fairness of distribution, and not utility. Utility does not mean the outcomes. So if you have a liver, you, you should employ the principle of putting it into the sickest first, and, and regardless of the outcome, but try to avoid putting it in the patients who are going to die. So the question is, how do you select the patients who are going to die? So there's a lot of little, little things here, fairness through equity and access. Uh, regardless of religion, uh, identity, or, or anything else. Elimination of perceived racial bias, it's very important. And we always look into the, uh, the racial compositions of our recipients as well. El elimination of greater access based on financial status. You cannot buy your liver, uh, if you, or you buy an organ if you are in the United States. And life saved by giving organs to the sickest in a wider geographical area was the last principle that was here. So if you look at the state of Texas, and this is what distribution of the organs, this is Houston. And Houston, the need for Houston here is in the very dark. But then, but then the, the, the rest of the, of, the, of the state does not have the list that is the, the, wait, the wait list that is present in Houston. And, and that's because of the, the obesity and the cancer that I talked to you about. So the need for transplants in other parts of the, um, of the state are, are less than the needs that they are in here. However, the, this area of the state, they share organ procurement organizations that are different from the state of Texas. So we only do, we were able to draw organs from this area, whereas everybody here draw organs from all these areas. So, so they, to, to even the, the, the play field, they said, you re disregarding that we're going to go to wide circles. And, the wide, and so we, all of us are going to play within, 
within a, a wide range of circles. If an organ comes up in Louisiana, we, we're going we're gonna to stratify recipients based on urgency in a 500-mile circle. So what does that mean? It means that we went through a lot of iterations to change the policy, allocation policy. First of all, when, when I first started here, they used to call, we have a liver, who do you want to put it in? Ron Busadol decides we are, we're going to put it in this patient. And then it changed a little bit to, to divide into status. You know, so status uh, 2B and 2A. And then they came up with the meld in about 2002. And then we added uh, sodium to the meld. And then we said, wait a minute, the cancer patients die because of cancer, not because of liver failure. So we said, okay, we're going to give you artificial points for the cancer. And this thing went in iterations, and finally we came in here and we kept modifying those things. So right now we function with the MELD sodium criteria. The MELD is a, is a score that does not change with the change of the status of the patients and it's not subjective. When we used to use status 1A or status 2A, this was a listing based on subjective criteria. The MELD is based on the INR. Um, the MELD is, is based on the, the INR, the bilirubin. Uh, uh, and uh, as well as the sodium. So we're, we're all in all, oh, I'm, I'm going behind myself, then how, to, how can I go back? Okay. So, um, so in here, this is the melt sodium, the melt sodium today. So how does that function? So if you have a, if you have a, a donor that comes in this area, so the sickest patients in this circle receives it. If there is no one, then it goes to the sickest person and the sickest person in this area. In other words, if you have a patient here who is sicker than anyone else here, within the 500-mile circle, you will get it. Same thing happens in Houston. If you have somebody, another donor here, they look into the sickest patients within the 500-mile circle. And, uh, and they chose the 500-mile circle because they don't want organs to travel. Then you expand the, the time that the organ sits in ice. All in all, this resulted in an increase of about 100 new livers you know, coming to the Houston area. So this is us. And, uh, and we fly, so we fly for hearts and liver all the time. We go out to at least to Puerto Rico, Phoenix, Philadelphia, Toronto. We've been flying all around the country. This is our 500-mile circle stops and expands into, into, uh, uh, into Florida. And that explains why over the last two years, despite the, the pandemic, uh, there has been an increase in the number of uh, livers coming to us. So when we transplant our patients, because of the large size of our list, at the, at the initial listing, most of the patients have melt, lower melt scores. However, at the time of transplant, well, a lot of patients have very high melt scores. So if you look here, this is the Methodist Hospital, and the dark red compared to the other reds in the, uh, in the region, um, in the region four or national, we're about two and a half times as much critical patients. These are patients with melt scores greater than 35 at any time. If you look at, at the patients with melt scores greater than 25, we, we transplant patients in this area, which is higher than anyone else. And because of that, because of the large list, we're able to attract a lot of organs. So about 35% of our patients are transplanted with melt scores greater than 35. Regional, it is in our region, the state of Texas, and other areas, about 19%, and national is 18%. So what does that mean? It means this. It means that a lot of our patients are going to get, get, get transplanted when they are critically ill. This is a critically ill patient without, without knowing who he is. On a ventilator, this is the ascites that he has. And his, this, this patient's probably melt score is about 40 on a couple of pressors and on dialysis. So we, we have to go and transplant those patients for in, in, in about uh, 35%. So that begs the question, what, you know, what are your outcomes? Our outcomes have been pretty darn good. Um, this is the, uh, the, the observed this is the observed survival rates in our program, and it's about one-year survival rates, and it goes to about 94%. And our expected is about 89%. So our survival rates, despite the fact that we do operate on the very sick patients, we exceed our expected survival by about 4 to 6% on a yearly basis. The rest of the country transplants at a lower melt score, at an average, we transplant at an average melt score of about 34 to 38. The rest of the country, they transplant at a melt score of about 24, and we are a little better than the rest of the country, are about the same. So despite the degree of acuity that, that we have, we, we still maintained our outcomes. Now, the fact that, so somebody can come and say, why are you transplanting people who are so sick? Why don't you go and transplant people who are less sick so you can get better outcomes? A, we do get better outcomes anyway, and you look at the mortality on our list, and the mortality on our wait list is, is, uh, is here. This is the SRTR national mortality. This is patients, the mortality of patients listed on all other United States. 
that's the mortality of the patients who are uh, we, we list here. So the, our mortality on the list is about five to six percent compared nationally to about 8.4 percent. So the so the fact that you transplant the sickest first ends up by by providing better out we, we get better outcomes and we have lower mortality on our wait list and that's what keeps the patients you know on 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 with us. So uh, what. Uh, what differentiates our program? Or let, let me uh, I'll go back to some, uh, so some of our research activities. So research activities is plenty. Uh, we are linked, the, the transplant program or liver transplant program is linked to the immunobiology and transplant sciences. And this is headed by, by Sean Lee. Sean Lee's established a platform for immunological studies and it is at cellular and, and molecular levels. There's about 40 researchers and fellows and about three graduate students from Texas A&M. They have seven NIH awards, American Heart and National Service Awards, um, and also by philanthropy. We have a lot of clinical outcomes research. We've got about actively about 48 clinical trials. Now, that's divided between liver and lung, uh, and it spans COVID immunotherapy. Uh, there's several, a couple of immunotherapy trials for uh, liver cancer. Uh, we have machine perfusion for organs, and we also have enhanced recovery after surgery. That's a program where we're able, to, uh, we're able to recover, it's a clinical program, but it's able to recover patients much quicker with better results. We, we are about to start more into the translational science program, and which is early detection of sepsis in liver patients uh, and mitigation of chronic rejections. Uh, we, we're trying to recruit a couple of investigators from uh, uh, University of Chicago, where they, they do a lot of microbiome studies and also transplantation under sensitized recipients. I'm going to talk a little bit about Sean because recently Sean got a Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Society of Transplantation. Um, Sean and others, and here we, have, we, we over the last four or five years have, a, have compiled publications in many journals, including Lancet Immunity, American Journal of Transplantation and Pathology, Nature Journal of Immunology, and so forth. So these are excellent, you know, excellent journals from, from, the, from the research that we've done. We've had several presentations at national and international conferences, including the American Transplant Congress, the American Surgical, and, uh, uh, and the National Liver Transplant Society. I see the only one that's missing here is the ASLD, and I'm gonna, we're going to try to fix that later on. We have extensive collaborations with MD Anderson, Rice, Northwestern, Baylor, uh, uh, Baylor, not Baylor, uh, Dallas, but Baylor, Houston, uh, and UCSF. So our our uh, our transplant our research program is really you know, uh, uh, going incredibly well and humming. And I want to highlight a couple of studies that we've done here, and I think that's also a very strong differentiating elements, element for us. This is the outcomes of liver transplantation for hepatocellular cancer beyond the University of San Francisco and Milan. Milan is a five centimeter tumor. San Francisco said, no, you can get equivalent results with transplantation of six and a half. Um, and this study has everybody in here has participated in it. And uh, finally, David wrote it uh, a couple of years ago. And it talks about transplantation of patients with cancer larger than Milan. The average size of cancer in those patients transplanted were about 10 centimeters. So that's incredibly, incredibly large. Despite that, <coughs> the survival rate was not different and the recurrence rates were not different from others. So UC that's UCSF, that's Milan. And this is if you transplant patients even with larger cancers. So we, we've done this work by selection of patients with large cancers, and we, and, and we have a program for transplantation of patients with large cancers, and that program is incredibly successful and, and gives us actually very good survival outcomes. And the recurrence-free survival over five years is about 75%. So we have been able to develop and jointly work with Anderson and other institutions here to reach that. The, the, uh, the other, the other uh, program was, uh, was initiated to, to try to, uh, to, uh, to uh, transplant patients with advanced cholangiocarcinoma. So the cholangiocarcinoma so far has been a disease where you go for resection. And, and so we chose the patients who cannot be resected. That's a tumor that's present in both right and left. It's almost at the hilum, tumor extending in the right and left at the hilum. So this, these are uh, uh, multicentric tumor. It cannot be resected. And again, this is a recurrence after resection and all those patients. So all those patients have an expected life the survival of about 12, 12 months at the most with the chemotherapy that we have today. So we took those patients and worked with them and, and, and ended up by transplanting them. And that's the results of our overall survival. So overall survival of those patients with so large tumors, about 60% at five years, that is even better than resection of, in, of early tumors 
uh, in the liver. So if you, if you get a, if you get a two or three centimeter cholangic carcinoma and resect it, you will not get 60% five year survival. And the patients who do not get transplanted, they die in about 12 months. So this, is, this has been one of, the, one of the most innovative programs that we have done uh, in here. And that has, uh, has, uh, has received a lot, of, a lot of national recognition. And we, we do that work with Anderson. Um, so, you know, next slide. Uh, what, how do we get delivered? So we have several programs. Uh, I know Dr. Quigley that loves the word rejuvenation. So we, we call this organ rejuvenation program, uh, where, we, uh, where we take livers that are extended and are not used for transplants and try to make them transplantable. So what are these? These are donors greater than 70. These are livers with uh, fat in them. This is, a, this is a normal liver. This is a liver with a lot of fat, and you can see it changes its color to yellow. becomes a little rounded, uh, like a butter ball, and, it, and these are fat droplets within the liver, as opposed to a normal liver. So those livers can be transplanted easily, and those livers can, should not be transplanted because they don't do well. And there's also donors after cardiac arrest, where the patient dies and the, the liver is not receiving any, any, any blood supply or oxygen for some time. These, these, are very, uh, these categories of those livers are present a lot, but we're not able to transplant them. So we adopted the machine perfusion, and there's a lot of those machine perfusions coming into here. The one that we used was coming from Transmedics, and it's a compact machine that we are able to put onto planes. This is, uh, this is how we, uh, we uh, cannulate the, uh, the, the arterial and portal venous system. We pump it with blood, with oxygen, circulate it out, and it gives you time to be able to look at the bile production from it, and then you're able to measure the, lact uh, the lactate levels and the acidosis, and you can judge whether that liver is going to work or not. And there is some evidence that if you take a, a steatotic liver or a fatty liver and put it onto those machines, the machine is going to get better. And we're getting into, we're getting into doing this, uh, this kind of isolated perfusion for the liver in, in situ in the body of the donor before we take the liver out, and we call this in situ dynamic abdominal perfusion. And we are, we're adopting this technique, and hopefully we can try to do that. The, those, those two, three things, plus adding a living donor program, has helped us to increase the number of uh, donors that we have. So, all together, what, what differentiates the liver transplant program from others around the lesion? So, it's one of the, liver, it's one of the largest centers now in the United States. And, and what's really good about it is that the combination between hepatologists and surgeons is there. There is no difference in who they are. Um, the, the liver center combines a lot of expertise of different people, and it combines the surgeons with the, um, uh, with, with the, uh, with the hepatologist. So we, we all talk about management of the liver disease and transplantation. Everybody has an equal voice on it. We do operate on the critically ill, uh, Ill recipients. These are patients with very high MELT scores. A lot of those patients are declined from other hospitals, but they come to us. And I have to give Constance Mobley a lot of credit for taking care of that. Our ICU is full of liver patients pre and post transplant. And putting those two patients, two, two categories together, has helped us revive the, the, the ones who are before the transplant and then take, the ones after, you know, take care of the ones after transplant. Despite the acuity of uh, our patients, we have exceptional survival outcomes that are about four to six percent better than our than our uh, 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 than our expected. We have incredible research activities, and that has gained us a lot of a lot of notoriety around the country. Our educational activities are excellent. This last year, we had 24 people applying for one position of research fellow, and uh, uh, I know that um, uh, Dr. Victor is starting the. Uh, a fellowship for uh, 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 hepatology, and we, we developed a lot of specialized programs, hepatocellular cancer, cholangic carcinoma, and we developed the transplant oncology that combines the oncologists with us. Uh, we, we, we're getting some distinction in metabolic and NASH. There's a lot of patients in here, and we've developed a good network for referrals. And then we do a lot of multi-organ transplants. At the Methodist Hospital, we're the number one uh, program that does combined heart, livers, lung livers, and combined, uh, uh, and, and combined lung and combined uh, liver kidneys. Those combinations are not an easy endeavor, and we do a lot of them uh, with, with, uh, with excellent survivor outcomes. So where do we are today? I'm going to speed up a little bit. This is the Sheridan Alicanova Center for Liver Disease and Transplantation. It's right there. What it does, this acts as a magnet for the patients with advanced liver disease. So it's fed by, it's fed by the David Underwood Center. So we see a lot of GI and a lot of liver and a lot of endoscopy, but then it feeds into this. This is also feeds the, 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 uh, from the cancer center and from MD Anderson, we get a lot of cancer patients. We got a lot of oncology from the rest because we do a lot of cholangiocarcinoma and, and also the metabolic liver disease, uh, which is fatty liver disease. All that funnels into in here. 
and then we, we participate with our private, um, private hepatologists as well. Um, I'm going to say what's private because they're not private, they're part of us. Um, and, and they all work within this confines to figure out who needs what and then who is going to be transplanted. Those, those are going to be transplanted, they go into the, the transplant center, and the transplant center enjoys several things. We have our own, we share our own specialized ICU, but for the most part, pre and post transplant patients are taking care of the ICU. We have specialized anesthesia that have been giving patients uh, anesthesia to uh, patients with liver disease uh, for a long time. And our nursing and nurse, uh, nurse practitioners are, are very experienced in operating room. We have our own staff in there. So, so surrounded by all of this, we're able to put together this product. So lessons learned in the future. Innovate, go into areas where other people do not want to or are afraid to, and, but innovate successfully. Collaborate with a lot of others. We will collaborate with anyone around us. We've already established a lot of collaborations. Good education, try to differentiate your center. Surround yourself by the best and the realistic. And when we do have the best hepatologists around us, and I have to say, I'm, you know, I enjoy the company of a lot of my, 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 I would say my younger partners who are really, are really great. Some of them are better than me. Do not be afraid, do not assume, and continue working hard. And the, the key for success of any liver transplant program is number one, hepatology, number two, hepatology, <coughs> number three, hepatology, and number four, hepatology. And then, you know, good ICUs and operating room. Expand the clinical, we, we are now for the future, we, we're working on expanding the clinical program to take living donors. We're putting some stress on uh, the tra expanding the translation of research and uh, uh, increasing our fellowship program. So in conclusion, uh, the, our liver center has become one of the largest in the United States so as uh, our liver transplant program. It is built to last. Um, it is a complete liver center with very sophisticated specialized units with every person in there having his own area and is working to increase it. There are multiple differentiation factors to determine outcomes, liver cancer, metabolic programs, multi-organ transplants. We have a nationally recognized immunology and outcomes research programs and we work, we work, we work a lot with MD Anderson. And um, uh, in the future, we want to expand our research repertoire to, be, uh, to increase the translation activities. And thank you very much for your attention. And I'll stop here. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mark. That, uh, that's amazing, uh, to be honest with you, and <clears throat> accomplished in such a short period of time. Um, I'd like to invite our speakers uh, up to the desk here uh, and invite our audience uh, to submit questions, ask questions uh, of any of our speakers. Dr. Sherry, uh, Dr. Vector, and Dr. Gabriel Kirikal. So getting ready, uh, I think some questions have come up. Uh, one of them is uh, to Dr. David Victor. What was the mode of delivery of FMT in the Bajaj studies? It was via colonoscopy. Okay. And do you routinely screen for minimal or very early HE? So in my clinic, I do a number connection test, and you can also do a Stroop test on your phone if you feel comfortable giving your patient looking for uh, covert encephalopathy. Um, though that's a bit of a loaded question because if you do identify covert encephalopathy, then you have to if you identify covert encephalopathy, you have to address driving and all of that, so you have to do more formal testing. So I routinely screen for symptomatology, and if I'm looking for, um, I'm sorry, do I need to repeat all that? I do routinely screen with a number connection test in my office for covert encephalopathy. If you identify it, you must counsel the patient on their uh, higher risk for complications with driving, and you must be prepared for that if you're looking for it in your cl clinic. Uh, next question to Dr. Gabriel. What can we expect in terms of immunosuppression strategies for the future? Um, I, don't know if they're gonna, I, I do not know if they're going to change from where we are today because with the immunosuppression that we have today, we are getting about 95% survival rates. 
So the research in, in new immunosuppression has calmed down a lot. Having said that, we can, <coughs> we can look at refining our methods. There are a couple of new uh, antibodies that are on the market that uh, you, you would give them once um, uh, every week um, and to that extent, but um, it is not going to be the same rate that we were seeing it before. There are going to be some modifications, but not much. I think a lot of attention is going to be on chronic rejection, which is a gradual loss of organs over time. I mean, mm -hmm. Kidney and hearts have a lot of chronic rejections, which is built up of fibrosis uh, in, in the organ itself, and, and we will be seeing more attention to that. I'd like to ask Dr. Gobrahal a question as well. Um, going back to the 1980s, and as they moved uh, through the cyclosporin era, uh, very few transplant units expected patients to live 10 years. We had hepatitis C, our medications for hepatitis B were not very good. There were many things we didn't understand. And yet now in the 21st century, seeing patients who are 20 plus years out from transplant uh, is not uncommon. And a question I'm asked a lot is, which is sort of the holy grail to transplant, is when can patients, if ever, go off their immune suppression? <laughs> well, that's the question you're probably going to ask, you know, keep on asking all the time, because if somebody more when when they when 10 years out we, we know that if you develop an acute rejection episode 10 years out it is very hard to treat so so gradually people are on less immunosuppression as they move out look 10 so if i get somebody 10 years out and he's on 0.5 milligrams of prograf every day with a prograf level of two or three and i tell him you know why don't we let's try to take it off but if you develop one episode of rejection you may lose the graft most people would say i don't want to try that however there has been efforts to try to get patients off immunosuppression, and they have been successful in about 50 to 60 percent of the time. This uh, question goes to Dr. Shetty. Um, could you summarize what uh, criteria we use to uh, select patients with alcoholic liver disease for transplantation in Houston Methodist, just to help people know about our alcohol program? Yes, yeah, so we really have uh, uh, no requirements when it comes to from a sobriety standpoint. So we are happy to evaluate all patients who are decompensated um, from a liver standpoint. Uh, we do have a careful selection process that's put in place by our psychosocial team. Uh, we do look into their psychiatry, uh, psychiatric uh, disorder history. Uh, we do look into their prior history of issues, uh, both from a social and legal perspective from alcohol use. All these factors are taken into consideration, uh, but we, uh, it's, it's looking at each individual uh, at a given time point and not necessarily saying a hard no for this particular reason or a hard no for that particular reason. So, thank you. Um, okay, the question that comes up again is um, an update on the living related program at Houston Methodist. Uh, Dr. Gobrera, what do you think? So um, the, the living related liver program uh, in Methodist, uh, the, 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 there's the living related kidney program which is very successful in, on the kidney transplant. So the question is the living donor program for livers and we have been very careful to adopt that program because there is a real, it's a very small but a real real chance of death for the donor. This is a person who is, does not need an operation. And the mortality rate is about 0.5%. So we did not want to initiate this program and unless every unit in the ICUs and the floors are very well educated and they understand what, they, what we're doing. And I think the time has come for it because our list is large and there are a lot of patients who need the transplants. But with the COVID, uh, with the COVID pandemic, we, we hesitated and pulled back because we don't want somebody who does not need surgery to come into the hospital and suddenly he has a complication and develops COVID on top of it. But I think we're ready to do it in, 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 in many ways. And by the end of this year or early next year, it will be there. Thank you. Very good. Um, and Dr. Sherry, uh, how important is the role of an addiction specialist or psychiatrist in patients transplanted for acute alcoholic hepatitis? And when should they get involved? I think the, the part, uh, they form a key part of the treatment team, and uh, the sooner they get involved, the better. It's all often very challenging when these patients come in with acute alcoholic hepatitis to 
get them to go to rehab or see an addiction specialist because they're so sick. So uh, a majority of the times we'll get them involved after transplantation as soon as they're medically cleared to go back to seeing them. This is where uh, it's important to recognize that we're not just uh, treating these patients for their liver disease, but we're also addressing their alcohol use disorder, either pre or post transplant, depending on you know, their medical clearance. And uh, David, um, what's your advice for alcohol use in someone who's got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? You see quite a few of those. So alcohol and um, fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease are uh, indistinguishable on biopsy but are distinctly different pathways of injury to the liver. So they're actually cumulative. There's a growing body of literature on what we would consider alcoholic steatohepatitis and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis patients, so ASH, NASH patients, who accelerate faster to uh, permanent or cirrhotic liver dysfunction. So you have to be even more mindful of alcohol use with uh, uh, NASH. Now we don't know necessarily for just fatty liver, but unless you have a biopsy, I would be um, careful with my alcohol use and probably a little more diligent on follow-up with the liver uh, or with your primary care. And if you see elevated liver enzymes, um, I would make some lifestyle changes earlier than later. Good. And uh, let's see. Um, Dr. Gobriel, what are the outcomes with liver transplantation in patients who have intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma? Um, most with the Houston Methodist experience. Well, so <clears throat> this is a this is a wide this is a big question because uh, most people would think that intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma should be uh, resected. The outcomes of resections are not good, and the recurrences are very high. So there was this, there was two two programs that went into it. One was UCLA, and another one was a, a paper that looked at the total European experience. And they looked at the patients who were transplanted thinking that this is a hepatocellular cancer, only to find out on the explant that this was a cholangiocarcinoma. So the first, this paper described that a cholangiocarcinoma with less than two centimeters versus cholangiocarcinomas with greater than four centimeters. Cholangiocarcinoma less than two centimeters had about 80% five-year survival rate with a recurrence rate of about five per 10, uh, for about 20%. The uh, four centimeter tumors had, had uh, uh, survival rates of about 60%. So even then, in, in the two and the four centimeter tumors, their survival rates are excellent at 60 or 80%. The other paper, that, uh, the other uh, programs, they looked at the effect of a combined transplant with adjuvant therapy. And that's what we use at Methodist Hospital, regardless of the size of the tumor. And I'm saying about eight to 14 centimeter tumors. If that patient is stable on chemotherapy, we, we take this as a, as a sign of good biological effects of the tumor and we transplant those patients. Those patients with very large tumors, they, their survival rates is anywhere between eight to 12 months. We achieve 60% five year survival rates. Uh, and a lot of them have been cured without recurrences. So um, I think, I think the, the field is moving towards transplanting more patients with intrahepatic cholangia rather than, than uh, resecting them. And I would say that uh, uh, probably about one every four patients that you see with intrahepatic cholangia carcinoma are resectable. Very good. Any questions from the audience who are in person? Uh, they could come up to your mic if you don't want to text or uh, poll everywhere. Um, whilst we're waiting for that, a question just came in. Um, to Dr. David Victor, what is the current rule of TIPS in ascites? So the current role of TIPS in ascites is that if you're unable to, the great ascites, the International Club of Ascites, which I always wanted that blazer, um, I thought it should be like <laughs> yellow. Um, they grade it in that you're not, you're controlled with diet, you're controlled with uh, uh, diet and diuretics and then you're not controlled uh, well. In patients who have refractory or uncontrolled uh, uh, with diuretics, they should be considered for TIPS. The problem with TIPS is it's not completely benign and there's multiple people who do not qualify. As we talked about, uh, MELD scores that are too high because their liver can fail uh, after the TIPS placement. If they have right heart failure, 
if they have infection, recurrent SVP, anatomy that doesn't work. So TIPS isn't for everybody, but it is an absolutely effective strategy for most patients with encephalopathy or with ascites. It is not, uh, you have to watch for post-TIPS uh, uh, encephalopathy, so patients who have frank encephalopathy are probably not TIPS candidates. But the one thing that is really important, even with TIPS, is nutrition. So you can put a TIPS in, but if they continue to be wildly malnourished, they will not be able to mount a, enough protein response on their own to create oncotic pressure, and they'll continue to develop ascites. Very good. I think we have one more question to go, and then uh, we'll would wrap up. Um, Again, to Dr. Gabriel, how does collaboration with centers like MD Anderson affect outcomes in patients who need a transplant? Oh, I, I would love to see who, uh, who put that question out to, uh, uh, to address that. Um, I, I think collaborations with any, uh, with, with, any, with any institution is important because it increases, um, it, in, it improves the outcomes, there's no question, because you put the expertise of one institution plus the expertise of another insti institution. The MD Anderson folks have a lot, you know, they really know a lot about cancers. Uh, transplants, we know how to transplant. The question is, how do you figure out who to transplant, who not to transplant? And MD Anderson took a long time until they're able to trust transplantation. They were looking into areas about how to treat the cancer with chemotherapy, immunotherapy. So right now, and, and we don't know those modalities as well as they do. They don't know transplants as well as we do. So we, we, do, we do combine weekly conferences with them and look at case by case, and that is a very Anderson way of doing it, and then decide how do you combine those methods of therapy, chemotherapy or local, local therapy, or immunotherapy, if you will. There are several trials for that, plus transplantation. And because of that, we're able to do, uh, you know, able to do patients with bigger tumors and with better outcomes. So it does improve the outcomes. Uh, Anderson has been, a, has been an incredible partner with us, especially on the uh, cholangiocarcinoma part. Sure. Thank you. And I, th I have to say there's an emerging specialty. Like, but, and everybody here is talking about hepatology, but there is hepatology and also this transplant hepatologist. And, and the field is emerging into a transplant oncologist who, who really combines both aspects together. Sure. Thank you. And on behalf of my co-chair, Dr. McFadden and myself, I want to thank the speakers of this liver <laughs> session for an excellent session. They really uh, kept us up to date and um, very exciting topics. Again, thank you to the speakers. We will now adjourn and uh, uh, Dr. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Again, I'd like to thank our co-chairs and the three speakers who were absolutely perfectly on time. They deserve applause for that in itself, <laughs> including Dr. Victor, who gave the two talks in one. Uh, so we will have a 10 minute break and then we come back for one of the highlights of the day, which is of interest to gastroenterologists and surgeons and endoscopists and everybody, it'll be Dr. Reem Sharayak beaming in from New York to talk to us about um, bariatric endoscopy. And that starts at 11.40 sharp. So you've got 10 minutes. We're perfectly on time. Thank you.
Personally, a, a very great pleasure to introduce our, our special speaker for this year. Uh, Dr. Reem Sharaya comes to us from New York, but in fact, as she just reminded me, was actually born here in Houston in, at St. Luke's Hospital uh, when her dad, uh, Ziad, who's been a friend of mine for, I hate have to say this, over 25 years, um, was a research fellow and worked with David Graham. Um, a few years ago. We won't say how many years ago, Ria. Um But since then, she's gone on to great fame. She graduated from St. George's Hospital at the University of London and then went on to residency training at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell, fellowship at New York Presbyterian Wild Cornell, uh, went on to a, an advanced endoscopy fellowship at Johns Hopkins where she worked with David Victor, whom you heard from earlier, and now, is now back in New York where she was recently promoted to associate professor and even more recently was appointed as director of interventional endoscopy at Wild Cornell, which of course is our sister uh, institution. She's become an international figure in the area of bariatric endoscopy and that's going to be the topic of her talk today. So Reem, it's just a pity that you can't be with us here in person to welcome you back to Houston, but it's great to have you here regardless. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, and uh, hopefully in the next few years I can actually uh, be there, uh, maybe hopefully next time. So my task is to talk about uh, bariatric endoscopy in 2010, an update. And when we look at the uh, problem of obesity in the United States, there are over 200 million overweight or obese patients. Uh, 19 million are those that are surgical candidates. So those are BMI of 40 and above or 35 and above with one comorbid condition. And then you have 88.6 million with a BMI of 30 to 40. They don't qualify for surgery and diet and exercise have failed. And also you have the uh, 25 and above, um, those are classified as overweight and they're at risk for NASH uh, and diabetes and other metabolic diseases. And of those, it's that little red dot, only 2% choose to undergo surgery each year. So you're left with a big treatment gap. Furthermore, when you look at the self-reported prevalence of obesity in the U.S., you can see that the numbers have been increasing. This is the last report from 2019. And sort of as the decades have gone um, from 2000, 2010, and 2019, you can see that more and more states have become red. Um, you have more states that have 30% or more uh, people with obesity. And Colorado is the only state that has 20%. So we're definitely shifting, and there's a sort of statistic saying that in the next uh, five to ten years, one in two people in, uh, in the United States will be classified as obese. Now, uh, the treatments of obesity go from the uh, low efficacy, such as diet and exercise, such as low risk, and we know that only 3% are able to sustain um, uh, their, the, their weight loss. Then you have seven different approved medications in the U.S., um, most recently, as the maglutide or ozempic, sort of classified uh, by the New York Times as a game changer. And then you have the various different surgical surgeries, and you're going from lap band to sleeve to ruin why the more small bowel you bypass, the better uh, the surgery, but also the more risk. And as I mentioned, only 1% to 2% undergo uh, surgery each year, so you're left with a big treatment gap. And this is where endoscopic options um, come into play. Now, it's important to understand that even though we say uh, we're sort of in addition to surgery, it's important to understand where surgery um, and how surgery works. So this is the SOS study that was published a few times originally in the New England Journal and most recently in JAMA. And it's a closed system that follows various different types of surgery, and this is a 20-year follow-up. What you can see here is the surgical uh, ruin Y is 25% total body weight loss, vertical banded gastroplasty at 16, and lap band at 14. The medical uh, weight loss is sort of 3 to 5%. But what was more interesting when they looked at the uh, hazard ratio um, improvement in, in, in death and mortality, there was a risk reduction in the surgical groups, sort of suggesting that surgery improves mortality. And not only does it improve mortality, it also improves uh, or treats diabetes. Uh, this is the uh, a randomized trial that was now published um, uh, two times in the New England Journal comparing uh, surgical C versus bypass against medical therapy. 
You can see at one year, um, the treatment for diabetes defined as less than 6%, was 12% in the medical group versus around a third in the sleeve gastrectomy and 42% in, um, in the Rue Y. And at five years, this goes down to uh, 2% in the medical therapy group and at only around 23 and 25% in the surgical counterparts. But still suggesting that um, one in five or 20% of patients cure their diabetes with surgery. Now, what percentage total body weight loss do we aim to get to? Well, when we look at what's out there in terms of the non-invasive options, you have high-intensity lifestyle and um, the various medical therapies. And uh, this is a review that basically shows that um, the majority of patients get 5% total body weight loss. So, for instance, looking at Qsimia, which is made up of ventramine and papyramate, about 75% get 5% total body weight loss, and about 10% of the subjects have 55% total body weight, uh, sorry, about 55% of the subjects have 10% uh, total body weight loss. And uh, why that's important to sort of get improvement in uh, comorbidities such as NASH and diabetes, you really need to hit that sweet spot between 7 and 10% total body weight loss. So that's what we need to aim to get to. Now, surgery has been uh, in evolving over the last century, going from open surgery to laparoscopic to sort of now minimally invasive. And the same thing can be said with uh, endoscopy. So we've gone from purely diagnostic to therapeutic, where initially we used to see polyps and send them to surgery. Now we remove them. We've gone into the third space. And now the surgical and endoscopic lines blur together. And this is important sort of to realize that, you know, going 10 or 20 years from now, who knows what we'll be doing and what kind of field bariatric endoscopy would be. Now, the advantages of endoscopic bariatric therapies are they're less invasive, less costly. It's an outpatient procedure. It's repeatable, reversible, and has multiple purposes. Um, and the way we divide uh, the, these therapies are the ones that affect the stomach have more of a weight loss effect. They're either space occupying, gastric remodeling, or cause more of a uh, delay or gastric outlet obstruction. And then the ones that affect the small bowel have more of a stronger anti-diabetic and NASH effect. Now, these therapies are not really approved by the FDA here in the U.S., so it's still sort of emerging, uh, emerging therapies, but we'll touch upon these. Now, intragastric balloons, we have various diff different balloons out there. There are double balloons, single balloons, swallow balloons, balloons filled with gas, and balloon balloons filled with um, saline. In the U.S., there are three approved balloons. All of these had randomized uh, controlled trials. The first and the last were sham controlled, and this one was lifestyle. Reshape and Obera had uh, saline-filled uh, balloons that are inserted and removed endoscopically. Obolon is inserted via um, a device uh, radiologically, and you place the balloons at three different time points, at zero, two, and four weeks, or three, six, and nine weeks, whatever you want. The way the balloons work, uh, at least the saline fills, is by delaying gastric emptying, making you feel full, in addition to the space-occupying effect. The gas-filled balloons have more of a just a space-occupying effect so it makes you feel a little full, but they don't have gastric delay. Um, therefore, the symptoms are much better tolerated than the saline-filled ones. Now, Reshape has been voluntarily with, withdrawn off the market, and Obalon as a company, because of COVID, had to close down. Um, so we're not entirely sure what's going to happen to the future of it. So really, Obera has been sort of the, the, key, um, the key balloon here in the U.S. Now, looking at uh, sham uh, and randomized trials versus real-life therapies, what you can see here is that uh, when you pay for a device and you're no longer in a randomized controlled trial where you're getting the device for three, free, the uh, weight loss is a little bit better. So at uh, six months, it's 10%. And at nine months, when you have the balloon removed, um, the weight loss is even better. Sort of suggesting that you need... Um, to entice the patient for weight loss. It's not just the device itself, it's the compliance, it's what you throw at them, it's how, how many times they see your dietitian, and maybe the addition of medications. 
Um, the Ovalon registry also shows similar results. So in their randomized sham control trial, they had 7% total body weight loss, but in the commercial registry, that increased to 10%. Now, as I mentioned, the balloons aren't without its complications. So the FDA issued several warnings in the last few years. And this is because um, the way the saline balloons uh, are filled, they have uh, pressure effects, they can cause necrosis, they can cause perforation, they can cause hyperinflation and pancreatitis. So even though they're easy devices to place, you need to be very vigilant when placing a balloon. Um, and patients need to stay on PPIs for the duration of their therapy. Um, other devices that are now with the FDA and um, we're hoping to see some sort of FDA approval are the SPATS balloon, and this is an adjustable balloon out there. And the theory behind this is that if you have a lot of accommodative symptoms, such as nausea and vomiting, you can have another endoscopy to withdraw some fluid. But on the other hand, if you're having um, uh, less weight loss or no weight loss, then you can have another endoscopy to um, inject a balloon with more fluid. And in their uh, randomized lifestyle therapy that's currently with the FDA, you can see 14% total body weight loss versus 3.6 in the control group. Now, it may not be very cost effective here in the US because you're having an endoscopy for removal, endoscopy for insertion, and some endoscopy in between. But in Europe, where um, endoscopies are a little cheaper, it makes more sense. So we'll wait to see what happens. What about a procedure less? Balloon. So this is this takes away procedures from GI. Um, it's placed by a nasogastric technique, but nasooral um, by a radiology uh, guided assistant. You see the capsule below the GE junction, then you hook it up to a saline bag with proprietary fluid. You inflate the balloon with um, 500 cc's of fluid, and um, then the balloon uh, has a valve that self destructs or the, the sutures there dissolve after. 16 weeks or four months, and the balloon deflates and passes through the GI system. The pivotal trial, which we are under, is now under FDA approval. And in a meta-analysis that was presented last year at CDW, you, they had over 160 uh, studies, three bowel obstructions, although the company changed the way um, the device is made. And since the new iteration of the device, they've had no obstructions. But what you can see is the weight loss is similar to other fluid-filled balloons at 10% at uh, the 12-month mark. And the largest study to date was published late last year of 1,700 patients. And you can see here the side effects are sort of uh, what you see with other, uh, other fluid-filled balloons, but the weight loss is similar. So here you have 14% uh, total body weight loss. Now, given that the balloons have somewhere between 7 to 10% total body weight loss, some with 14, do we see an improvement in comorbidities? And the answer is yes. This is a meta-analysis now published a few years ago showing improvement in ALT and improvement in A1C by about 1.1%. Uh, this is a paired study that was uh, just published in CGH. Um, and then on the heels of that, um, the AGA uh, recommended the use of balloon as an adjunctive therapy uh, for the treatment of NASH. So what the group at Mayo Clinic did uh, was to do paired liver biopsies with balloon insertion and at the time of balloon removal, along with elastography and MR um, and um, fiber scan scores. What you can see here at the end of the six month uh, mark, you can see improvement in waist circumference, A1C, ASC, et cetera. Um, and what's more important is that when you look at the actual pathology, fibrosis regress per biopsy in about 15%, 10% of patients were at stage zero post-intervention, and the NAS score actually improved uh, in most patients by about two uh, points. Another device uh, that got FDA approval in April of 2019 is the um, transpyloric shuttle or Baranova. And it's basically a, uh, a randomized control trial, of, uh, the Endobesity 2 trial that showed these results. So it's a device that looks like a balloon um, that causes um, uh, intermittent gastric outlet obstruction. And you can see here that the percentage of patients that got 
more than 5% and more than 10% were statistically significantly more than the control groups, and this is why they gained FDA approval. Their weight loss was about 9% uh, in both the per-protocol and the intent-to-treat analysis, again, statistically significant. They did have a high rate of ulcerations, but they all responded to PPIs and carotate, and the study did show improvement in hypertension, insulin, HOMA, IR, uh, compared to the control group. Um, now, Gelesis is, although it's not a device, it's actually classified as a device by the FDA, um, and it's a hydrogel uh, methyl cellulose, so a metamucil, but cross-linked with uh, citric acid. Um, you swallow two to three uh, tablets uh, half an hour before a meal with two glasses of water. And in the GLOW study, which is a randomized sham control trial, you can see that the weight loss in the gelatin group was statistically significant at 6.4% versus 4.3%. But more interestingly, you can see that the percentage of patients was always statistically significantly more in the, than the placebo group. Uh, they, uh, they classified further in the paper that patients who had uh, 8% or, or more were sort of the high responders and did well with the jealous group. Interestingly, those patients that drank two glasses of water half an hour before a meal also did well, so it's just something to tell your patients. Now, moving on to plication therapy, this is the POSE. POSE stands for the Primary Obesity Surgical and Aluminal Platform. It's a device where you uh, attach it onto a slimline scope and it causes cirrhosis to cirrhosis apposition. Now, the studies in Europe have had good results with 13% versus 5.3% total body weight loss. Um, and initially, there, uh, the randomized sham control trial here in the U.S. did not gain FDA approval. At the time, they were just suturing um, a little bit of the fundus to uh, reduce accommodation. Now, um, they've changed the way the sutures are done. They're now doing what we call, call post two or belt and suspenders approach. And in a multi-center prospective study, both in uh, Europe and the U.S., they now have two-year data presented last year at DDW and again this year at DDW showing uh, total body weight loss of uh, 17%, but also improvement in ALC uh, and ASC. So it's an emerging therapy and long-term data is still um, being awaited and the FDA trial is um, going to be approved here soon. Other devices that are not approved in the U.S. is the Endomina device. Um, this is a device that's attached onto any type of scope, and you cause, um, again, cirrhosis to cirrhosis acquisition. You imbricate the stomach from the incisor to the GE junction. And in a randomized uh, controlled trial that was presented uh, or published in Guts uh, late last year um, by uh, Hubert T. et al., you can see that the uh, weight loss is around 12% at six months, and you can see that the crossover group also loses uh, significantly more weight once they cross over to the uh, procedure group. They had no um, uh, serious adverse events, and the excess weight loss is 45%. We're hoping to see this device soon in the U.S. Now, moving on to the endoscopic sutured gastroplasty or sleeve gastroplasty, and what we do a lot of at, at Cornell is through the Apollo overstitch device. This has gone through various different iterations from what you copy a vertical banded gastroplasty to a double layer of sutures to what we really use today, which is um, a series of a continuous sutures going from the incisora to the GE junction, leaving or sparing the fundus with a second layer uh, for reinforcement. And we uh, published on this uh, most recently last year, showing five-year durability with our prospective cohort. So at five years, you can see that the total body weight loss is around 15.9%, and this was statistically significant. Patient Snader at 167 but you can see similar what, to what you see in the um, surgical SOS study that everyone loses weight, they plateau over time. Now, uh, the importance of the helical screw that you saw at the 7 o'clock of the screen is that it ensures that you grab muscularis propria, so you do get bridging fibrosis, and, and that's how you get the durability. 
It's a day procedure. Patients go home the same day. You're on uh, PPIs, liquid diet, uh, modified for about three weeks, and then you build up your diet gradually, similar to what you do in the surgical um, sleeve diet. We looked at predictors for weight loss, and those are younger age, how much weight you lose at the one month mark, which is similar to what you see with other surgical studies, the case number, um, so the better you are or the more you've done, the more your group has done, the better the outcomes for the patient and also patient compliance, which has been, been shown in, in prior publications. We also looked at the impact on comorbidities and you can see improvement in A1C and diabetics and pre-diabetics, improvement in waist circumference as a target for metabolic syndrome, improvement in systolic blood pressure, and improvement in triglycerides and ALT. Furthermore, we looked at the ALT NAFO uh, story or NASH story. We looked at the HSI index, and um, that was calculated with uh, this equation with the ASD ALT ratio. And you can see here there was significant improvement in uh, the HSI index uh, post procedure at the two year follow up. Furthermore, you can see a shift to the left with uh, more patients having F0 uh, to F2 fibrosis versus uh, previously you have more patients with 3 and 4. You can see improvement in ALT, ASC, NAFL scores, A1C, and HOMA IR. And the HOMA IR was independent of weight loss and it occurs in the first week, which is similar to what you see in some of the surgical data. Now, we also compared ESG to surgery, and um, you can see here that the surgical group, the sleeve gastrectomy, had 30% total body weight loss versus 18% in the, in the endoscopic sleeve and 14% in the lap band. Um, but what was more important is that when we stratified by BMI less than 40, there was no difference between the groups sort of suggesting that ESG should be considered in the 30 to 40 BMI. The length of stay was much shorter, and also the complication rates were much lower. The Hopkins group also looked at this, but um, and similar, they had better weight loss in the surgical group. But again, more interestingly, they had lower rates of GERD in the um, ESG groups. Uh, and that is important because now there's a lot more data showing um, uh, de novo barracks in the surgical sleeve group. So this is going to become more and more important. This is another study showing um, total body weight loss of uh, ESG versus high intensity lifestyle. And you can see here that the ESG groups do better. Um, and at various different, and at 12 months, you can see there's significantly more patients that do better at 5%, 10%, and 20% total body weight loss than the high intensity lifestyle. We're part of the MERIT trial, which is a randomized shampoo, uh, lifestyle therapy. And so, We'll await those results, um, and those are going to be presented in uh, Exo this year. The learning curve, it takes about 35 uh, cases to get it done under uh, 45 minutes, and the Hopkins group uh, published similarly that it takes about 10 cases to get it done under two hours. The meta-analysis that was published last year basically showing um, that at uh, two years, the weight loss between all these various different publications is similar at uh, 17% with a low rate of adverse events at 2%. Uh, moving, uh, the anatomy. Very, moving very briefly on to um, a motorized system. This is still at its infancy, but it's a, a device that's developed in Israel. And basically what they do is they follow a vertical banded gastroplasty and it's a motorized system that goes onto the, um, uh, the greater curvature, imbricates the, um, the uh, sleeve of the stomach uh, very briefly. And in a study that was not the non-motorized uh, system version sort of one of 11 patients, they had a total body weight loss of, of about 15% with no serious adverse events. Um, so we'll wait to see um, the real data as, as it emerges. Well, anything has finally arrived, and it's called Aspire Assist. The Aspire Assist works by removing a portion of the food from the stomach through a tube before it is absorbed. So the reason I like that introduction is because we all know how to place pegs as gastroenterologists. 
And we have to get over the idea that this sounds a little bit like bulimia because you're, you're, you're re releasing or removing or getting rid of, of uh, stomach waste that way. But in some patients who like it, this works very, very well. And the data is very compelling. So this is an FDA uh, trial that gained FDA approval, so it's now FDA approved, with 30% excess weight loss versus around 10% in the um, lifestyle group. You can see that it's durable at four years. Um, you can place the peg uh, similarly to how you would do it normally. And it has dual mechanisms of action. Um, the reason patients change their way, their behavior is because it, uh, it basically makes you chew your snacks uh, longer, so you have a higher consumption time, and reduce the number of snacks per day, because if you want to aspirate more, you have to go to the bathroom, and patients sort of, if they want to lose weight, have to decrease the number of snacks, so it does change your behavior as well. Sort of moving very briefly in the last uh, um, five to 10 minutes or so, to the duodenal therapies, and these again are more emerging therapies, they're not FDA approved. You have, this, have the duodenal jejunal barrier. Uh, in Europe, this is a meta-analysis of over 14 studies showing improvement in A1C by about 1.3%. Uh, this is basically a nitinol uh, liner that follows a long limb bypass, uh, decreasing malabsorption. It had, uh, has a number of side effects in, in their meta-analysis. But the FDA trial a few years ago was put on hold because of a high rate of hepatic abscesses. And um, since then, the company's changed the design of, of the study. And so now we're having sort of the, uh, the uh, second iteration of the device, and we'll hopefully see the results soon. What about the duodenal mucosal resurfacing? So the theory is, is that the duodenal mucosa in diabetes and NASH is is hypertrophied and you have a high, um, high insulin resistance. And so when you ablate the mucosa with various different techniques, here it's underwater with the fractal device, you can repopulate it back to, back to normal baseline mucosa or jejunal mucosa. And in gut now last year, they published showing improvement in A1C, ALT, and HOMA-IR, and this was independent of uh, the weight loss. And more recently, they published a randomized uh, sham control trial, both in Europe and Brazil. And you can see here that the improvement in uh, glycemic um, index is statistically significant um, in, in, um, in the uh, DMR group versus the sham group. And they also looked, the Europeans did slightly better than the Brazilians here in this cohort for various different reasons, but you can see um, that they had improvement in liver function, improvement in weight, and improvement in uh, A1C. Sigma device, again, uh, from Israel, is a, a laser therapy that also um, tries to ablate duodenal mucosa. The data is still very, very early, um, and the first in human trials was just done on uh, nine patients showing uh, some improvement in A1C uh, fasting glucose, and, and, and uh, there's no change in insulin. The anastomosis system uh, is uh, developed by the Thompson Group in, in the Brigham, and it's basically a magnet from above and a magnet from below um, that uh, combine together or coalesce to cause tissue necrosis and um, cause an enticide anastomosis. And in a study that was published now four years ago, they showed an improvement in weight loss by about 10% total body weight loss, improvement in A1C in all comers and in diabetics and pre-diabetics. Now, the company is going to have to um, change the way the device is not going to be purely endoscopic, we think. It's going to be a combination of laparoscopic, endoscopic, or just purely laparoscopic. So we'll have to wait and see um, where this, uh, this uh, therapy will go. Other space uh, devices and future devices is the full sense device. There's data coming uh, from India um, and, and Mexico out with this. And it's basically a device that sits in the fundus of the stomach and increases accommodation. Early results are very encouraging. Now, what about combination? You can add medications. Remember that 30% of our patients were already on weight loss medications and in the set setting of ESG, we added 25% of our patients onto medications. 
We do offer reed tightening, um, and at one year we assess patient compliance, get a repeat upper GI, but it's definitely a harder procedure with more pain and more symptoms. And we uh, just uh, presented this at DDW this year, comparing addition of medications to ESG or redoing an ESG before and after. And what you can see here, the additive effect of medications halts weight loss and gives you an additional uh, 2 to 3% total body weight loss, whereas the addition of um, a redo ESG gives you sort of more bang for your buck, so you get an additional 9 to 10% total body weight loss. What's important is that we don't work alone in a silo. Um, you can add medications, as I meant. You can convert to other endobariatric procedures, convert to surgery. Remember, all of these devices, you need to ensure compliance with nutrition, and you need to know that the patient understands the tool concept of weight loss. So the risk-benefit ratio is ultimately of importance. We're not going to be as good as surgery, and we don't aim to be, but we should aim to view these tools as a tools to manage a chronic condition and not as a cure, and repeatability is, is often very important. And here at Cornell, we have the Eye Change Clinic, where we work with the Comprehensive Weight Loss Control Center, which are endocrinologists, uh, surgeons, and uh, people interested in nutrition, and us who offer endobariatric therapies, and we give patients all these options. So. As I mentioned earlier, 2% of patients undergo surgery each year. You're left with 19 million who have no other option or don't want surgery. You have 88.6 million who are the BMI of 30 to 40, and they don't have a viable alternative. And so this is where endoscopic bariatric therapies come into play. An early intervention at the bridge to surgery for revisional therapy as a primary alternative and to treat metabolic um, diseases. So a full spectrum of care is essential to optimally treat obesity. Endoscopic therapies will have a role likely in early obesity. Surgery will still have a role, and medicines will become important um, moving forward. Thank you so much for your attention. Th thank you very much, Reem. We've got time for a couple of questions. Um, one question, I guess this is the most difficult question, is you know, you've obviously experienced with many of these procedures. At this stage, and maybe too early to say, what do you think is going to emerge as the most widely used endoscopic procedure? I think it, that's a great question because um, I don't know in five years or ten years anything what we're, what we're talking about now. Some companies come in, some go, they lose money, they lose funding. Um, I think really it's going to end up being combination therapies, uh, either um, combinations with uh, balloons and like the fractal device or uh, suturing and a bypass um, or, or multiple therapies. I think ESG has been now there for eight years and I think people like it. There's a lot of traction and, and balloons have been there um, in Europe and Brazil um, and People still like them. It's just that we have to be aware of the, the side effects, uh, uh, side effects of, of, those, of those devices. Uh, and patients come with their own bias of what they want as well. One other question that's come in from the audience is, how about the current status of insurance coverage for bariatric endoscopy? So, um, as I mentioned, when the AGA approved um, sort of uh, in their guidelines, they said that you are going to need to um, use balloons as an adjunct um, with medical therapy to treat NASH and NASPLES. And based on that study from the Mayo Clinic, as well as showing an improvement in um, the fibrosis scores, uh, we think there's going to be a CPT code uh, for uh, endobariatric devices by the end of the year. And that's going to be interesting and exciting because then insurance is probably will have to start approving them. We've had such luck in the, in the sense that 30% of our patients get some sort of approval. Uh, some we just have to do appeals and send them the uh, papers and show uh, durability. So the five-year data for ESG has become important. Um, and then improvement in comorbidities have become important. And it's sometimes it's a struggle, but it's on a case-by-case case, uh, basis. Okay. Any other burning questions? 
Reem, thank you very much for this tour de force. And again, I hope we have you here back in, in your hometown very soon. It was great to, great to have you today. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. And now I'm going to hand over to Dr. Abraham and Dr. Reardon. Dr. Reardon here. Dr. Abraham, I think you're going to be doing a solo performance to chair the next session. <clears throat> Great. Hopefully you're, you guys are staying quite informed. It has been really nice to have this hybrid session and uh, I've been tweeting along so if anyone is actually on Twitter, so please follow us uh, through this as well. So for our next session, uh, we're going to have Dr. Nestor Esniola, who's our professor of surgery and director of our cancer center, who's going to present to us on a surgery for colorectal cancer metastasis. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Quigley and Dr. Rosenberg for inviting me to speak today. This is a uh, very important topic, and I'm glad I was asked uh, to discuss this. This is a, co a topic that's actually fairly complicated. I think there's still a lot of misconceptions about the management of these individuals, and I think uh, the field has changed really dramatically in the last couple of decades, as I hope to highlight during the course of my talk. Um, I have no disclosures. <clears throat> So I just want to briefly start with uh, a case that I'll actually allude to over the course of the presentation. This is a patient that I saw uh, a while back, a JS, 42-year-old man with a history of intermittent constipation of blood per rectum. He had a colonoscopy that showed a friable mass about 12 to 18 centimeters from the anal verge, and biopsy was consistent with adenocarcinoma. He underwent a staging workup, revealed no lung metastases. Uh, uh, pelvics, uh, pelvis CT showed a bulky rectal cancer with uh, chunky mesorectal nodes, and abdomen CT showed bilobar uh, liver metastases. Uh, these are his scans. You can see he's got a lesion on the right lobe in segment seven, a lesion in the left lobe in segment four, and uh, a second lesion in, in the left lobe in segments two and three. Um, so. Again, uh, colorectal cancer, as uh, obviously most of the folks uh, in this uh, room and virtually are aware, is a major problem in the United States. It's the third leading cause of uh, both cancer cases and deaths. Uh, a significant number of patients will either present with liver metastases or go on to develop them over time, and about half of these folks will have disease isolated to the liver, and those are really the folks that we'll be primarily discussing today. Uh, Five-year survival with systemic and regional chemotherapy, even modern-day uh, multi-agent chemotherapy is less than 5%. So obviously, uh, we need to think about some other strategies for these folks. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the management, specifically the surgical management of uh, these uh, metastases. Uh, resection is still the gold standard. Uh, there, are, there is a role for liver-directed therapies, and I'll discuss what that is. Chemotherapy is of crucial importance in these individuals. This is obviously a systemic di disease. It's, it would be, I think, naive to assume that surgery alone would be sufficient in most of these folks, although it can be in folks with uh, metachronous disease and isolated lesions. Um, I'll talk a bit about the role of systemic therapy. There is a role for regional therapy, but I think systemic is certainly uh, much more established and widely used. Um, sometimes we'll also deploy radiation therapy in these folks either a selective internal radiation or external beam, but I won't be discussing that during today's presentation. Pre-op staging uh, and careful and high quality pre-op staging is really crucial in these folks. We normally do contrast enhanced liver protocol four phase CTs. Sometimes an MRI can add additional information. PET CTs can also be very helpful and oftentimes will change the management of about close to a third of patients, specifically due to additional lesions that were not well seen and or extra hepatic disease that changes the overall treatment plan. Um, it's important during this process to assess uh, the extent of the disease, specifically being the size of the lesions, but more importantly, the location of the lesions, whether they're unilobar or bilobar, and what the relationship is to the vasculature, both the inflow and the outflow. Assessing the underlying liver function and what we call the future liver remnant is really crucial in these individuals, uh, and whether or not that is sufficient after resection really drives a lot of our decision making. With respect to techniques, I really won't belabor this per se, but uh, it can be done open or laparoscopic. Uh, unfortunately, most of the cases that we see here are fairly complex, uh, multiple lesions and bad locations. They're not ideal candidates for laparoscopic procedures, and we'll talk about who those might be. 
Uh, ultrasound is routinely done in these folks. About 27% of the time we'll find lesions that were not obviously seen on CT, although I would say that with higher and higher quality CT, that figure is less and less over time. There are specific techniques that we use intraoperatively. We run these folks quite low, keep a CVP extremely low to minimize a venous back bleeding. Uh, this decreases the EBL and actually decreases the risk of post-op renal failure as well. So uh, close collaboration with our anesthesia colleagues is really of crucial importance, and that's certainly uh, the strategy we use here. We have a team that we constantly work with, and we have excellent perioperative outcomes with our uh, patients. Um, in terms of whether how the procedure is performed, it can either be an anatomic or non-anatomic resection. By anatomic, I mean a right lobe or a left lobe or an extended right. Sometimes we'll do segmentectomies, but also there's a role for non-anatomic resections, and we'll talk about that. Historically, those have been reserved for uh, patients that have smaller lesions, less than three centimeters or superficial, but I think that's been changing with new techniques and new technologies that we can use intraoperatively. Uh, stapling devices are very useful. I use them primarily for handling the vasculature, but it can also be used for handling the hyalur structures. And the goal, as always, is an R0 negative margin resection. Grossly, we aim for a one centimeter margin, but uh, pathologically, that's not necessary, uh, necessarily uh, required, and I'll, I'll, I'll show some data around that issue. Again, going back to the issue of laparoscopic liver resection and now robotic liver resection, uh, historically it's been used for solitary lesions, less than five in specific segments. The dome can be a tricky spot to work on. Uh, there have been concerns in the past about uh, margins, missed lesions, and so forth, uh, but results from a relatively large international series of about 100 patients suggested that uh, it can be done safely. That being said, the length of stay, frankly, was not dramatically shorter. Uh, the R0 resection rate, however, was quite good and comparable to open resections, and the uh, five-year survival is more or less what we expect to see in these folks. We normally quote patients that the five-year survival after complete resection of their primary and METs should be anywhere from 35 to 55 percent. Now, obviously, just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. You know, we often get criticized as surgeons that when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and so oftentimes, you know, I'll be asked, can you take this out? And you know, usually we can, quite frankly, but we probably shouldn't. Now, this is one scenario where I think, you know, we've learned over time what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And I would say that this is really the study that started uh, this whole uh, ball, if you will. This is uh, a study from 1988 called the Registry of Hepatic Metastases. It's a very... Um, it's a fairly sizable retrospective chart review, many institutions over a long period. So obviously a lot of temporal trends embedded behind the scenes here. But the bottom line is that I would say that prior to the study, individuals with hepatic uh, liver metastases were felt to be unresectable and incurable. And the study demonstrated that a subset of these folks uh, could actually be potentially salvaged with surgery. So in that study, there was an overall 33% five-year survival. Uh, and a 21% five-year uh, disease-free survival. So again, these are encouraging figures, and this really led the impetus to figure out who the most appropriate individuals uh, would be. That being said, this study, I think, led to a lot of persistent misconceptions that even now I still run into when I have discussions with uh, other surgeons, medical oncologists, patients, and other folks. Uh, and the, the, again, these are sort of persistent misconceptions that I'll try to debunk over the course of the talk. Uh, there is a, a sense that folks with more than three lesions, some folks will even say one lesion, but more than three lesions are not resectable. Folks with bilobar disease are not resectable, that margins have to be at least a centimeter. The folks with hyalur adenopathy or extrahepatic disease cannot be salvaged with surgery. And that folks with synchronous disease are not candidates for surgical resection. And by synchronous, I mean uh, either at the time of presentation, but there's also a sense that folks that present within a year do poorly and should not be considered for resection. Um, by this token, my patient, JS, would have been considered unresectable and incurable and really would not have been referred to me. Fortunately, I did meet with him, and we'll talk about what happened with him. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of these Smiths, and I'll sort of debunk them, so showing some of the data. These are two studies, one by uh, Minagawa, one by Weber. Uh, one is a series from Japan, about 230 patients. The other is about 155 patients from Sloan Kettering. And you can see a lot of these folks had more than three lesions, four or more. And you can see that in the series from Japan, they reported a 29% 10-year survival, which is really significant. Uh, and the series from Weber, 23% 5-year survival, which diminished uh, with more than nine lesions, which is you know, quite a bit, uh, honestly. Uh, they found that the number of lesions was not associated uh, with survival. That being said, it's a relatively small series, so it's hard to say to what extent this may have been underpowered. That being said, I think it demonstrated that more than three lesions uh, are reasonable when considering resection in these individuals. 
Uh, talking about margins, again, there's this misconception if you can't get a one centimeter margin, you shouldn't resect them. This actually demonstrated that as long as the margin is negative, uh, the outcomes are comparable. So whether the margin is one to four millimeters or five to nine or greater than 10, those, the survival is comparable in those individuals. That being said, a positive margin, and we consider anything less than a millimeter or frankly positive as positive, those individuals don't do well. And so if your sense is that you cannot clear that margin, that's not a patient that should be considered for resection and certainly not upfront resection. And we'll talk about ways to address that. Hyalur lymphadenopathy, again, this has been another bugaboo in the past. Uh, studies have shown, this is actually a series from Jack and colleagues, showing that individuals with metastases in certain regions, this is uh, what we call area one, which is the porta or the retropancreatic retroduodenal, those folks can actually do relatively well. And you can see these folks had a 30, 38% survival about three years out from resection. Now, that being said, metastases more central in the celiac axis tend to do poorly, so oftentimes when we operate on these folks, we'll carefully inspect and palpate that area. If we see disease at that site, we'll assess it intraoperatively. It's a, if it's positive, sometimes we will not move on with resection in that setting. Uh, not a, all extrahepatic disease is unresectable. Sometimes folks can have contiguous extension to an adjacent organ like the stomach or the hepatic flexure. Uh, intraluminal biliary extension can happen uh, due to tumor thrombus. Local regional recurrences uh, can occur in these cases, and extrahepatic disease is not necessarily a contraindication to resection. These are two series. They're relatively small, honest, uh, obviously, but nonetheless, it demonstrates that folks with uh, lung mets and peritoneal mets in the setting of liver metastases, as long as everything is resected with an R0, uh, as a R0 resection can potentially uh, have reasonable long-term uh, outcomes. You can see uh, patients with solitary lesions with long disease-free intervals, five-year survivals ranging from 27 to 74. Folks with peritoneal disease, uh, five-year survivals potentially around 25% uh, or so. Um, so. And a lot of that really has to do with the extent of um, of liver lesions and less so with the peritoneal disease. Now, that being said, obviously diffuse carcinomatosis, in my opinion, is not a great setting for a liver resection. So most of these folks don't necessarily move forward, but limited peritoneal disease is a different story. Now, this is actually a very complicated, but a very common issue. These are folks with synchronous uh, hepatic colorectal mets, i.e. they're diagnosed with a primary and at the same time they're found to have a lesion or multiple lesions in the liver. Uh, the, and so again, mis a lot of misconceptions, in my opinion, a lot of mistreatment in this domain. So I think it's important just to slow down and talk about this. Folks with unresectable hepatic colorectal metastases that have an asymptomatic uh, tumor, uh, primary tumor, do not need to be resected. Uh, the primary tumor does not need to be resected unless there's bleeding, obstruction, or perforation. For the most part, these folks tend to do fairly well. Now, if they have a fairly bulky left-sided or sigmoid tumor and have preobstructive symptoms, that, that I would say uh, would be uh, an exception to that rule. If folks have resectable hepatic colorectal disease, uh, it, in general, those folks tend to have a worse prognosis. Uh, they've obviously metastasized much earlier than a patient that had a primary resected three, four years ago, so the biology, uh, by definition, is different. So oftentimes in these folks will consider upfront resection, and we'll talk about the nuances of that in a minute. Uh, that can be helpful because it helps us tease out who's got disease elsewhere that we're not seeing at the time of initial presentation, and it also can actually facilitate the procedure itself. So how do we sequence the resection? Uh, should we do what we a, a synchronous or composite resection where we take out the primary metastasis at the same time, or is it better to stage them and do one before the other? Uh, there is a potential advantage uh, of doing them at the same time. You take everything out at once, potentially or theoretically minimize the risk of further metastases while you're waiting for a, from one surgery to the other. The argument has been that it's more cost effective, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. The disadvantages is that it's potentially more morbid. There's some isolated series suggesting that uh, these folks uh, potentially have higher both uh, periop morbidity but also periop mortality rates. Uh, an advantage of separating them out, uh, or a disadvantage, I should say, is that you're leaving gross disease in place or, where you're moving from one procedure to the other, potentially a risk for further metastases, potentially less cost effective because you're doing two procedures instead of one. An advantage is that it's potentially it's less morbid. So we wanted to get a handle on this issue, and we did this by analyzing data from the uh, National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. This is a very large 
uh, contemporary uh, propensity score based analysis that we did over a, a several year period and it's the largest that's been reported uh, on this topic to date. Uh, we control for the characteristics of the patient as well as the tumor and lots of other characteristics including uh, temporal trends and data propensity score match analysis because obviously this is non-random treatment assignment. And these are the results of the study. So I'll, I'll show you the data for patients with colon metastases, I'm sorry, for a colon primary and liver mets and rectal primaries and liver mets. But the story, or I would say the results, are comparable. And that is that essentially the complication rates when you do co combined resections are much higher than when you do them in an isolated fashion. You can see here that the serious complication rate when you do a colon resection and liver resection at the same time is almost 45%. When you separate them and do them separately, it drops about 27 or 27 percent on each one. And you can see that actually the death rate is higher if you do the cases together than when you separate them out. You can see the adjusted analysis off to the right, and you can see that there's a significant decrease in the morbidity uh, and, and, and all these various outcomes when you basically separate, a, you take a composite resection and separate it into its individual parts. Uh, we see a similar signal here uh, for uh, rectal surgery in combination with liver surgery. You can see that the serious complication rate is about 42% compared to about 26 to 28%. And again, you see uh, a statistically significant independent decrease in morbidity and mortality when you separate the procedures and don't do them at the same time. Uh, when you dig into the data a little bit more carefully, you actually find uh, when you look at colon surgery and rectal surgery that when you do them in, in combination, there's a much higher rate of respiratory complications, much higher rate of organ space infections. Uh, these are sort of intraperitoneal abscesses, usually at the site of the liver resection, but sometimes at the site of the colon resection, and a much higher rate of sepsis. And this is likely what's driving those high morbidity and mortality rates that I just uh, demonstrated to you. So that being said, I think that in general, we feel that stage resections are really the way to go in these individuals. Uh, simultaneous resections have a higher morbidity and mortality in the setting of colon cancer. Now, it's possible that they may be reasonable with a minor liver resection, uh, and sometimes we will do that in that setting, but if I have a large uh, right lobectomy or tricyclomectectomy, I try not to do that at the same time as the colorectal procedure. So uh, again, going back to the issue of anatomic versus non-anatomic, and again, and this is uh, pertinent uh, to what we discussed before, you can see that it, with respect to cumulative survival, it's really comparable. So as long as the resection can be done safely, whether or not it's anatomic or non-anatomic is, is, uh, is irrelevant. And this has pushed us to doing what we call parenchymal sparing resections, where we can actually leave much more of the liver behind than we used to. Uh, and this is important because we want to optimize the future liver remnant, as we discussed. So, so what are the new standards for resection? So now, essentially, really what we think about is what will need to be removed, and the concept is that uh, the disease has to be completely resected. As I tell folks, it's really all or none. Either we take out all the primary and all the mets, or it's not worth doing any of it, quite frankly. And then once we do that, we have to know what we're leaving behind. Uh, at minimum, we need to have two adjacent liver segments that are spared and intact and, and functioning. Uh, and we do this by assessing the volume of the remaining liver, and we want to ensure that it's adequate. And adequacy depends on a couple of things, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is an example of a patient with bilobar disease. This is a patient that historically would have not, would have felt to be not uh, amenable to resection or any kind of liver-directed therapies and would have felt to be incurable. So the question is, can we use techniques such as liver-directed therapies to take these folks to surgery? So this is where things like radiofrequency ablation and now microwave ablation that we use more frequently can be used. The concept here is uh, by whatever technique it results in tissue heating and destruction of that mass. We use this a lot for small HCCs. There's a role for it as well in hepatic colorectal mets. In general though, the lesions need to be less than four centimeters in size, otherwise the local recurrence rates are quite high. This is a fairly safe procedure. You can see sort of what it looks like pre uh, and this is what it looks like post. You'll always have this uh, RFA cavity or microwave ablation cavity, and if you see enhancement over time, that indicates uh, a local recurrence. This is a uh, results from a series off to the right, uh, showing that uh, obviously folks that have resection alone tend to do best. If for whatever reason you can't resect all the disease, RFA is an option, uh, but it, it certainly appears that the outcomes are not as optimal as with resection alone. That being said, Probably a combination of resection and ablation is better than chemotherapy alone whenever possible. Um, and so uh, we do try to optimize cytoreduction in younger individuals where we feel that this is an achievable goal. 
So going back to our patient, again, this is a gentleman that had three liver lesions, bilobar, two, uh, one on the right, two on the left. So we consider doing an extended right hepatic lobectomy, or also called a trisectionectomy, uh, and then potentially doing a percutaneous RFA of the lesion on the left side. So obviously when we do that, we have to try to figure out, can a patient like this handle having that much of the liver removed, and what would the future liver remnant look like, and how well is that functioning? So this is where pre-op assessment of that FLR really comes into play. You can see data here from a study off to the right showing that the volume of the liver remnant uh, is uh, very much associated with the risk of liver failure. You can see that patients, the dark dots on the right, uh, when they have a lower future liver remnant, the risk of liver failure is much higher. So in general, uh, in patients with normal hepatic parenchyma, most of the folks in this room, we wanna make sure that the future liver remnant is at least 20 to 25% of the total liver volume. If folks have been pretreated with chemotherapy or have any type of underlying liver disease, usually want to have that future liver remnant be at least 30%. Folks with fibrosis and cirrhosis it ideally should be higher than 50%. In general, those folks we don't consider for anything more than a segmentectomy. Um, what we do is something called a portal vein embolization. This was actually a technique that was developed by actually observing what cholangiocarcinomas do. They tend to wrap around portal veins, and that leads to lobar atrophy and contralateral portal hyper, uh, lobar hypertrophy. And that's essentially what we do. We work with our colleagues in interventional radiology, and they'll actually percutaneously access uh, the side that will be resected. They'll embolize that side and divert all the portal flow to the contralateral side to induce hypertrophy preoperatively. Um, oftentimes it's used in the setting of trisectionectomies, but sometimes in folks that are just having a single lobe, if the other lobe is fairly small, we have to deploy this and actually have a patient that we're doing this for as we speak. Um, the results, uh, the fact is that these folks tend to do as well. The procedure is very safe, um, and the five-year survivals are comparable to individuals that did not require portal vein embolization preoperatively. Normally we embolize, we wait about a month, repeat scans, repeat the volumetric analysis, and decide if it's safe to move forward. Uh, this is uh, JS. Uh, we felt that it was important to go ahead and induce hypertrophy of the left lobe. His FLR was less than 30% at the time of presentation. Here you can see the uh, radiologist accessing uh, the portal vein, and then essentially that catheter is pulled back into the vein of interest, which would be the right portal vein in this case. The vein is embolized. You can see here truncation of the flow into the right lobe. And you can see what happens to his future liver and that it goes from 30% to 46% over a one month period. And so this sort of brought him out of the, that, that touchy uh, uh, go, a touch and go zone of less than 30% to an area of a very generous future liver remnant that, that we, felt, we felt was safe for resection. Uh, another issue is technically unresectable disease. Uh, this is a very common problem as well, and the question is, can upfront chemotherapy be used to convert these individuals to resectable? Uh, we've learned over time that uh, chemotherapy is obviously has changed dramatically. Uh, response rates with uh, single agent to multi-agent, including now targeted agents, have uh, gone from anywhere from about 20% to sometimes as almost 50% of individuals. By the same token, the median survival has improved dramatically from around six months to now, we quote usually about a two-year median survival for folks with a systemic chemotherapy alone. So what's the role of uh, uh, neo or adjuvant therapy? So again, systemic chemotherapy historically used for uh, nodal disease in the post-op setting. We now use it more and more in these individuals to downstage them, uh, even if they're uh, resectable uh, prior to surgery. Sometimes it's helpful to do some downstaging. And we can convert folks from, potentially convert folks from unresectable to resectable. Uh, some potential benefits of providing uh, uh, pre-op therapy. As I mentioned to you, folks with synchronous disease uh, have a, a worse prognosis, may have occult disease somewhere else. So it allows us to assess the tempo or the natural history of their disease. It allows us to also test the chemoresponsiveness of their tumors. Obviously, while the tumor is in place, if you try regimen A and you see downstaging, that's the right regimen for them. Had I resected that patient and we had given them regimen A, we wouldn't know if that's the right regimen or not. So it allows us to figure out whether that's the right uh, chemotherapeutic regimen or not. Oftentimes, when we do this, we'll realize that Folfox, which is usually the um, first line of treatment, is ineffective, and we'll switch to Fulfiri. Uh, it increases the R0 resection rate. I'll show you some information about that. May eradicate micrometastatic disease at presentation. 
Uh, and we've also found that response to neoadjuvant therapy is associated to, with long-term survival. So it's, it's a helpful piece of prognostic information up front. Uh, finally, it also helps us identify patients more likely to benefit from hepatic resection, specifically individuals with KRAS and BRAF mutations that tend to do worse. These individuals, if they don't respond to neoadjuvant therapy, sometimes will not be great candidates for attempted resection. This is a uh, series showing the impact of conversion chemotherapy. You can see that a subset of about 138 individuals uh, uh, were uh, basically um, converted uh, to resectable individuals in this series. Um, about uh, 1,100 were initially unresectable. Uh, they received about 10 cycles of chemotherapy, which is a bit more than we do, do nowadays, but you can see that a significant portion of those individuals were ultimately salvaged. And when you look at, uh, this is an example of the types of responses that we see. This is an individual that had a very bulky tumor near the hepatic vein confluence and another individual with a disease near the uh, portal vein bifurcation. These are the pre-treatment images. These are the post-treatment images. Very dramatic downstaging. It's not uncommon for us to see exactly this type of downstaging oftentimes. And you can sort of see why this individual uh, was not resectable before, and this is a very manageable uh, surgical procedure uh, uh, in the post-chemotherapy setting. Um, and uh, these individuals tend to do fairly well. Uh, folks that are uh, resectable up front tend to have the best survival, but that being said, folks that are downstage and go on to resection still can enjoy a fairly good five-year survival, and you can see here about a third of those individuals uh, live uh, through that time point. A neoadjuvant chemo uh, can downstage individuals. This is a, a, pr a perspective series uh, from Anderson showing that uh, from the time that patients got no neoadjuvant to single agent to multi-agent, uh, the size of the tumors got smaller. Uh, they were able to take on uh, individuals with more tumors. That being said, the periop complication rate was actually lower. Some of this has to do with improvements in surgical anesthetic techniques, but also the R0 resection rates were higher because we had smaller tumors that are much more manageable, and ultimately this is really what we strive for, which is an R0 resection. Um, there is a, a risk of hepatotoxicity. We can see fatty liver in some of these individuals over time. Uh, and steatohepatitis is particularly problematic, specifically with an agent called urinary TCAN. So we try to minimize the exposure. We try to operate on these folks after no more than two to three months. Uh, sometimes I'll get them, you know, six or eight months out. Unfortunately, these folks oftentimes will have fibrotic livers that are really not candidates for resection at that time. So I think as a medical oncologist, if you think you have an individual that might have potentially resectable disease, having a conversation with your HPB or surgical oncologist um, up front is really crucial to make sure that you time the sequence uh, uh, optimally. Uh, complete radiologic response is sometimes seen in these individuals. There's a misconception, again, that if you can't see the tumor, it's not there. That being said, we've learned uh, that actually about 80% of these individuals would have residual microscopic disease at the time of resection. So if, if the tumor was there before, even if it's apparently not there on imaging, whether it's CT or PET, we still recommend resection. Um, about so just to summarize, again, uh, I think I've given you a flavor for the complexity of this topic and the various treatment options that are available. Uh, this really requires multidisciplinary management. These folks need to be evaluated at a multidisciplinary tumor board at the time of presentation. Specifically, they have synchronous disease. Early assessment by hepatobiliary or cancer surgeon is really crucial. It's important to understand whether or not individuals are candidates or not. It's, it's important to understand the baseline extent of disease with optimal imaging. Um, upfront chemotherapy is extremely helpful. Uh, Liver-directed therapies can play a role. Uh, and assessing the future liver remnant, again, very, very important. This is one of the reasons why, again, surgeons need to be involved. I think our colleagues in interventional radiology have made it possible for us to operate on folks that historically we would not have been able to operate. This is where portal vein embolizations come in, and the concept of stage resection is, again, very important. Uh, a experienced surgeon uh, is very important. Uh, ultrasounds need to be done intraoperatively. We talked about specialized anesthetic techniques as well as surgical techniques. Frankly, in, in my opinion, those are a lot more straightforward and less complex than a lot of the decision making that happens in the, in the pre-op setting and in the pre-operative setting. 
Uh, and again, that's why I think these types of conversations really need to be had at the time of presentation. Post-op care, uh, these folks do need to be monitored very carefully. Uh, adjuvant therapy sometimes can be valuable. Oftentimes we'll give them a full six months of, of systemic therapy. So if they receive two or four pre-op, we'll finish up with another uh, 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 two to four cycles, so we have a total of six cycles. Close surveillance is also very important. Uh, some of these folks can recur, and there is a potential role for resalvage, resection at a later time. So again, just going back to the patient we presented, uh, he uh, completed neoadjuvant therapy and pelvic chemoradiation. Two months later had, um, sorry, I think I skipped a slide. Okay, there we go. So he presented uh, in, with synchronous disease, started neoadjuvant chemotherapy for the reasons we discussed, had a right portal vein embolization, and we did an ablation of the lesion on the left, uh, and then subsequently had a liver resection. We did a right hepatic lobectomy, three centimeter lesion. You could see significant downstaging and treatment effect within that lesion, uh, and also an R0 non-anatomic resection of the segment four lesion, 1.2 and very little viable tumor within it. So again, you can see the value here of uh, neoadjuvant therapy. Subsequently had neoadjuvant therapy, chemoradiation to his pelvis followed by resection of his primary. He had a T3 N0 tumor with extensive treatment response. And here he is five years out from his uh, uh, presentation disease free. So again, this is an individual that prior to some of the advances that I discussed would have been considered unresectable, uh, likely would have gotten very little if any uh, treatment and, and would likely not have survived beyond six months. And you can see that we now see more and more of these folks that uh, can be salvaged and can be long-term survivors. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Esniola, for this um, presentation. I think it provides hope for a lot of patients out there with colorectal cancer meds. So moving to a different topic now on inflammatory bowel disease, I would like to uh, introduce the next speaker, is Dr. Carrie Glasner, who's one of our um, uh, homegrown, I should say, uh, who's done her training here at Methodist, um, and now our newest member of our faculty and our IBD specialist. She's going to be presenting to us uh, today on managing extraintestinal manifestations in inflammatory bowel disease. Thank you so much, Dr. Abraham. Thank you, Dr. Quigley, for inviting me to be here today. I'm excited to get to talk to every, everybody about extra-intestinal manifestations in IBD, or EIMs. So EIMs in inflammatory bowel disease are actually very common and can affect up to 50% of our patients. Um, they're more common in Crohn's disease as compared to ulcerative colitis, and they're actually more common with colonic Crohn's disease. And we see that patients who have one extraintestinal manifestation are at an increased risk for developing other EIMs. Um, they're also associated with a longer disease duration, and the pathogenesis is really not well understood. There's several different theories. Um, one of which is that antigen exposure in the gut, which is triggering an immune response, is also triggering an immune response in other parts of the body, whereas other theories um, actually propose that possibly these are two separate events and that the same risk factors for IBD predispose for these extraintestinal manifestations, so genetic risk factors and environmental factors. Now this is just really illustrating that EIMs can affect really any organ system in the body, and so we're gonna go through many of these in more detail. So as I was just mentioning, it is thought that there is a link with genetics and the development of EIMs in IBD. And what we've seen is that there's actually an increased genetic concordance, um, that there is about 70% in parent-child pairs with um, IBD, and about 84% in sibling pairs. We've also seen that specific HLAs are linked to specific EIMs. So for example, HLA-B8 DR3 is associated with an increased risk of PSC in ulcerative colitis. 
We've also seen that about 50 to 70% of patients with IBD who also have ankylosing spondylitis are HLA-B27 positive. And interestingly, the converse is not true. HLA-B27 is not a risk factor for the development of IBD. So when do EIMs occur? Well, actually about 25% can occur prior to the IBD diagnosis. Um, and then if we follow patients out for about 30 years after being diagnosed with IBD, we see that up to that 50% that I mentioned will develop an EIM. I also want to point out this table on the lower right, and basically what this is showing is that EIMs may or may not parallel the course of IBD disease activity, and so this is important when we're considering treatment. So first I want to start off with ocular EIMs. These affect anywhere from 2 to 6% of our patients, and it's very important to distinguish between these. Episcleritis, you may see redness, um, but no pain and no visual changes, and that's important to keep in mind. This typically parallels the disease course of IBD, and so the treatment is just treating the underlying inflammatory bowel disease. Whereas with uveitis, these patients will have pain, blurry vision, and they require referral to ophthalmology. Um, and that's because untreated disease can actually lead to permanent uh, visual defects. Uh, this typically runs an independent disease course from that of inflammatory bowel disease, but treatment can include steroids and, uh, in some cases, biologics. So erythema nodosum um, is actually the most common dermatologic manifestation in IBD and can affect up to 15% of our patients. As you can see in these pictures here, um, it involves the subcutaneous fat and is associated with painful raised red to purple nodules, and it mostly occurs with disease activity of IBD. And so the treatment of this is really just treating the underlying IBD, and these should improve. I also want to point out here that as you can see in the diagram, erythema nodosum is more common in females than in males. And the most common location for erythema nodosum in both males and females is on the lower anterior legs. Now, this is as um, opposed to pyoderma gangrenosum, which can occur independent of disease activity of IBD. This usually starts as a nodule or a pustule, typically around the extensor surfaces or can also occur around a stoma and tends to occur in locations where there's been some type of trauma, and this is thought to be due to the pathogen phenomenon. And so that's important to remember when we're thinking about how we're gonna diagnose and treat this, because we wanna avoid biopsying if possible. Um, so this diagnosis should really be made based on clinical history, um, unless there's significant concern for an alternative diagnosis. The other thing that we want to keep in mind is that this can be treated with uh, topical therapies, steroids, <coughs> immunosuppression, in some case biologics, and we want to avoid surgical debridement for the same reasons that I just mentioned uh, with biopsying the lesion. Um, typically about 50% of patients who have pyoderma also have inflammatory bowel disease, so if you have someone that is presenting with pyoderma, they do need to be evaluated for underlying IBD. So psoriasis is also something that's very commonly seen uh, with inflammatory bowel disease, and this can be independent or related to IBD treatment, in particular anti-TNF therapy. Um, now we do need to remember that up to half of our patients who have an anti-TNF-induced psoriasis can actually still be continued on the anti-TNF, we just need to go ahead and treat the psoriasis with topical therapy. Now, the other 50% who maybe have more severe um, presentation of psoriasis or don't respond to topical therapy may need to have a switch in therapy. And um, importantly, you do not want to switch them to another anti-TNF because this is very likely to happen again. Um, a good option for these patients would actually be ustekinumab, which is an IL-12-23 inhibitor, and this is also approved not only for UC and Crohn's, but also for psoriasis. Hair loss, so this is something that we hear about all the time from our patients, very, very common, and 
Typically, it's associated with active inflammation. So what we tend to see is that when patients have a flare, several months later, their hair goes into what's called telogen effluvium. And this is basically a resting phase where they have significant shedding of the hair. The good news is, is that you, this is usually transient and the hair will regrow. Um, but we also need to think about other things that could be contributing to this. And so as I've listed here, there's several different autoimmune conditions that are associated with IBD that we need to rule out. And uh, vitamin and mineral deficiencies are also very, very common in IBD, and these can contribute to hair loss as well. And then finally, if we've evaluated for all of these things, um, we also need to remember that medications can contribute to hair loss. So there may be some cases where we may, may need to switch patients' medical therapy. Aptostomatitis is also uh, common with active disease. This can affect up to 10% of our patients. And really the treatment is obviously treating the underlying inflammatory bowel disease. However, we can help our patients symptomatically by uh, prescribing them topical lidocaine for the pain. And also we can use topical steroids with benzocaine oral paste to try and help expedite the healing for them. We also, again, want to think about other etiologies that could be contributing. So as I already mentioned, uh, nutrition, uh, nutri nutritional deficiencies are quite common in IBD, and so we want to be thinking about those. Um, also, in our patients who are immunosuppressed, we want to think about possible viral infections like HSV-1. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is a chronic cholestatic liver disease that affects the bile ducts of um, patients. And what happens is chronic inflammation leads to fibrosis and stricturing that can affect the intra and hepatic bile ducts. Now, about 70 to 80% of PSC patients have IBD, mainly ulcerative colitis. Um, so in patients who have a diagnosis of PSC that have not been evaluated or diagnosed with underlying IBD, guidelines actually recommend screening them with colonoscopy every five years rather than every 10 years. Um, of our UC patients, only about 2 to 7 percent have PSC, but it's very important that we make this diagnosis because it's associated with an increased risk of colon cancer, um, much higher even than that associated with IBD itself. And so these patients really need to undergo annual screening colonoscopy immediately after the diagnosis is made. And in my patients with IBD who have PSC, I'm actually doing chromoendoscopy because of their significantly increased risk. The other thing to keep in mind is that this risk for colon cancer also continues even after liver transplant. So even if a PSC patient has had a transplant, they still need to be having their yearly colonoscopies for screening. Um, other things that, you know, we should keep in mind with PSC is that there's an increased risk for pouchitis. And so this is, you know, important when we're thinking about potential surgery for our patients. Um, and there's also an increased risk of hepatobiliary cancers as well. And this has been controversial, but the most recent AGA guidelines actually do recommend uh, screening for cholangiocarcinoma every 6 to 12 months with imaging plus or minus tumor markers. So calcium oxalate stones are something else that's very common in our patients with IBD, in particular those with Crohn's disease. And the reason for that is patients who have had an ileal resection or who have active ileal disease have decreased resorption of bile acids, and this actually leads to an increase in luminal-free fatty acids. And this changes um, the binding of calcium. The, the fatty acids bind up the calcium, which frees up oxalate, which is then increasingly reabsorbed. And this leads to an increased risk of oxalate stones. And this is the same mechanism for cholelithiasis. So what do we recommend for our patients who have nephrolithiasis? Well, we need to be telling them to increase their fluid intake. We also need to recommend that they're following a low oxalate, high calcium diet. And unfortunately, many of these foods that are high in oxalate are healthier foods, um, but unfortunately, we do have to recommend that they avoid these. So what about thrombosis and IBD? We know that active inflammatory bowel disease is associated with a hypercoagulable state. 
And this leads to an increased risk of both arterial and venous thromboembolic events. And so what I really want to point out here in this table on the right is if you look um, under hospitalizations and patients who are having a flare, you do see that there's an increased risk, about a three times increased risk of DVT and PE. However, if you look under outpatients with a flare, you can see that that risk is 16 times higher. So I really want to emphasize that our patients who are, not only our patients who are hospitalized for flares of IBD, they should be getting DVT prophylaxis, but our outpatients who are presenting with lower leg swelling, pain, shortness of breath, tachycardia, we really need to have a very high index of suspicion for DVT or PE and be evaluating for that. Now, this was a study that was looking at that risk of thromboembol uh, thromboembolism in I IBD compared to non-IBD patients. And this actually showed that the risk is increased in IBD compared to the general population, and that this risk increases with age. Now, I mentioned that there's also an increased risk of arterial thrombosis. So this was a very large study that looked at the risk of myocardial infarction in our patients with IBD. And what we saw here was they looked at 30 million patients, so very, very large study. And about, of those, about 300,000 had IBD. And they found that there was a significantly increased risk of MI, in particular in patients under the age of 40. You can see that gray line there is actually the odds ratio, and that risk is attenuated as patients um, uh, increase in age, and that's just due to their developing more cardiovascular risk factors um, as they get older. So this is something that we're actually looking into here at Methodist. Uh, we have a group of cardiologists and gastroenterologists, um, including myself, and we're looking more into the link between IBD and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Um, and the effects of medications like biologics on controlling inflammation, seeing if this will decrease the risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and strategies that we can use to uh, prevent atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in these patients. And I'm actually going to be talking more about this on Grand Rounds on Tuesday, so if you're interested, please join me at that time. This was another study that actually came out of our group. Uh, using the National Health Interview Survey. Um, this was about 60,000 patients, um, of which about 1,000 had inflammatory bowel disease. And what we found that was individuals who had not yet developed uh, cardiovascular disease, um, that IBD was independ independently associated with an increased risk of risk factors for cardiovascular disease. In particular, hypertension, diabetes, um, high cholesterol, and insufficient physical activity. We also looked at the risk for developing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and what we found was that in patients under the age of 65, there was a significantly increased risk, and in particular, females more so than males. And so the thought is that chronic inflammation is predisposing these patients to developing atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And we've seen this with other chronic immune-mediated diseases, including psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus. Now moving on to inflammatory arthritis, we have several different categories here. Um, first is our peripheral arthropathy, and that's made up of type 1, which is an oligoarticular arthropathy, typically affecting five or fewer joints. And type 2 is a polyarticular arthropathy. And then we have our axial arthropathies, which include inflammatory back pain, sacroiliitis, and ankylosing spondylitis. Now, these should really be managed um, concomitantly with a rheumatologist. So this is our type 1 arthropathy, and this tends to parallel the disease activity of IBD and usually involves the larger joints, so the knees, and is typically asymmetric. Now, very important to keep in mind, this is non-deforming and non-erosive, as opposed to the changes that are seen with psoriatic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. Now, our type 2 peripheral arthropathy can be independent of IBD disease activity, 
and usually is symmetric and involves the smaller joints in the hands and the fingers. This can be chronic and symptoms can persist for months to years. And again, this is non-deforming and non-erosive. Our axial arthropathies are not linked to IBD activity and they're not changed by surgery for IBD. Inflammatory back pain has several characteristic features, um, including an insidious onset, pain that typically tends to occur at night, um, an age under, um, they're diagnosed with this under the age of 40. Exercise tends to help with the pain, whereas rest does not. Now with sacroiliitis, there are radiologic findings of inflammation of the SI joint um, and can actually be asymptomatic in up to 32% of our IBD patients. It is more associated with a longer disease duration. Ankylosing spondylitis uh, is inflammatory back pain and sacroiliitis on imaging with one of the following that I've listed there below. Um, and again, important to keep in mind the HLA B27 positivity link that I talked about before. And these axial arthropathies are more common in males than females. So how do we treat our um, arthropathy? Well, this depends upon which specific type we're talking about. So with our type one peripheral arthropathy, this parallels um, disease activity of IBD. So the treatment is gonna be treating the underlying inflammatory bowel disease and their symptoms should improve. Now with our type two or our axial arthropathy, we can consider the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. However, in IBD, there's been an association of uh, NSAIDs with flares of disease. So in my patients, I tend to use COX-2 inhibitors, and studies have not shown any increased risk of flare um, in IBD with the use of these. The other thing that we want to think about is, can we manage their um, axial or type 2 peripheral disease um, and their IBD with one medication. And so this is where an anti-TNF may be a great option for our patients, um, or even a JAK inhibitor um, for ulcerative colitis. Um, IL-12-23 antagonist I have listed here, but this is controversial. There was actually a recent post hoc analysis of the uh, UNITY uh, clinical trial, which uh, looked at the use of ustekinumab or an IL-12-23 inhibitor in uh, Crohn's disease, and actually found no improvement in EIMs with the exception of erythema nodosum. Um, however, there are some patients that we may have that are doing so well with their IBD on one biologic and maybe have failed you know, other biologics in the past that we may not want to change their therapy and there's certain patients who I may have on more than one biologic or a biologic and a small molecule to control both their IBD and their EIMs. Other things that we want to think about, um, osteopenia and osteoporosis are quite common in IBD and are thought to be associated both with treatment, so prednisone in particular, um, and also are associate, associated with inflammation and malabsorption. So we want to make sure that our IBD patients are getting enough calcium, um, are getting enough vitamin D, that they're performing weight-bearing activity, and that we're assessing appropriate patients with bone density scans. In particular, our very high-risk patients who have had prolonged or repeated courses of steroids, our patients who maybe have concomitant celiac disease, which is also a risk factor for osteoporosis, or our patients with cholestatic liver disease, um, again, another risk factor for osteoporosis. So important to be screening uh, these patients. So in summary, extraintestinal manifestations of IBD are common. Um, not all are associated with disease activity, so just treating the IBD itself may not be enough. Um, and not all symptoms are due to IBD, so we need to rule out common things first. And preventive care, including healthcare maintenance, are all a part of the management of our patients with IBD. Thank you very much. I look forward to any questions um, that may have come up. Thank you, Dr. Glasner, for that informative pre presentation. So uh, since uh, Dr. Esniola and Dr. Glasner is coming up on, um, we'll, on stage, we'll go ahead and uh, have you guys seated so we can go through some questions. We have about 10 minutes before our break, so hope, if you have questions, please bring them on uh, right now. Um, 
So Dr. Esniola, any role for transplantation for colorectal cancer METs? Assuming liver. Uh, so, yeah, so that's being explored. We actually have a program here for patients that are considered unresectable. Uh, I, again, I, I would say the first line is still resection, but in folks that are unresectable, um, especially folks that have been stable on systemic therapy for a relatively long period of time, transplantation may be of value. So again, we have a protocol here. I know there's other institutions as well that are exploring that as a possibility. Um, what should be the workup for the evaluation of liver metastasis in the colorectal cancer patient? You know, you discuss a lot during your presentation. Sure. Yeah. So uh, these individuals should have obviously a full metastatic workup. Ideally, I want to make sure that everything's been done within a month of my evaluating them. So we want to make sure that we get a chest CT, uh, liver protocol scan, uh, and then uh, pelvic imaging. Uh, if they have a primary in place, if it's a rectal tumor, obviously we want to get a rectal MRI as well. Um, PET scans, again, can be very helpful if they have a very elevated CEA, much more so that we might expect to see a PET scan can be valuable. If it's an individual where we think there's a potential possibility of clinically occult extrahepatic metastases, PET scan, again, uh, is really crucial. Okay. And again, we need to assess what their future liver remnant might be. So if we don't have recent LFTs, we want to make sure to get those. If there's a concern about hepatitis, we want to get a hepatitis screen. So we want to get a firm handle not just on the extent of the disease, but what if any liver uh, dysfunction that individual may have a presentation. Great. Um, uh, more questions for you here. So fantastic talk, Dr. Esniola. Can you comment on how follow-up care or ACT decisions and DFS changes with staged and anatomic resections when radiographic response is in conflict with histological response. I'm not sure what ACT and DFS stands for. Uh, if you can clarify that, whoever sent in the question. Yeah, I'm not sure what that question is. Maybe if yeah. they can clarify that, I'm happy to come back to okay, it. Okay, we can come back to that one then. Um, how often do more, this one's for Dr. Glasner, so how often do more than one EIM occur in the same patient? What challenges does this pose? So once a patient has had one um, extraintestinal manifestation, they're at risk for having others. Um, and the challenge that this poses is, again, determining whether or not these EIMs parallel d the disease course of IBD or if they're independent of that. Um, because that will really change what we're doing to treat um, the extra intestinal manifestation. And as I was mentioning, sometimes we have challenges where we may have our IBD patient very, very well controlled on one biologic, and we worry that if we switch them to something else that may also treat the extra intestinal manifestation, that they may not have as good of a response with their bowel disease. So I think the challenge is just in determining, you know, the, the appropriate treatment for these patients who have multiple extra-intestinal manifestations. Okay. Another question for you, Dr. Glasner. Do you routinely refer all IBD patients to ophthalmology? If not, what is your trigger for referral? So I do not routinely refer all of my IBD patients to ophthalmology, but if they have any um, changes in vision, any redness, or as I was mentioning, pain, in particular pain and visual changes need to be referred to ophthalmology right away. Um, and so those are the patients that I am referring over to ophthalmology. Okay, Dr. Estanola, so some clarification on your question. So ACT stands for adjuvant chemotherapy and DFS for disease-free survival. So can you comment on follow-up care um, or decisions on adjuvant chemotherapy, I'm assuming? Uh, sure. So I think they're, um, they're brought up staged and anatomic resections with radiographic response. So, I mean, I would say that, honestly, it's unusual for us to see a good radiologic response that doesn't jive with a good pathologic response. Usually, usually those things go hand in hand. Uh, I would say that empirically we try to give these folks six months of systemic therapy whenever possible. Uh, if they've had a rough time with neoadjuvant therapy and have an excellent pathologic response or a near complete response, sometimes we may not complete that. But as a general rule, we try to empirically do the full six months whenever possible. Um, I think in terms of follow-up, we do follow these folks very carefully. These are individuals that I will see every three months, again, for the reasons that we discussed. Uh, sometimes recurrences can be very subtle and nuanced, whether it's at an RFA or microwave ablation cavity and or at a new site. And so uh, I think careful follow-up is really crucial. Um, we don't necessarily treat them beyond six months. So if we feel that there is no clinical evidence of disease, 
uh, we will observe these folks. We don't necessarily keep them on systemic chemotherapy. Now, if there's a rise in the CA, then we do aggressive, a very aggressive restaging workup and figure out what the right next step needs to be. Right. I just took a question for Kerry. One of the in interesting phenomena is that the, in terms of biologics, some work in arthropathies but don't work in inflammatory bowel disease, some work in psoriasis, don't work in inflammatory bowel disease. How do you manage, is, does that cause a challenge for you and manage the patient with who's got IBD and one of these manifestations which may respond to a different biologic? Yes, this definitely can, because then we kind of get into that um, issue of whether we maybe need to have patients on more than one biologic at once, and we may need to have them on a biologic and a small molecule. Um, so certainly it, it poses a challenge when you know, we, we may have them very well controlled on one agent that doesn't work for the um, you know, peripheral arthropathy. So there are, we actually have um, quite a few patients here that we're managing on um, combination therapy, and we've seen very good outcomes in those patients. Interestingly, we see um, with that, even in the same type of mechanism of action, one brand of medicine works on one disease, while the other brand, even though it's the same mechanism, doesn't work for the other disease as well. So final question here, are there any therapies or treatment strategies that include probiotics for IBD or any associated extraintestinal manifestations? So the use of probiotics in IBD is um, somewhat controversial. The studies have been very conflicting. Um, and what we've seen in general is that, in particular with Crohn's disease, we have not seen a benefit for probiotic use. Um, we do see that in possibly in mild to moderate ulcerative colitis, there may be some benefit from probiotic use. And also in patients who have undergone colectomy and have a J pouch, um, there is benefit with use of specific antibiotics to help prevent uh, the development of pouchitis. But the problem is just that the studies have all been kind of conflicting and they all use different types of probiotics. Um, and so I'm not aware of any studies that have specifically looked at probiotic use for extra intestinal manifestations. Okay. Well, uh, more questions are coming up on this, but um, you did mention your, uh, our um, research on the gut microbiome and cardiovascular metabolic disease, but can you comment on potential correlation for this? for IBD and cardiovascular metabolic disease? Yeah, so there's not a whole lot of data out there on this yet, which is kind of the whole reason that we're looking more into this, and we've developed this group of you know, cardiologists and gastroenterologists, um, and so we hope to have you know, more studies and um, data on this in the future. And, and since our answers are coming in pretty quickly, the, uh, one last question perhaps. How do you approach patients who are being treated for IBD who develop abnormal liver enzymes? Um, it's, is it an extraintestinal manifestation or is it a medication-induced elevation? Yeah, so that's a very good question, and that's where, um, you know, typically I will do further workup, especially if they've had elevated liver enzymes on multiple sets of labs. Um, so, you know, if it's their first time developing elevated liver enzymes and the elevations are mild, then I may say, you know, let's repeat the labs in a week, two weeks, and, you know, see where we're at with that. If there's significant elevations, then, you know, I'm immediately doing further workup with ultrasound and then potentially labs to rule out other, um, you know, other other etiologies such as hepatitis. Obviously, if we haven't checked for that, that would be a concern, especially in our patients on biologic therapy. We usually always are checking for you know, hepatitis B before we're starting that. Um, and then other, other autoimmune um, liver conditions that can be associated with IBD as well. And then based on that initial workup, you know, it may lead to further imaging, for example, with primary sclerosing cholangitis, when we may just see elevation of the alkaline phosphatase, um, depending upon the rest of the workup, then that may lead to getting um, an MRCP to further evaluate for that. In fact, with, with biologic therapy, it's quite rare to see liver enzyme abnormalities. We saw it very frequently with acetyprin, 6 mercaptopurine and methotrexate, um, and perhaps the newer uh, small molecules that we're using with biologic therapy was quite rare. So we're always looking at other radiologies. Well, thank you, everyone, for your attention. We'll go ahead and close this session. Lunch. Thank you. It's and lunch available. Yes. And we'll, we'll reconvene in 20 minutes. Okay, thank you to both speakers, and thank you for joining Thank you.
and Dr. Datchett chair this afternoon's session. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neha Mathur. I'll be chairing this session with Dr. Dacha. Thanks for um, a great morning. So we're going to get started with our afternoon. I have the uh, esteemed pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Dr. Sunil Dacha. Um, he's my colleague uh, in the GI department, and he soon joined, like about soon after I did, and has really um, brought up our therapeutic endoscopy department along with Dr. Broso and Dr. Raza. Uh, in our section. And uh, Dr. Dacha is coming from Emory University in Atlanta, and he has interests in therapeutic endoscopies and has really um, improved our uh, capabilities with ERCPs, EUS, uh, stenting, um, interest in G-poems and poem procedure, along with artificial intelligence as well. So um, he's going to be talking next to uh, a really broad but really important topic about acute GI bleeding and updates and how we can stop it. So let's um, welcome Dr. Dacha. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Quickly, for... Okay, let me get this mask. I think I've got used to that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Quigley, for providing me the opportunity to talk about this one. So when Dr. Quigley asked me to talk about this, uh, so, you know, GI bleeding is such a broad topic, and so we decided, you know, we'll just do something, uh, what to do when the standard things fail to stop the bleeding. Okay, I have no disclosures. And as we all know, with the widespread use of endoscopy, the need for surgery has pretty much decreased significantly. And I'm sure most of our surgeons can tell us that, you know, the need for surgery has been pretty much rare these days for GI bleedings. And despite the continued improvement in traditional therapies, there is as much as 10 to 24 percent of the patients where primary therapies fail to stop the bleeding or there is prevention of re-bleeding. And the most common predictors being posterior duodenal wall ulcers, large size ulcers, most ulcers along the less curvature, actively bleeding lesions during endoscopy. If there's a big blood vessel, then there's a fairly good chance that we cannot stop the bleeding or it will re-bleed immediately after we treat it. And so for the past decade, there has been much of interest in developing new techniques and studying different endoscopic methods to effectively stop these hard to stop GI bleeds. And the tools and techniques to achieve hemostasis was just limited to the epinephrine, endoscopic plaques or thermal probes, APC, for quite a while or probably for decades now. But more recently, there is several novel approaches that have developed, which include upgrading current techniques with use of over-the-scope clips or using endoscopic ultrasound-guided treatment of varices or to the development of new technologies like hemostatic powders and repurposing currently used tools like example using of Doppler probes to assess for efficacy of treating a blood vessel. So just put together, so we can say like injection techniques, like EUS guided angiotherapies have really taken off, especially for gastric varices, and thermal therapies, coagulation grasp per use, radiofrequency ablation, cryotherapy, and laser. Of course, we don't do laser as much. Mechanical therapies, including over the scope clips, endoscopic suturing, and there is some experimental methods like flexible linear staplers, and topical therapies like hemospray, Pretty much all of them are hemostatic powders, but the one that's only FDA approved and that we use is hemospray from Cook. So let's start with the mechanical therapies. The most common thing, one that we use is over-the-scope clips. As we all know, there are two types of over-the-scope clips. One is uh, from over-the-scope, OTSC, and the other is a bear claw. And it's FDA approved for multiple indications right now. Initially, it was developed for fistula closure and closure of large defects, but over the time, we have started to use these for difficult to control GI bleeds. Due to its unique design and electrical properties, once you deploy the clip, it just kind of clips like a claw. And it tends to exert constant circumferential pressure that's enough to stop bleeding from large blood vessels and large defects. 
and there's only one prospective randomized trial comparing OTSC with standard treatments. And again, the quality of evidence is low from that study to stop uh, as a first-line treatment for upper GI bleeds. And if you go by the various societal guidelines right now, ESGE suggests that in patients with persistent bleeding refractory to standard hemostatic uh, modalities, the use of hemospray or OTSC clips should be considered. And if you go with the AGA expert review, they even they do suggest the same thing. If it should be considered in select patients with non variceal upper GI bleedings in whom conventional electrosurgical coagulation and hemostatic clips are unsuccessful or predicted to be ineffective. And ACG currently does not recommend it as a first-line therapy, mainly due to low quality of evidence. So this is from the various societies. And ASG technical paper says it can be used, but there is no official word on it yet. And let me give you a few your video on this one. So this was a bleeding blood vessel that we had along the lesser curvature that would not stop its standard technique. So we used an old scope clip for this one, and then you see there's no bleeding at all after placing a OTSC clip. And patient did well and no re-bleeding re after the old scope clip placement. And the clip is still there, we haven't removed it yet, but now we have new devices called Obesco Remove, which can be used to remove these clips. Earlier we didn't have any means of removing them. We used to use APC or something to try to break it, but it's super easy to take these clips out now. So not a problem. And the pros and cons of this, it's easy to use. No specific endoscopic skills are required because it's similar to placing endoscopic bands and it's effective for ulcers larger than two centimeters or bleeding vessels greater than two millimeters. And the cons, it's uh, difficult to close hard chronic fibrotic ulcers and it's actually time consuming because you have to come out, deploy the clip like a banding thing. So you will lose a couple of minutes in there. So in vessels that are bleeding aggressively, I mean, not a real cons, but something to think about. The next endoscopic suturing. Endoscopic suturing is promising, especially for large fibrotic ulcers that are bleeding. Um, and there's some, it was mainly limited to case reports and case series, but now there's one, there's only one large case series of 10 patients that was published from Hopkins group, where they've shown that the mean suturing time was around 13 to 15 minutes. And at least the early data was that at least from all those patients, the bleeding did stop. And there is, the only issue with this is it's time consuming and special expertise is required to do endoscopic suturing. And from my experience, I can tell you that any of these ulcers bleeding in the fundus or high in the cardia will be very difficult to use an uh, endoscopic suturing device. Uh, but there's a new XTAC device that is out from uh, Apollo right now, which might actually change this. It's much easier to use. It's through the scope rather than over the scope. So that might actually change things there. And the pros again, it's technically more feasible for large, deep, and fibrotic ulcers. But again, you need to have special skills for it and you need to use a double channel scope for that. And endoscopic band ligation, this is kind of reinventing the same tool that we used for all along. We've been using it for esophageal viruses or band ligations, but more, more recently we've been using it for treating nodular give. Traditionally we're using uh, APC for give, but we know that it doesn't work all the time. And studies have shown that band ligation is superior to APC and endoscopic thermal therapies for one, reducing the treatment sessions, two, control of bleeding, three, decreased need for retransfusion. And it's pretty simple to use. And I can show you a video of one patient that I did uh, recently. So here we can see this nodular cave. You can just place bands on them. And then once you place a band, you release the suction and then look for another actively bleeding spot. And it's actually easy to spot it with, uh, so they find it and then just suction it into the band and then deploy it. And then again, you can see carefully and then you see another bleeding point and then just suction that into it until it rips out and deploy it. Works really well. I haven't done as many, like I think I've done on three patients, but they've done really well because we've been also been using RFA for these patients. 
So, but sometimes RFA is difficult. We'll get into it later, but I think this really works great for nodular gave especially. And coming to thermal therapies, now hemostatic forceps, this is pretty much uh, what uh, is being used in laparoscopic world or surgical world forever, but now we have this as a tool in endoscopic hemostasis. Uh, there are multiple coagrasper, then there's one from Fuginon, but what we usually use is coagrasper. It's a hemostatic forceps and it's in a combination of thermal and mechanical therapies that delivers targeted monopolar therapy for coagulation at precise site of bleeding. And coagraspers has several advantages over traditional uh, thermal probes. And due to its unique properties, it is very safe and the therapy is specifically delivered within the hemostatic forceps and the depth of, uh, in depth of uh, coagulation is just limited to the blood vessel and not super deep. So it's pretty safe to use. And there is one com recent randomized trial that compared the efficacy of hemostatic forceps versus hemosclip as a first-line therapy for non variceal upper GI bleeding. And the study reported an initial success of 98% success with the coag grasper group as opposed to 80% for the hemoclip group. And re-bleeding rates were lower in coag grasper group and adverse events were not pretty much uh, similar in both the groups. Uh, however, the cost of a coag grasper is around $500 to $600 as opposed to if you use only one or two clips, it might be less. But if you're using multiple clips, for a blood vessel, I think this will also be economically be feasible and it's not really hard to use. I use specifically use it mainly for my EMR and POEM cases and it really works in handy. And I can show you one good care case in a little bit and then we'll kind of come back. This was one large polyp I was trying to remove on cecum and then landed in a huge bleeding. And then I was able to localize the blood vessel. Here I'm using just the mechanical force to see if it will stop the bleeding, but it didn't stop the bleeding. As you see, I was just trying to let it go and you can see the bleeding coming in there. Then what you do is you hold it, pull it up towards you and just boom, one, one click and then top, the bleeding stops completely. Uh, let me see. Can I go back one slide, please? Okay, yeah. So these are the pros and cons of using the quiet grasper. One, it's safest and most efficacious hemostatic modalities. Due to large surface area of the clip, there are three sizes of hemostatic forceps that you get one for upper and two for lowers. And it provides mechanical tamponade of the surrounding tissue as well. The risk of perforation is basically nil because you provide therapy only between the jaws of the coag grasper. And uh, sometimes, you know, if there's a lot of blood and there's a lot of water, it's hard to deliver the amount of uh, hemostasis with the coagulation that you can deliver. But uh, but most of the time you can deliver it. And it's pricey, as we talked about, and you need uh, uh, the modern electrosurgical generators that can give you soft coagulation more to provide this current. So that will be the, the, the drawback of uh, having a hemostatic forceps. And then we saw this, and then radio frequency ablation, as we all know, we've been using it for battered esophagus for a while. And now more recently, we've been using off-the-label use for GAVE, radiation proctitis. And more recently, uh, uh, Medtronic has uh, introduced a small bowel radio frequency ablation probe that can be used for AVMs in the small intestine. And there are very limited studies for using RFA for GAVE and radiation proctitis. There's no long-term data. Most of them are case series. At least the available evidence suggests that RFA is comparable, tolerability is similar to APC. It works really well. But there are some issues using it, especially for GAVE. Uh, one exact opposition to the gastric mucosa is hard. You need to use a 350 probe that is not through the scope, it's over the guide wire, so it's hard to get a good opposition. But we can use through the scope or the over the scope RFA pros, but it doesn't really work as well. Uh, and for radiation proctitis, it works really well compared to the APC. At least I've used it a few times, it worked well, but doesn't work always. And what we really need is a head to head comparison of formalin application versus RFA versus APC, which again is hard to do because we don't have as many patients with that. And the pros of it is, you know, it's feasible and safe. 
It's able to deliver high energy coaptation coagulation to the superficial mucosa, including the blood vessels. And again, if you have very good opposition, it will actually come or coagulate the submucosal blood vessels. Now, topical treatment. This is the new kid on the block. Again, I shouldn't say new kid on the block. It's a new kid on the block for clinical practice, but this has been there for more than eight to 10 years. Apparently, FDA could not determine if it's a medicine or it's a device. That's one of the reasons why it never came to market for more than eight years, although it was there with FDA for those many years. And the way it works is it's an inorganic powder. Once you spray on a surface, it tends to co concentrate all the coagulation factors at one place and forms a mechanical barrier. And it provides instant hemostasis, and I can tell you it has really saved us in multiple situations. I cannot tell you. I'd like to show you some of the videos and pictures. And it is not absorbed. It is, that's the reason why the, uh, the manufacturer says it is not supposed to be used when it, there's a concern for perforation. And two, you cannot use it for cyst gastrostomy bleedings because it is non-absorbable and has to go through the GI tract. So you cannot use in case of suspected perforation or with cyst gastrostomy bleedings. And it has also been evaluated as a monotherapy and a first-line therapy for GI bleedings. And at least the early data is uh, very encouraging. But again, what comes in the picture is the price. But there is a new Medicare code where you can use this as a separate device. So you can get reimbursed for that as well. So one of the main indications for me is refractory GI bleeding or malignant bleedings or sometimes uh, I've used it once for a post ampelectomy bleeding and it has worked really well. And we can't use it for poems, obviously, because it's, uh, it's extra luminal. And uh, we await more studies to see how well this works. And this endoclot is another uh, similar thing. It's an absorbable polysaccharide powder that has been proposed as a hemostatic agent. Again, this is a very small study. It's not FDA approved yet. And actually, this is actually Dr. Rosenberg's patient. I'm sorry, uh, I have the patient's name there. I can't use it there. But anyway, this was a patient who had a bleeding after a right, colon right hemicolectomy. He had significant bleeding from the anastomotic site. And day one after his surgery, CTA couldn't control the bleeding. So we went in overnight and sprayed hemospray. Patient didn't bleed after that. And this was another patient who was having significant bleeding. Uh, along his posterior wall of the body of the stomach wouldn't stop his standard therapies. This was his third endoscopy. So we used the hemospray and instant hemostasis. And EUS guided angiotherapies, again, uh, we use it very rarely for just luminal GI bleedings, but there are Doppler probes available which can tell you if there is a blood vessel there and that's actively bleeding, and this is through the scope probe. So you can inject, coagulate, or cauterize whatever you do, and then you can place a probe on that blood vessel to see if there's any still active flow going on to determine if you defer the therapies or your therapy is good enough. And again, the uh, cost of these probes is very high. They break very easily. You need special expertise to use these probes. Not really much, but at least you need to be able to appreciate because the vessels go perpendicular to your probe. So you need to be looking at it carefully. And the other thing that we do is EGUS guided angiotherapies is mostly for fundic gastric varices. Uh, you need to really respect these fundic gastric varices. These are very high flow pressure systems and you need to know which varix that you need to treat. We usually tend to treat if, you, if we can get one coil and one cc of, uh, of the, <coughs> I'm sorry, <coughs> one cc of glue into this. Yes, that's the ideal case scenario, but sometimes you get sent these big uh, varices that are like four centimeters. You need like good three, four coils three, four cc's of uh, glue, then those are the cases where you need to have a good discussion about trying to do BRTO first before you do use guided therapies. Uh, it's not difficult, but again, this was a patient who had a bleeding uh, varix because I can see that also there, blood and stopped, and we did an EUS guided. This was a 1.5 centimeter varix, so we placed just one coil was enough, and. Uh, 
and just one cc of uh, glue and then there was no Doppler flow after as you can see there's no Doppler flow after we did the coils uh, did patient did well no adverse events after this and again you can see a coil did come out through it but there was still no bleeding because that was mainly from the glue the reason why we do a coil and then a glue is coil acts as a scaffolding for the glue because there are cases of uh, glue embolizing into the systemic circulation causing strokes PEs ischemic events so it's, it, it can do really bad uh, complications if you don't use with the coils so coil provides a scaffolding that the glue will not embolize systemically so that was some quick update of what's new in GI bleeding so GI bleeding continues to be a persistent challenge in some cases uh, despite advances in both pharmacological and endoscopic techniques and I uh, and I don't think I mentioned about COVID bleedings I can tell you that despite all aggressive endoscopic measures these patients tend to still bleed through through the therapies and I suspect it's due to the anticoagulation that they have or there's something more in their coagulation mechanism with COVID that I don't think we know at this point, but I can tell you, I, it was a nightmare in some patients to control GI bleedings. One, they need anticoagulation, two, they bleed through your therapies. So it's, it's a nightmare and a challenge in COVID patients. And there are several new modalities coming up which are clearly showing promise as first-line therapies. And again, we need more data purely because of the costs associated with those to justify them as first-line therapies. And due to numerous GI bleeding etiologies, the indications, efficacy, and safety of emerging endoscopic technique, it just continues to be defined. Thank you. Now, let me have the pleasure of introducing our next uh, faculty. It's Dr. Shisar. And she was one of her uh, faculties here in GI, and she's our uh, uh, faculty for the medicine residents as well. And uh, let me take the pleasure of introducing Dr. Shisar. She'll be talking about the bowel preps. Dr. Shisar, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here today. Um, to discuss with you preparing the colon. Can we make it easier but just as effective for our patients? I have a few disclosures. My husband owns some stock in US Anesthesia Partners. I'm not aware that they have any connection with bowel prep, fortunately. I'm including off-label use of PEG or polyethylene glycol without electrolytes and bisacodyl because it's so commonly used in clinical practice that it seemed remiss to leave it out of this talk. I also have a couple of tables that have complete names, including branded names of bowel preparations, mostly for clarity so people can get the most out of this lecture, because otherwise the names are ingredient lists and volumes. So colonoscopy preparation is a bit of a balance. The base or the fundamental is it has to be safe. And along those lines, I want to make sure people know that I'm primarily talking about PrEP in an outpatient setting with relatively healthy patients, your ASA 1 and 2. So please don't generalize this to an inpatient setting or your sicker patients who may be more susceptible to electrolyte disturbances. Next comes efficacy. Efficacy impacts the safety of the procedure, the adenoma detection rate, and the cost because of repeat procedures and decreased intervals for, for coming back for screening or surveillance based on poor prep. And last but not least is what we're going to be talking about today, the tolerability or ease. And even though it may be less important than efficacy and, of course, safety, it's very important to our patients and it impacts their willingness to return for procedures, as well as poor tolerability impacts the efficacy. If they're not able to drink the PrEP and do the PrEP, it's not going to work very well for them. So in order to talk about what makes PrEP easier, we need to focus on what makes it difficult in the first place. And number one would be the oral cathartic, 
what they have to drink, which it could include the volume of the cathartic itself, additional fluid requirements, could be the taste or difficulty ingesting, symptoms caused by the cathartic. Next would be dietary modification and fasting, loss of sleep, and confusion or uncertainty regarding the process. So this is sort of the outline for the talk, and we'll go through these points. We have a little bit of a PR problem. No one seems to think our preps are delicious and look forward to taking them. The good news is that we have a number of options that we can offer patients. They vary by volume, taste, and tolerability. So the first thing that I want to mention is we need to talk to our patients. We need to find out if they've had a PrEP before and what was their experience. Was there something good or bad about it? Would they be willing or unwilling to repeat that? Find out their preferences for volume, liquids versus tablets, flavors, and if they're even comfortable mixing the PrEP themselves at their house. Before I sell a patient on this is the best PrEP for you, I try to, if available, look at insurance information, find out if it's going to be feasible for them to get it with their formulary and with cost, or if we happen to have some on hand. And you may ask, well, what about open access? I just met this patient today, and they're already prepped. Well, there is some process that goes into open access. Someone talks to that patient beforehand. And it may be that you can have that person ask just a few pointed questions to decide which prep will be best for them. So this is my table that has just about every PrEP name um, that we have available to us here. All the FDA approved PrEPs, and um, I also included the off-label PEG. So you'll see this, we'll go through this chart. At the very top, you have our old tried and true four liter polyethylene glycol with electrolytes, and that includes sodium sulfate. The next generation tried to improve taste by taking out the sodium sulfate, so you have sulfate free lavage system, which is also four liters and has multiple flavor options. Next, just to be very thorough, include everything on my table, there's one that's two liters and has bisacodyl. And then there's another option here that we know it still has sulfate, but now has the addition of sodium ascorbate and ascorbic acid. And this prep is almost two liters with an additional one liter required to drink it, and its flavor is lemon. So if someone comes in, oh, I took it, and it was about yay big, and it was two bottles, and it was lemon, well, you know what that was, and you can either give it to them or not give it to them based on what their previous experience was. Next is our lowest volume PEG solution, which also contains sodium sulfate and the ascorbic acid and sodium ascorbate. It's one liter almost of prep liquid combined with another liter of clear liquids for a total of about two liters and has mango and fruit punch. And then we have our off-label PEG. And this one, it's not from FDA prescribing information, obviously, because it's not an FDA-approved PEG so it, or PrEP. So I just took what was the most common that I could find as far as pres of, um, recommended dosage which is almost two liters that they mix with their favorite, or maybe their not favorite, sports drink flavor. That's our PEG options. After that, we have sodium picosulfate, um, which is the smallest prep volume, which is 320 mLs. It's notable they need to drink another, almost two liters, in order to complete the prep, and has a cranberry flavor. And then we get to our oral sulfate options, of which um, the liquid, I'm not sure how long it's going to be around, but it is one liter almost. And then you need to drink almost another two liters to complete the prep and has its own uh, kind of sweet syrup flavor. The new one on the market um, is the tablet form of the oral sulfate. So obviously there's no liquid volume to drink, but it's very important to talk to the patient about the other requirement, which is almost three liters of water. It is specified water, not clear liquids, so they have to be willing to do that. To be thorough, I included our old sodium phosphate, which now has a black box warning due to the nephrotoxicity and is not recommended necessarily as a first line agent. So a note on some of the tolerability of the different preps. 
Obviously, they removed the sulfate for a reason, so sulfate-free PEG might have better taste or tolerability. The oral sulfate tablets, when compared to a two-liter PEG solution with the sorbic acid, did have a higher incidence of nausea and vomiting, so that might be something you want to talk to your patients about if they're interested in the tablet form. But it also showed better responses on a preference questionnaire as far as being more easy or very easy to consume, an overall excellent or good experience, better um, experience than previous prep, and if they would request it again. Also, sodium picosulfate versus PEG in a meta-analysis and evidence-based review did show some increased patient tolerability and compliance. It's worth noting that there are not um, a lot of the same studies for the off-label PEG without electrolytes mixed with sport drink. In a meta-analysis from 2014, it didn't find any difference in symptoms as far as associated with this compared to PEG, the four liter. Um, but there was a much better willingness to repeat the PrEP, although there's questions about the efficacy of the PrEP, if it's inferior or not. There are other ways to get clean. There's an irrigation system that can be used prior to colonoscopy on the same day. It may include a clear liquid diet or gentle laxatives and typically it takes less than an hour, but is meant to be in lieu of a formal bowel prep orally. So next we get to dietary modification or fasting. There's significant interest in a low residue diet prior to colonoscopy. And this meta-analysis that came out last year, they included 17 articles and three abstracts, and they found that a low residue diet prior, the day prior to colonoscopy was not inferior to a clear liquid diet as far as prep. That was their primary outcome. And so I was wondering, well, what are these low residue diets that were included in this trial? And I don't expect you to read this whole table, but the underlying, um, idea that there were multiple different preps types that were used, some were split dose, some were the day before, but they all included at least one meal that was a low residue diet. Two of them involved a normal breakfast and low residue lunch and dinner, 11 had all day low residue diet, four had a low residue breakfast and lunch plus minus snack, and four had a low residue breakfast and then clear liquids after that. Some of them did include a pre-packaged low-residue meal, so they were given exactly what they were supposed to, to eat. And it was interesting that secondary outcomes, although more data is needed, that found that it might actually improve some of the symptoms to have a low-residue diet rather than just clear liquids, which included nausea, vomiting, hunger, and headache, as well as a willingness to repeat and ease of completion. So I went back to the FDA prescribing information for all of our preps, and it's universal that once you started your prep, you should just be on clear liquids, if anything, and nothing two hours prior to your procedure time. But if you look at the column on the right, the recommended diet, most of the preps on their prescribing instructions actually allow for a light breakfast. The um, notable exception would be the sodium picosulfate, and I thought it was interesting in going through this prep that I actually found a clinical trial in recruitment right now that is looking at that sodium picosulfate with a low residue diet. So hopefully we'll have some data on that soon. Next is loss of sleep. Why would you lose sleep when you're preparing for colonoscopy? Well, it could be that you're in the bathroom. It could be side effects of the medication, just uncomfortable or inconvenient timing of the second dose, particularly if you're using a split dose and you have an early procedure time. Now, I don't want to say anything bad about the split dose because this is what we really don't want, right? We're trying not to impact efficacy. There's a thick mucus and intestinal secretions and it represents too much time between the prep and the procedure itself, which is improved by split dose or the same day. So, Split dose is important. It can, um, it's, gives a superior cleanse, especially um, compared to the day before, really for any product. 
It impacts willingness to repeat. People are more likely to repeat a split dose. So what are the other ways that we can make this better? Well, sometimes it helps just to explain the reason to the patient. They may not understand why you ask them to get up at 4 in the morning and drink their second half of their prep. It can also alter the timing of the procedure, which then alters the timing of the prep. You can get them a later procedure time. Say, well, when do you want to get up to take your second half of your prep? And we'll schedule you about four to six hours after that. Or they can do an afternoon procedure with a same day prep. And a meta-analysis from 2018, they showed that the same day prep had no significant difference as far as bowel preps versus an overnight split dose. And if the bisacodal was added to that same day prep, it actually improved um, prep efficacy. And people got better sleep when they took all of their prep on the same day in the morning. So next we'll go into confusion or uncertainty regarding the process. It's all about communication. The goal, of course, is to decrease uncertainty and therefore increase compliance. We need to give them oral instructions, actually explain the prep to them and let them ask questions. There are multiple opportunities to do that. The endoscopist themselves, the office, the office staff, the time they're scheduling, and even the procedure location sometimes talks to the patient beforehand. And they need to be able to explain the prep instructions in a consistent way. And it's also been shown that if you're giving prep instructions, and it's within two weeks of the procedure that the patients tend to do better with the prep. Further than that, I think they kind of forget about it. It's also important to provide them a reference, some written, some electronic instructions. They should be clear, chronologic, and the prep instructions should match the prep they actually get um, from the pharmacy. So if there's a substitution that happens with the prep, we also need to be sure to follow that up with new instructions. Patients need to know who to call with questions in real time. And there's some additional resources that you could recommend to your patients, such as your practice website, other affiliated organizations, government-sponsored websites are out there too that focus on public health and helping people to get through their colonoscopy. And then of course there's commercial prep websites that might have the specific instructions for their prep, dosing planners, or even hotlines. So um, we can also use technology. We now text um, our patients multiple reminders regarding clinic visits and things like that. You can text reminders about prep. You can send patient port portal messages. And there's even smartphone applications that are available that can do these things like send reminders, give their instructions, and assist with the timing of their prep. These smartphone applications, some of them have been associated with better bowel preps and patient satisfaction or experience. And they're available both purchased and free. So in summary, you've all heard of personalized medicine. Well, I'm talking here about a personalized prep where you look, of course, at the safety of the prep given the person's medical history. Figure out uh, what their most likely tolerated and available prep will be help them to decide the best procedure time for them. Use, I would think, a split dose or a same day prep because of better satisfaction and better results. And tailor their diet and their fasting to the prep that's being used as well as their procedure time. And of course, communication and support. And if you're lucky, at the end of the day, you'll get the glowing praise of, well, that wasn't so bad. So next we're gonna uh, move on to a more surgical topic and I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Patrick Reardon. He is our chief um, of the section of minimally invasive surgery and foregut surgery in the Department of Surgery. And he's our fellowship director for um, advanced minimally invasive surgery as well and kind of a um, uh, early uh, innovator in this field. And he's um, had the distinct uh, pleasure of really starting a lot of the uh, training programs here. And he's going to be talking to us about um, innovation in MALS. Thank you. Thank you.
Is this for advancing the slide? Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. I have no disclosures. Um, first question to ask if you're going to talk about uh, median arcuate ligament syndrome is what is a median arcuate ligament? The median arcuate ligament is a fibrous band which connects both the left and the right core of the diaphragm. Most of us remember that your esophageal hiatus is wrapped by your curl muscles, but they then cross over each other and attach to the spine to create a, an aortic um, hiatus. And it is the aortic hiatus that is connected by um, the uh, median arcuate ligament. And this is a nice illustration from Gray's Anatomy. Uh, the reason I like it is not many people remember to show you that the um, curl fibers, when they get to the spine level, um, rapidly lose all their muscular fibers and become a tendon. They're a, a narrow, uh, thick tendon. And what it demonstrates is that that tendinous characteristic passes along the cranial and medial aspects of the fibers to form the median arcuate ligament. And recently I was doing one of these and I had sort of an aha moment because um, most of the time I had tended to think of this as a uh, more like a tendon. Um, but this illustration demonstrates very well that on the cranial surface, the, the um, fibers of the arcuate ligament continue on the cranial surface of the muscle. And then this is a really nice illustration because what it shows is that it's not a short, thick, stumpy um, ligament. It's a broad, flat ligament. It's thicker at its most cranial end where it makes the turn up onto the cranial portions of the aortic hiatus, but it'll travel all the way down to the takeoff of the left gastric. You see muscle anterior to it, but just beneath the muscle is a broad, flat ligament. So if that's the ligament, how does it cause disease? This is a really nice uh, illustration I stole from our neighbors here in the medical center, the UT Physician Organization. And it's nice because it does demonstrate the um, diaphragm, its location, and the fact that the um, fibers would normally create not just an esophageal hiatus, but an aortic hiatus, and then the fibers go down and attach onto the spine. Uh, nobody told the artist that, in fact, it doesn't stay muscle all the way to the bitter end, though. And this is a demonstration of how that might cause disease. Normally, your celiac trunk should arise below uh, your aortic hiatus and therefore below the median arcuate ligament. But there are some people in which one of those two structures is misplaced. The artery arises variably on the aorta and the ligament uh, arises variably over the aorta. And so if you get the origin of your celiac trunk underneath that ligament, then it can compress it and cause mouths. So what is the syndrome? First described by uh, Harjala in 1963, and he described a syndrome of postprandial abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting, and primarily bloating, but also decreased appetite. Most people will tell you that it's not so much their appetite's gone, but if you get tortured every time you eat, you will back off on eating. First case here is published just two years later by Dunbar, and in Europe, um, they'll call this Dunbar syndrome. Uh, in the U.S., it's called MALS. Um, there's MALS PALS, a um, group of patients that have this, and you can find all their stuff on every single social media that exists. They have a, a list of all the people who diagnose and treat it across the country. So if you have a low-riding aortic hiatus or a high-riding origin of your celiac trunk, then you have a potential to have the syndrome. And it involves actual um, compression of the proximal trunk. And the proposed mechanisms include uh, you eat a meal, there's an increased demand for blood flow in the proximal GI tract, and given that the median arcuate ligament is compressing the uh, base of the celiac axis, there's um, relative foregut ischemia. The problem with that is that, um, as most of you know, the collateralization of the stomach, that's probably the most vascular organ in the abdomen, and so it's, it's very unlikely that this is simply due to a vascular ischemia alone. Therefore, there are neurogenic causes which are also postulated. Primarily, direct compression of the celiac plexus. So um, if you're 
a surgeon you've ever come across the, the celiac artery and its branches, uh, they look twice as big as the actual vessels contained within because of the amount of nerve tissue encircling them. Most of what we see is celiac plexus and lymphatics. Uh, overstimulation of the sympathetic nerves, which are contained in there, may cause downstream vasoconstriction and therefore, in theory, might exacerbate the relative ischemia. And your uh, celiac plexus is the pathway of the efferent pain fibers, and so chronic irritation of these might lead to chronic pain. And when I think of this, it's, to me, it's like having a GI reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Certainly, we've treated reflex sympathetic dystrophy in the extremities, and so the proposal is this is nothing more or nothing less, and we know that's the pathway. Chronic pancreatitis, you can block the celiac plexus and improve people's symptoms. Incidence, two per 100,000 people. If you do autopsy studies, 34% of the autopsies have some compression of the proximal celiac trunk by the median arcuate ligament. That would be 0.4% of the population. This is not a, a common disorder. And you have 10 to 24% of the population who have a celiac origin, which is above the ligament. You know this on CT scan because it's compressed, uh, but not that many people have symptoms. Uh, primarily, the symptoms are uh, postprandial epigastric pain. That's the most classic, followed by weight loss, and nausea and vomiting. And then there's a laundry list of other symptoms which people might get. Symptoms start to occur when radiographic evidence of 50 to 75 percent stenosis is visualized. Between 75 and 95 percent stenosis, you begin to have measurable severe symptoms. And in the worst cases, um, we get readings of 90 to 99 percent. That's the, the highest category they'll call, and that's what most people that have the most severe symptoms have. There are, of course, minimal physical findings in this. Um, I did, in 2020, find a patient who I operated who had a uh, quite audible epigastric brewery. Um, this is, as every GI person in this room knows, a diagnosis of exclusion. These people are uh, at the end of the road, um, and they're generally not very happy because it's been a long um, trip involving lots of tests to get usually to a knowledgeable GI doctor who makes the diagnosis and sends them to see the surgeon. It's rarely diagnosed promptly. Probably the first thing that most people think of is a, a Doppler. Um, and what you're looking for is peak flow velocity is more than 350 centimeters per second. If you see this, the sensitivity rate is 83% and the specificity is 100%. Angiography is quite good, but it's far more invasive. If you get angiography or any uh, evaluation of the uh, arterial tract, we do like to see post-thenotic dilatation, which is a good sign that there is a physiologic diminution of flow. CT scan is probably the most common way that uh, it rises on most people's radar, and that's because if you have abdominal pain in the U.S., particularly if you go to any emergency room, ours included, you will get a CAT scan of your abdomen. The problem is if they don't give dye, arterial dye, it's hard to pick up. And we prefer dynamic MRI of the abdomen because it is during the expiratory phase of breathing that the diaphragm ascends, the liver follows it, and it drags the celiac axis and trunk cranially, and the dense ligament then causes a severe crimping or the fold that then, that is the, the diameter they read for the diagnosis. And this is um, from um, one of my patients, and this is the still films from the dynamic MRA. Um, they're very nice, though, if you want to understand the physiology of this, because they take them through the full respiratory cycle, and you can watch the uh, origin of the celiac trunk while they breathe in and breathe out. But if you blow this up, uh, you can really see that um, this, is, this was read as 90 to 99 percent, and there's a tiny, tiny thread, if you can look really closely, that you still see. But during full expiration, you can see that almost all blood flow ceases through the celiac trunk. The problem is that um, 30 to 50% of the ones that are uh, clinically narrowed 
are in patients who are asymptomatic. And 20% of healthy patients have demonstrable compression of their proximal celiac trunk. This is primarily a disease of young people. The mean age is about 32 years, and primarily it occurs in women. I have several uh, males, and I have several people whose uh, weight, uh, their BMI went above 30, which not normally would be considered compatible with this disease. But as you know, we have people with achalasia whose BMI is really high. Um, so some people will eat at all costs. And I'm not going to spend much time on this, but this is a really nice uh, pathway that is a pretty good uh, demonstration of what the average patient will go through. Lots of people, lots of tests, um, and then finally they get to somebody who understands what the disease is and uh, puts them on the right path. And um, I'm surprised at the number of people who have come into my practice who on social media is how they uh, found out where to go. This is all available widely now for the general public. The treatment, um, if you're going to operate, I treat um, both the theoretical mechanisms. So uh, I excise the entire celiac plexus off the proximal celiac trunk. And then I also divide the median arcuate ligament. And um, too short to show a real video, but this is a nice demonstration of what happens. Um, to do it properly, most people would identify the left gastric artery trace it on to the proximal celiac trunk, and then follow that down until you uh, see the median arcuate ligament. It is not a white ligament to structure. It's actually completely covered by muscle. But once you get to it, it it's really strapped down tightly. You can um, put an instrument across it, and it plunks. Um, so it's an easily demonstrable structure. And every illustration I've seen, um, none of them mention that you need to take off the plexus. It's not in any of these pictures. And I discovered on the first one I did that, in fact, um, anomalous origins of uh, phrenic arteries are very common arising from the anterior and lateral trunk. I did this by uh, resecting one, chopped it in two. Luckily, I left a stump and oversewed it. But all the pictures are way oversimplified. This is technically um, a fairly tour de force operation to successfully remove the plexus and not get into anything. Can be done open and laparoscopically. The first report was by Michel Gagné's group in 2000, so this has been done for two decades. The conversion rates are reported as low as 4.2% and as high as 27%. No deaths in any of the big series. And the average stay is 3.8 days. And most of these people simply can go home the following morning, but not all of them have complete release of their GI symptoms immediately. And so some of the stays can be longer. An average length of stay of four days is pretty long. Uh, it, like anything that's done minimally invasively, there are series that are done robotically. It doesn't change the outcome. It, in, it just increases the cost. You can do uh, angioplasty with or without stenting. Um, all of my first patients actually came from the um, cardiovascular department of surgery here. Um, and I have a very nice video of a patient whom they uh, did a PTA and a stent. And the patient said their symptoms were relieved, but on follow-up studies, the stent was flexing every bit as much as the artery, uh, which caused great consternation amongst them. And if you read the literature, that's one of the main reasons people don't like to do that. If you leave the ligament, the stent will begin to flex. And of course, if you fracture the stent, it won't be good. And so I have a wonderful video. You can see the stent. It embeds them in the artery. And you can see the chicken wire pattern as I release the ligament. Primary revascularization, the only time that gets done now is when there's a proximal injury to the vessels. Um, number one, it completely ignores the neurogenic theory. And number two, this is an open operation, um, and it's a big operation. And in fact, the site I stole the really nice illustrations from next door, all their surgical illustrations are laparotomies. Um, so this is a, a series of um, manuscripts or papers and their outcomes. When my patients come to the office, I don't want to set their expectations too high. I tell them there's a 70 to 80 percent cure rate. And that means that um, following the surgery within the next month, uh, there's almost complete resolution of symptoms. And the higher the degree of stenosis, the people that are in the 90 to 99 percent category, the better our outcomes are. And there are some people who suggest that if you're in the group that has persistent post-operative pain, that at that point you might consider an angiogram. If you do angiograms, 
uh, maybe 30 percent of people still have persistent narrowing even though they may say their symptoms are gone and at that point you can try stenting without the fear that you're going to break your stent and that's really all i have thank you very much I'm just waiting for our speakers to come sit on the panel, take any questions you guys may have at this time. Okay, great, we got some. Well, I'll start with the first one for you, Dr. Reardon. Um, what are your minimal criteria for considering MALS as the cause of the patient's symptoms? I think you turn it on. Maybe. Can you guys hear? They're not on, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a light on, let me do on. Uh, I would like to see that they have the uh, top, the classic three symptoms. Um, I really prefer if they are uh, underweight and not overweight. Um, and then if they have 75% um, or greater stenosis of uh, the proximal celiac trunk on expiratory phase with the um, MRI, the dynamic MRA, then I'm willing to consider them. The vast majority of people I see come from our system and our GI doctors have seen them and uh, they don't send somebody who's not likely to have the disease. They've had a pretty good screening. And then the next question is for Dr. Schieser. What is your preferred bowel prep and why? So for patients that I see in the office, I will usually try to tailor it very um, particularly to them and far as ask them all their preferences and what they want. So I would say the patients I see in the office get a wide variety of options, including the off-label PEG if that's what they're interested in. Um, but for my open access, I do tend to use more of the oral sulfate as well as the sodium picosulfate because of tolerability. And then with the oral sulfate, even if they do have nausea, it's typically mild and usually the prep is very good. And then um, another follow-up question, do you have strategy for a prep where despite compliance, the, the prep is inadequate? So I would love to say that I have any of the devices right now that can be used to kind of rescue a bowel prep. There's one device that we do have at the hospital that we're sort of piloting, which is an over-the-scope um, over irrigation and suction system, which can rescue a prep and get it to an adequate state. There's also a through the scope option that just provides like a spray nozzle lavage, which can help um, that I don't have available to me yet. Otherwise, if it's, you know, if it's inadequate, it's inadequate. I do my best to try to salvage the prep with whatever I have available for an outpatient setting, just spending a whole lot of time cleaning, if you can do that. Um, but otherwise, there are those other systems and some that might be coming down the pipeline. I think the balance is um, time versus spending the time in the colon. So, right. um, Next question, going to Dr. Dacha. Um, do you routinely use therapeutic scopes for your upper GI bleeds? Uh, yes, so you have a single channel and double channel therapeutic scopes and we have single channel therapeutic scopes and the diameter of the scope is one millimeter more than the gastroscope. So that's our routine practice. We use a single channel therapeutic scope for all upper GI bleeds. And coming back to you, Dr. Sheezer, popular topics. What is the recommendation for fluids in heart failure and end-stage renal patients uh, with low volume preparation? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it like the fluids the patient's taking, like clear liquid, or just what bowel prep you use? Because I still will use the four liter standard PEG prep for patients who are at high risk for electrolyte abnormalities, your end-stage renal patients or CHF patients. I think it's the safest. I think you have to remember they're isoosmotic as well to keep yes. in mind. Yeah, and one thing, one thing that's of note is the lowest volume PEG on the market um, is hyperosmolar 
And so there is some concern with using that in patients who are at risk for hypernatremia. So. Um, and then coming back to you, Dr. Dacha, um, what do you think is the cause of lack of improvement in mortality in GI bleed over time despite the advances in technology? I mean, the, the simple answer is our patients are very sick now compared to what they were in the past. Like, you know, with more advanced therapies we have for especially cardiac patients, we have so many advanced therapies available. To start with, there are sicker patients and there is plethora of patients here with on oral anticoagulation. So it's a multitude of factors, more than the GI bleed etiologist changing. I think we have a question, yeah, Dr. Quigley. You're absolutely correct. Actually, it was shown several years ago that if you age correct the data, the mortality has actually decreased dramatically. The problem is that our patients have got older and sicker, and that's why the mortality, and even then the mortality has improved. I, I wanted to take um, Dr. Reardon up on, on something. As you know, there are other approaches which have been used to treat these patients, like celiac axis block, etc. cetera. Do you, do you think they have any merit, or should we forget about those? So I, um, there are some, some very small studies that show that if you block the celiac axis in people you've made this diagnosis, you can improve their symptoms. Um, the problem is that, of course, the blocks are all temporary, and then you'd have to ablate it. Um, most of my experience with that came from patients with pancreatic cancer. Uh, we certainly went through a period of time where using this, so the, the operations I do now, we use three millimeter trocars that's very small, sixteenth of an inch, and we used to put those same things in the chest and uh, divide the splanchnic nerves um, because that celiac plexus, once it crosses the diaphragm, um, turns into the greater and lesser splanchnic nerves. And the bilateral splanchnectomy we did all the time. The problem was that um, that operation led patients to say that, that we had improved their pain, but it did almost none of them became um, productive again. They still had um, low quality of life high use of narcotics. And so um, with this disease, you know, we use one eight milliliter trocar because if there's bleeding, you can put a suture in there and, and three three milliliter trocars and it's final. Um, we know we've extirpated the plexus and we know we have opened the ligament to its entirety because um, like the illustration showed, we stop when we get to the aorta and you circumferentially clear the root of the celiac trunk. But very, there's only very few studies where they bother to do that with a um, something like a long-lasting uh, anesthetic, and it, it in those people it had a high degree of relief of pain. Uh, they did not subsequently take that as their treatment. They simply used it to confirm the neurologic theory. So I have a follow-up question on that, on, and we'll be running out of time soon. Do you um, uh, ever think about those patients who are in that intermediate category where they're not stenotic enough, or you would try like an endoscopic ultrasound delivery of celiac plexus block? Well, so um, those people are um, fairly miserable, and they've <laughs> seen all the doctors you can think of, and I would think that that would be reasonable. Um, you know, and when you inject things in the uh, esophagus and then we have to get into the anatomic layers, there's some debate as to whether or not the injection of these things causes subsequent inflammation and makes the operation more difficult. And people get kind of antsy on the esophagus. I will tell you that um, most surgeons are not want to um, dissect down onto the celiac trunk, <laughs> strip it, and uh, clear it up to the aorta. And I just don't know. I, I've never seen somebody operate on somebody who had already had an injection of a simple substance like Marcaine. Um, and if it did not affect the operative planes, mm -hmm. then I'd be more than happy to operate on them with that as a diagnostic test. Okay. And last but not least, Dr. Schieser, which bowel prep is your least favorite? <laughs> the one she has to take. <laughs> No disclosures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't think that I have a least favorite. I mean, obviously, the one with the black box label, the sodium phosphate, I guess would be my least favorite because I don't use that one. <laughs> okay, with that, we're going to run out of time here. So thank you so much to our speakers today. And I'll give it back to Dr. Quinn. We have, we have a brief break of about uh, 10 minutes and then we'll come back for the next session. And don't forget to um, take time to visit the virtual exhibit hall and support those who have supported us today, without which, of course, we couldn't do this. So we'll be back again in 10 minutes.
I can tell you that even though a small number of people may be here, I think for obvious reasons, we have a very good audience following online, so that's really worked very well, which I'm glad to hear. So the last session, new views and old pro problems, I'd like to welcome um, Drs. Rosenberg and Barroso to chair this session. Thank you, Dr. Quigley, for inviting us to, to chair the last but not least and most important session of the afternoon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but the reason I, I, I have particular delight in, in being here as a chair of the session is my opportunity to introduce uh, uh, one of our truly homegrown uh, fellows, Dr. Ali Raza. Uh, Dr. Raza, you know, he did his residency at the University of Cincinnati, we'll forgive him for that. And then he saw the light, came to Texas, did a uh, one-year hepatology fellowship at Baylor, and that opened his eyes, so he came to uh, the Methodist Hospital <clears throat> and uh, did his GI fellowship with us. And the reason why that is particularly important is because Dr. Raza is the first generation of GI fellows of our program. We, uh, we didn't have any GI fellows before Dr. Raza showed up, and I had the privilege of handing him the first endoscope he ever touched as a GI fellow. <laughs> and that was in the uh, simulation lab, was not even a patient. <laughs> you know, so uh, that was uh, a very special moment, I remember that, and Dr. Raza spent three years with us. Then he took a year off <clears throat> and uh, did uh, Intervention Endoscopy Fellowship at University of Texas, where he had the opportunity to work at Lyndon B. J. Johnson Hospital for a year and they had a lot of fun that. And then he came to join us as an expert endoscopist in interventional and other endoscopies and is now assistant professor of medicine in our GI division. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing uh, Ali, who's going to speak with us today here about uh, the management of chronic pancreatitis, which is a very difficult, tough uh, subject in our specialty. Yeah. Ali? Thank you very much, Dr. Barroza. I remember that day uh, very clearly, six, seven years ago, when you handed me the scope in the sim lab. It was, it was a scary moment for me just to look at the scope. It was so difficult, and I was, I was not sure that I would be able to do proper endoscopy. But thanks to you and all of my faculty, um, you know, I had a good time here. So today we will be uh, talking about uh, managing chronic pancreatitis today. Uh, just a brief overview, we'll go over a few definitions of chronic pancreatitis, followed by what do we do in the diagnostic workup for the chronic pancreatitis, because it could be very difficult in certain scenarios to diagnose chronic pancreatitis. And then we will move on to the medical management, endoscopic therapies, and surgical management for the chronic pancreatitis patients. So if you look at the histological definition of chronic pancreatitis, um, it's fibroinflammatory state uh, which leads to the progressive fibrosis of the pancreas, and essentially it replaces the endocrine and the exocrine portion of the pancreas. Clinically, this is a syndrome which is multifactorial, and multiple etiologies can result in intermittent inflammation episodes. And those episodes lead to endocrine and exocrine insufficiency, produce a clinical syndrome, pain, steatoria, diabetes, and uh, that's the clinical way patients usually present to the uh, office. So historically, if you look at the autopsy studies, that's back from 1970s, 5% of the general population will have some sort of pancreatic fibrosis. So this is a spectrum. Not all of those patients who had pancreatic fibrosis were diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis because majority of them did not have any symptoms. So uh, this, is, this is significant overestimation of the prevalence of chronic pancreatitis. But a few prospective studies uh, uh, showed that the prevalence is equal in male and female, about 70 to 75 per 100,000. And it's one of the top three uh, 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 admitting diagnoses and the patient's presentation to the ER. But this includes include the uh, acute and the chronic pancreatitis, both. And this is a rise about 10 to 12 percent uh, compared to 2006. Now, this is just a cartoon explaining the exocrine and the endocrine portion of the uh, 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 pancreas. 
And during the disease process, patients have syndrome from exocrine insufficiency as well as diabetes from endocrine uh, islet cell destruction. So how do we categorize pancreatitis? Broadly speaking, we divide pancreatitis into three main different types. And each type uh, is a prototype. Uh, multiple etiologies could lead to one of these uh, uh, prototypes. The most common one is the chronic calcifying pancreatitis. And alcohol smoking, these are the most common etiologies causing chronic calcifying pancreatitis. Then there is chronic obstructive pancreatitis. There are multiple etiologies which could cause that. Inflammation, stricture, um, cancer, IPMN, serous cystadenoma, islet cell tumor, anything which is pressing on the pancreatic duct can cause dilation and increase pressure in the pancreatic duct. And then there is a distinct third type, which is a relatively newer type, is the autoimmune pancreatitis type 1 and 2. Now, this type of pancreatitis is quite different from the first two, which we just described, because this does not share features of calcifications and significant fibrosis early on, and it, it responds nicely to the uh, treatment. So, for, for today, uh, uh, we will be discussing chronic calcifying pancreatitis and obstructive pancreatitis. So, Back uh, 30 years ago, when we were diagnosing pancreatitis, ERCP was one of the first modalities which was used to diagnose pancreatitis. In 1984, Dr. Cotton and uh, colleagues uh, uh, proposed Cambridge classification, which is widely used and has been used in the past to define the extent of the pancreatitis. It ranged from Cambridge class 0, which is completely normal pancreatic ductal system, to Cambridge 4, when they have significant uh, dilatation of the pancreatic duct, side branch dilation, strictures, as well as stones. In between uh, is the different stages of pancreatitis and inflammation and degrees of uh, damage to the pancreatic duct. Nowadays, we do not use ERCP for diagnostic purposes, and uh, it has been replaced largely by the cross-sectional imaging, like CT scan, and MRI. So same Cambridge classification has been borrowed and it has been applied to the cross-sectional imaging uh, to define the pancreatitis. Um, Cambridge uh, class 1 is a little bit harder because it only has very subtle changes in the side branches. Usually one to two side branches uh, are dilated as it's hard to assess on CT and MRI. But Cambridge 2, 3, and 4, which is almost the same uh, findings which we found on the uh, ERCP previously have been described. Now, apart from CT scan, we also use endoscopic ultrasound to look at the gland and to define the extent of the damage and injury. EUS provides us uh, opportunity to look at the pancreatic duct, side branches, and parenchyma. 1986 was the first time when endoscopic ultrasound was used to look at the pancreas and define some changes of the pancreatitis. And since then, there have been various criteria and findings which are attributed uh, uh, to, the, to the chronic pancreatitis changes. And in 2007, formally, uh, in, uh, a Rosemont criteria was proposed. Uh, that criteria has major and minor uh, points, which would uh, then later on uh, define the chronic pancreatitis based on endoscopic ultrasound. Now, there are major criteria A and B based on the Rosemont criteria. So major A is hyperechoic foci with shadowing, which are stones um, uh, uh, in the pancreatic uh, parenchyma. And the pancreatic ductal uh, calcifications and stones are another major A criteria. Now lobularity with honeycombing is another uh, major B criteria. There are certain minor criteria for the uh, chronic pancreatitis, which include just the hyperechoic strands without honeycombing, irregular main pancreatic duct, more than three dilated side branches of the pancreatic duct, and hyperechoic main pancreatic ductal walls. So these features can be seen in, in these patients, and it's a different spectrum of, in, in, in all of these patients. Here are some of the representative pictures of the chronic pancreatitis. And uh, as you can see, um, the endoscopic pictures uh, in the top left, you can see the pancreatic ductal stone, and then you also see the pancreatic parenchymal calcifications, and there are some hyperechoic strands as well. On the right top, you see the picture with the dilated main pancreatic duct, 
as well as small cystic structures or small pseudocysts along the uh, uh, pancreatic duct. Some of those are dilated side branches if you look carefully. And the bottom one is the MRI of the same patient, uh, which uh, shows the irregular, slightly dilated pancreatic duct, dilated side branches, and small pseudocysts. So how do you compare all these diagnostic modalities? There was a good study in 2016 which compared the sensitivity and specificity of cross-sectional imaging with EUS. ERCP we do not use as I've mentioned for the diagnosis of the pancreatitis and transabdominal ultrasound has a very low sensitivity so we do not use that. It's CT, MRI or EUS. Uh, all three of these modalities have very good specificity and good and comparable sensitivity. So a clinical and practical approach would be if you're suspecting chronic pancreatitis, we should always start with a cross-sectional imaging like a CT scan or an MRI. If there is any doubt about the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis, the next step would be endoscopic ultrasound. So this is the main uh, uh, diagnostic algorithm for these patients. Now, how, how about the patients who have early chronic pancreatitis? Are there any other tests which we can do to identify those patients early? So if you evaluate the exocrine function of the pancreas, some studies have suggested that the changes can be appreciated on the exocrine direct evaluation even before the cross-sectional imaging. Uh, secretin test and CCK uh, stimulation test are one of those main tests. So th these are usually very difficult to do uh, clinically and are not routinely done. But in clinical cases which, in which there is suspicion and uh, uh, some question about the diagnosis, this test can be done. Um, a little bit easier test would be indirect evaluation of the pancreatic exocrine uh, uh, insufficiency and we check fecal elastase. Um, less than 200 microgram uh, per uh, gram of the stool would be uh, suggestive of uh, chronic pancreatitis and exocrine insufficiency. And less than 100 is very, very specific. Uh, for this, usually uh, you need a formed stool sample rather than a liquidy stool sample. Another way of indirectly looking at the exocrine function would be 72-hour fecal fat evaluation, but that's hard to do. It's rarely done clinically. Now, how do we manage chronic pancreatitis? There are three different issues with the patients when they come to the clinic. Pain is the most important one, followed by exocrine issues and the endocrine problems. Pain has multifactorial reasons, and there are different pathways which have been proposed that the pain is caused from those things. For example, um, the neural pathway, celiac plexus, that is attributed in a lot of cases of the chronic pancreatitis. Obstruction of the pancreatic duct causing ductal hypertension, which can lead to ischemia of the pancreas, has also been proposed. And uh, we see that once we relieve the ductal hypertension by surgery or endoscopy, patients' pain significantly improve. Um, pancreatic enzymes are not really the treatment for the pain management, but usually the bloating and the IBS type of symptoms which these patients have higher compared to the general population, the pancreatic enzymes tend to improve the symptoms of uh, bloating and distension. For exocrine insufficiency, we have to recognize it early on, and once we diagnose it, we should start the pancreatic enzyme supplement and replacement therapy. And we should be uh, checking these patients for the fat-soluble vitamin deficiency and at least following up in the clinic once a year. If the pancreatitis is very advanced and the tail of the pancreas is affected, then diabetes becomes a problem. And this is type 3C diabetes, which is brittle diabetes, as well as very hard to control. These patients usually are started on the metformin and then very low doses of insulin. These are prone to hypoglycemic at attacks because the counter-regulatory mechanism is also uh, affected in these patients. Okay, so we start with the medical management. We see the patient, look at the images, review the endoscopy, ultrasound, and whatever other available tools we have, and the diagnostic workup. We assess the patient for the exocrine insufficiency, look for multivitamin deficiency. The most common symptom is pain, and actually 100% of the patients with chronic pancreatitis will have some pain at some point in time. So uh, the initial... Uh, 
investigation should be to look for any anatomical reasons which can be corrected in the, uh, to control the pain or start the patients on the low dose non-opioid medications for the pain relief. Tricyclics and gabapentin uh, are one of the initial medications which we start on. Uh, opioid medications, a lot of these patients require those at some point in time, uh, usually later in the course of the disease. So pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, there are a variety of enteric coated and non-enteric coated uh, pancreatic enzyme uh, supplements are available, which can be given and started once the deficiency is identified. So for diabetes, usually we start the patients on metformin, but these patients we have to be very careful about because they can develop hypoglycemia on small doses of insulin. They have no glucagon regulatory mechanism. So a lot of times uh, endocrinology input will be advised in these patients. Coming to the endoscopic management, uh, when do we decide on endoscopy in patients with chronic pancreatitis? Well, if we look at the image as if the patients have multiple cysts or they have the strictures in the main pancreatic duct causing the obstruction, stones, um, then we consider doing endoscopic therapy. The stones and strictures can cause ductal hypertension leading to pancreat pancreatic uh, typical symptoms of pain and discomfort. Um, and then obviously we uh, talked about celiac plexus block uh, before and uh, this has been used periodically for the treatment of chronic pancreatitis for every three to six months in patients who respond nicely. So biliary uh, strictures are another complication, especially when the head of the pancreas is involved and uh, bile duct uh, uh, becomes compressed in that area. We'll talk about one of them. So these are, this is just a representative picture of a cyst. In chronic pancreatitis, we can see patients who have multiple cysts which are small or who have large one single cyst. And the drain, drainage of the cyst is the main uh, stay of the treatment for these patients. These days, transmural drainage using the lumen opposing metal stents is easy and quick way for the draining large pancreatic cysts, usually more than five centimeter in size. These cysts are usually symptomatic. Smaller asymptomatic cysts do not need transmural drainage and those are really hard to drain. Uh, if the cyst is formed because of the stone in the main pancreatic duct or stricture in the main pancreatic duct, then these cysts will not get better. They will actually get worse. So in those situations, we do pancreatic sphincterotomy, insert a pancreatic stent, um, and uh, uh, drain it that way. Very rarely, we need a combination therapy for transmural and transpapillary drainage of the cyst. But the main idea is try to treat the strictures and stones so the cyst can get better. Now, pancreatic stones are different compared to the biliary stones. Those are hard and difficult to remove. Um, and they can cause inflammation, ongoing ductal hypertension, ischemia, and pain. Uh, traditional endoscopic ways to remove the pancreatic stones, it's not very successful. Stones which are larger in size, larger than five millimeter, we use extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. Now, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy is not available widely, and they have different protocols. But these studies which were done for uh, uh, lithotripsy um, show that there is excellent clearance of stones, especially if they are more than five millimeter. A lot of studies which were done for SWAL also included ERCP to clear the duct after the SWAL procedure was performed. Um, the other option is uh, pancreatoscopy and spyglass. We use, uh, 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 use the lithotripsy devices and try to break the stones. Success rate is much less than the biliary stones, which uh, actually uh, are removed much easier. Laser lithotripsy through the pancreatoscopy is also another option for these patients, um, and it's available in few centers. Uh, previously, we used to place one stent in the pancreatic duct to drain the duct and try to control the pain, but now recent studies have shown that if you place parallel multiple stents, then the long-term pain relief is much better compared to a single stent which is placed for a short-term period. And pancreatic strictures cause the pain from the same mechanism as we described, which is ductal hypertension, and it can worsen the cyst formation. 
Uh, treatment for these patients is obviously ERCP. Initial step is to do the sphincterotomy and dilate the cyst. Uh, depending on each individual patient, the nature of the cyst, the, the length of the cyst, and the location of the cyst, we can place a stent. If the, cyst is if the stricture is located in the head or the neck of the pancreas, then a longer pancreatic stent is easier to place across the cyst. And recently, uh, there has been more and more data about fully covered self-expanding pancreatic stents, which is six or eight millimeter in size. And those stents were placed in few of the patients and they had excellent results in long run. Uh, this study, uh, which is from 2019, is a retrospective review of the patients who received fully covered self-expanding metal stents in the pancreatic duct, and they had significant reduction of pain scores and significant increase in the ductal diameter at the stricture area. This is slightly, this is comparable to the surgical outcome as well. And these are some of the pictures of uh, pancreatoscopy. Uh, Pancreatogram is done. As you can see, there is a stricture at the neck of the pancreas. After dilation, a fully covered self-expanding stent was placed and a plastic stent was placed within that fully covered stent uh, for anchoring. This patient responded nicely and he did not have any pain after the ERCP and stent removal. Now for pain control, apart from doing the ERCP sphincterotomy stent placement, lithotripsy and stone removal, uh, celiac plexus block has been performed and it has good results in patients who respond nicely. Uh, in traditional celiac plexus studies, a uh, significant number of patients, about two thirds of the patients are able to reduce or come off from the opioid medications after the celiac plexus block. And these patients usually require celiac plexus interventions three to six months, depending upon uh, how uh, they uh, react to the plexus block. If the pain control is significant and this is improved, then they usually benefit uh, after three to six months of re-intervention. For surgical management, um, usually the surgical management uh, is considered when the patient has failed endoscopic therapy and they have the dilated pancreatic duct. There are various types of surgeries. For example, if the patient only has a dilated main pancreatic duct without any inflammatory mass in the head of the pancreas, then pusto procedure or lateral pancreatic ojejunostomy is the procedure of choice. And it has significant pain relief in these patients. About 80% have durable pain relief five to 10 years after surgery. Uh, this is better than uh, endoscopic uh, pain relief, which we have, uh, uh, which we have discussed before. Uh, so in this, in this procedure, no pancreatectomy is performed, no resection is performed, no core tissue is removed from the pancreas, just a longitudinal incision along the pancreatic, main pancreatic duct is made, and then astomosis is made. It's, uh, it's low morbidity compared to Whipple procedure or other extensive pancreatic surgeries. Now what if a patient has an inflammatory mass in the head of the pancreas and uh, they have chronic pancreatitis which did not respond well to the endoscopic therapy? So in these patients, there are three or four options. Uh, Whipple surgery, traditional Whipple surgery is one. Frey procedure, Byrne procedure, or Berger's procedure. If, the, if there is a risk and concern for malignancy in that inflammatory mass in the head of the pancreas, then uh, uh, Whipple procedure is usually considered. But less uh, extensive surgeries, for example, Frey procedure, uh, in which you just resect the head of the pancreas without, you know, just core resection of the head of the pancreas is done, and uh, there is lateral pancreatic ojejunostomy is performed without doing a full Whipple or pancreatic duodenectomy. So this has also good outcomes. And burn procedure and Berger procedures are also some. Uh, 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 modifications of pancreatic ojejunostomy of different type. So what should we consider surgery versus endoscopic therapy? This has been a debate for a long period of time, but we have seen that two trials which were uh, available to us showed that the surgical response in the pain control as well as the symptom control steatoria and other symptoms were much better and durable. After five years, surgical outcomes were more durable compared to the endoscopic outcomes. But these two trials have been heavily criticized regarding uh, 
the patient selection as well as multiple endoscopy is not being performed or parallel pancreatic stents were not used. And in these uh, 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 trials, fully covered self-expanding metal stents were not inserted for the stricture uh, in the head of the pancreas. So uh, having said that, newer studies with the fully covered metal stents as well as multiple parallel pancreatic stents which are left in place for a year, they have good outcomes at one to three years. So more studies are required to just see what are the longer term outcomes for these patients. But as a general rule, whenever there is a consideration regarding surgery or endoscopic therapy, usually endoscopic therapy is less invasive and it's con considered as a first step. So as a summary, the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis could be challenging. And early chronic pancreatitis is sometimes really hard to diagnose and most of the time is dismissed. The first step is CT and MRI scan, followed by endoscopic ultrasound if there is any doubt in the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. Pancreatic biopsy is rarely needed. Um, and in fact, uh, the sampling from the, for the, pancreatic, uh, uh, from the pancreatic tissue is, is, is uh, not diagnostic in most of the cases. An early endoscopic management and quick step-up approach for the patients who fail the endoscopic management should undergo surgery. And uh, uh, important thing for these patients is we should be on the lookout for exocrine insufficiency, multi and fat soluble vitamin insufficiency, and development of diabetes. And uh, uh, it is a multidisciplinary approach it should be used for the patients because they need surgery, GI, primary care, as well as endocrinology. And always we should talk to them about uh, cessation of smoking as well as um, alcohol. Because those, uh, if the patient continues to smoke or drink, these uh, changes will continue to get worse and endoscopic therapy or surgical therapy is not very beneficial in these patients. Any questions? Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, let's take a time. We're going to go ahead and move right along, and we have our questions at the end of the, of the session. Also, gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Bushehead. You know, Daniel has recently joined us. He comes uh, predominantly from the University of Washington in Seattle, which it, uh, he had his uh, uh, MD degree, and uh, then he went away for a little while at the University of Pennsylvania, got his medicine training over there, and then came back to Washington for his GI uh, fellowship. And we are fortunate to you you know, uh, bribe him down to come to Texas and join us in our faculty where he has a broad spectrum of activities, being uh, one of our outpatient experts as well as uh, special interest in motility and also covers the hospital service. So he deals with a large variety of GI pathology. And he's gonna talk to us today about infectious gastroenteritis, what to treat, and I'll be most interested then in what not to treat. So hope you address both. Daniel. Uh, so thank you. Um, this, this is a topic that has hit a little bit closer to home as I have a one-year-old who was recently in daycare, so I've become a little bit more familiar with the symptoms of uh, an infectious gastroenteritis, unfortunately. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about infectious gastroenteritis in a pretty broad overview in terms of uh, what should we treat or rather what clinical scenario we should treat in and how we should treat. I have no disclosures. So the aims of my talk, again, I'm going to first talk about diagnostic testing in infectious gastroenteritis. And secondarily, I'll talk about to, uh, how to identify when and how to treat infectious gastroenteritis. So taking a step back in terms of global health, so really infectious gastroenteritis is, is primarily a problem of developing countries. And it's a big problem around the world, although in terms of global burden of this, uh, of this condition, it's really seen primarily in developing countries. Um, you can see here in this graph where the, the darker colors represent a higher death rate from diarrheal illnesses, which are kind of, uh, which are, uh, is, is equivalent with an infectious gastroenteritis for, for the talk, purposes of this talk. You can see here that Sub-Saharan Africa, 
uh, the, sub the subcontinent with India and Pakistan, Southeast Asia, those are the main places that have really the highest burden of mortality from infectious gastroenteritis. So it is very much a global problem. Uh, moreover, um, you can see here the age distribution, and infectious gastroenteritis, gastroenteritis historically has also been a very significant cause of morbidity and mortality in very young children, uh, particularly less than five years old. So uh, there are really two things I want to mention with this graph. The first is that you see that the highest risk group, at least back in 1990, um, in terms of death from diarrheal illnesses around the world uh, was uh, children under five years old, but also older people, 70 plus, are also fairly high risk. Now, fortunately, with the advent primarily not just of antibiotics, but also oral rehydration therapy, the mortality uh, in children, very young children, from infectious gastroenteritis has decreased markedly, thankfully. Um, it's been a big target of uh, foundations like the Gates Foundation um, uh, that seek to really improve global health outcomes. But unfortunately, in the older uh, cohort of uh, people around the world, infectious gastroenteritis is still a problem. You can actually see in this uh, graph here, it actually went up over the past uh, several years in the 70 plus age group. So it's really a problem of young children, of older people. It's getting better in younger children, but it's still a problem in older people. So infectious gastroenteritis is not just a global health problem, but it's also a national problem. Every year, one out of six Americans acquires a foodborne related diarrheal illness. There are about, depending on how you, uh, on how you estimate these numbers, about 4 to 17 million uh, cases annually of infectious gastroenteritis in this country. Um, and it's linked to numerous chronic health diseases in the gastroenterology community, of course, functional GI disorders, post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome, are, uh, is, is probably the most widely known uh, chronic health sequela of an infectious gastroenteritis that's typically acute and self-limited. But we also know that there is reactive arthritis, as it's called now, Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, even things like hemolytic uremic syndrome. So it's not just a problem in the acute sense, but it can also lead to chronic health conditions afterwards. Infectious gastroenteritis is not just a global problem and is not just a national problem, but is also a local or you could say Texas problem. Um, I don't know how many of you enjoy Bluebell ice cream, um, but they had a very, uh, they, they, they were a little bit notorious recently for a listeria outbreak. Now, listeria is a cause of gastroenteritis, and this was an outbreak. Now, this is based very close to Houston and Brenham, Texas. Um, so, uh, but, but this, depending on, on where the distribution was, uh, there were cases in numerous states in, in the South and the Midwest um, from infectious gastroenteritis, from listeria, from bluebell ice cream. Uh, and there were actually several deaths from this. Uh, when I was growing up in Seattle, Washington, there was a very well-publicized jack-in-the-box outbreak of, of uh, E. coli uh, that I think also led to maybe a death or at least some very severe complication. Uh, so this pops up in the news often in the setting of mass food production uh, in this country. So in turn, before I talk about um, more specifics in gastro infectious, ga infectious gastroenteritis, I want to just define some things. So diarrhea, in terms of a diarrheal illness, is defined by having about three or more looser liquid stools per 24 hours or above a prior baseline. Uh, acute is typically defined as up to two weeks, persistent two to four weeks, and chronic over four weeks. So in terms of indications for testing for infectious gastroenteritis, the most important thing to understand is that infectious gastroenteritis can be from a whole host of different pathogens, including viruses, bacteria, and parasites. Now, the, what I like to call the old school method of, of uh, making a diagnosis in terms of identifying a pathogen in infectious gastroenteritis uh, involves um, really a laborious and expensive process of culture, staining, microscopy, looking for certain antigens, sometimes even electron microscopy. And this was really not very high yield. In fact, in this, in this kind of old school method of identifying pathogens for infectious gastroenteritis, uh, the, the yield was, was not high in most cases. So most cases, you're not really identifying the organism. Uh, sometimes it can take up to 72 hours for a result to be certified. So it's also not a very fast process, 
particularly given the fact that these infections usually are fairly acute and self-limited, so the patient may be asymptomatic by the time you get the culture result. There is the need for differential culture media, um, which I think now serves just as a fodder for questions for step one, where you have to remember what culture media and what grows in what, but I think has very little clinical relevance to practicing at least GI, I can say personally. Uh, and again, it's expensive. So that is the old school. Fortunately, there is a new school, and the new school is, um, entails testing stool uh, via PCR and molecular methods, basically amplifying DNA. Um, and these are, this has really supplanted the old school method um, of trying to make a diagnosis in terms of identifying a pathogen in infectious gastroenteritis. So you can see here that the main things I want to highlight from this table are that there are five FDA-approved tests in order to identify, these are all molecular, aka PCR-based tests, to identify pathogens in infectious gastroenteritis. Um, the detection time is much faster, anywhere from two, or rather one to five hours. And the most robust of these tests, which is the BioFire Diagnostic Panel, which is what I typically use here at Houston Methodist, um, identifies up to 22 pathogens. And this uh, includes bacteria, viruses, and parasites. So it's fairly comprehensive as a one test to order um, to get at the most common pathogens causing infectious gastroenteritis. Uh, this is a little bit more detail about the BioFire. This is from the, the company's website, but you can see the specific pathogens that are identified are really the most common causes of infectious gastroenteritis. This includes Campylobacter, C. diff, E. coli, Shigella, um, Giardia, norovirus, rotaviruses, um, all very common culprits in big outbreaks um, of infectious gastroenteritis. So this is what you get to test for. And again, the results are typically available within several hours, even on the inpatient service, typically by the next day in terms of when they actually process the specimen, you can expect to get an answer. And this is really what is utilized primarily in the hospital and the outpatient setting. Now, that's not to say that this new school way of diagnosing infectious gastroenteritis is uniformly superior. There is a question of, this, of these tests being potentially too sensitive. For instance, um, it's very common to carry uh, even toxigenic C. diff strains, but that's not actually causing disease in many people. Um, and if you're detecting asymptomatic carriers, you may be uh, confusing, let's say, a patient with IBS and thinking they have chronic C. diff if, they, if they're found to be a carrier for, let's say, toxigenic C. diff. So there's a question of maybe you're identifying too many pathogens in terms of they aren't actually causing disease, but they happen to be colonized because the tests are so, so sensitive. Um, and the second limitation, I think, primarily is from a public health perspective, which is that in terms of identifying pathogens, in terms of uh, guiding outbreaks, uh, in terms of identifying novel pathogens, those diagnostic techniques really depend on the old school method because the, uh, the molecular PCR-based tests are almost binary. You have this pathogen or you don't. But if there's a pathogen you didn't test for, if there's a pathogen that you want a culture to determine resistance, or if there's a novel strain, this, these new PCR-based tests will not necessarily be the best option. So if there's a concern for a public health outbreak, um, for instance, the Listeria outbreak from, uh, from the creamery, uh, then it's typically recommended to use, utilize both methodologies in terms of the new school molecular PCR tests and the old school culture-based tests because the culture-based tests are still primarily what is more useful in the public health population-based setting. Uh, but the conclusion is, certainly in my practice, the molecular PCR-based tests are almost always preferred in the day-to-day -day management of patients both in the hospital and outside of the hospital for infectious gastroenteritis. Now, in terms of when to think about testing and treatment, um, I want to clarify some definitions. So dysenteric diarrhea refers to bloody diarrhea. Watery diarrhea refers to non-bloody diarrhea. Um, uh, as with many things in medicine and in GI, for instance, in IBD, we characterize things as mild, moderate, and severe, sort of arbitrarily, but mild is defined as having an infectious gastroenteritis with very few limitations in doing your daily things throughout life. Moderate, you have some functional limitations, and severe would be someone who comes to the hospital because they're so severely debilitated by their symptoms from infectious gastroenteritis. And traveler, although you could argue that maybe that should include traveling to Brenham, Texas, but traveler typically means travel to a developing country, not necessarily travel to New York City. 
Um, in terms of the treatment, so it's important to remember that the treatment for infectious gastroenteritis is the same for everyone in terms of the cornerstones of therapy. And that is really making sure you are providing adequate oral rehydration. And as we may remember from medical school, this is all based on the principle of sodium coming with the glucose and water following sodium. Because when you want to hydrate someone, you don't want to necessarily give them a bunch of water. You want to reconstitute their total body sodium, which will draw water in. And the way to utilize that is actually to use sugar with salt. So we think about things like soup broths and saltine crackers. Those happen to be um, home remedies for an acute diarrheal illness, but they also utilize this beneficial pathophysiology. And this has really been what's revolutionized the treatment of diseases like cholera, um, where a solution that includes both sodium and glucose has been much more beneficial in terms of treating diarrheal illnesses around the world. And I, I think those developments really are responsible for that bending the curve in young children around the world with infectious gastroenteritis. So in terms of thinking about when to treat and how to treat, so we utilize those definitions that I just mentioned in terms of traveling versus not traveling, mild versus moderate to severe, uh, and also uh, bloody or dysenteric diarrhea versus watery diarrhea. So if you have a mild episode of just watery diarrhea, it is most likely to be a viral pathogen. Uh, for that reason, it is not recommended to seek empiric therapy or even necessarily undergo stool testing. And you can treat these patients symptomatically with antimotility drugs like loperamide or antisecretory drugs like bismuth subsalicylates, and it's the salicylate component that is the antisecretory component of that therapy. In terms of moderate to severe watery diarrhea, again, non-bloody diarrhea, um, if it's traveler's diarrhea, you really have a much higher suspicion for a bacterial pathogen. So it's recommended to undergo empiric treatment with antibiotics, which I'll get to in the next slide, in addition to loperamide. Um, and loperamide, in addition to empiric antibiotics for traveler's diarrhea, has been shown to, uh, to, to shorten the duration of symptoms uh, to about 24 hours. And this table discusses common antibiotic regimens for empiric treatment for traveler's diarrhea. Uh, typically, you're thinking either a fluoroquinolone, such as ciprofloxacin or levofloxacin, or azithromycin. Um, those are really the most widely used um, drugs for traveler's diarrhea, and I'll get to a little bit more detail about choosing which one in a few slides. But these are really the options for traveler's diarrhea and something to think about taking with you or buying in a pharmacy if you're, let's say, traveling to a developing country and worried about developing traveler's diarrhea. Um, in terms of moderate to severe watery diarrhea that is not associated with traveler's diarrhea, uh, if there's no fever, then it's recommended, again, because of the higher suspicion that it's likely a viral pathogen to just continue with symptomatic therapy. If there is a fever, depending on the duration of illness, that affects in terms of if you pursue molecular stool-based testing or if you continue to watch and wait. And for both of these options in terms of febrile or non-febrile, um, depending on the symptom duration and how the patient is doing, you can always jump to a diagnostic testing modality. But in terms of empiric treatment, you're really not thinking about antibiotics. You're thinking more likely a virus, consider supportive therapy, um, assuming it's not associated with travel. But again, that does depend a little bit on how the patient does. In terms of dysenteric diarrhea, for dysenteric diarrhea, you're thinking much more likely about a serious pathogen, a treatable pathogen, such as a bacterial pathogen in terms of infectious gastroenteritis. Um, if you have no fever, go straight to stool testing to try to find out what is causing the, the dysenteric or bloody diarrhea causing the infection. Um, and if there is a fever, again, in the setting of traveler's diarrhea, because we have a very high suspicion of an infectious pathogen, uh, that is a bacteria, uh, is recommended to undergo treatment with azithromycin plus loperamide. And if it's febrile but not associated with travel, again, you want to get some information about is this a virus, is this a bacteria, prior to initiating empiric treatment. Um, there is a caveat, which is, um, as we all learned in medical school, shigatoxin E. coli, in terms of treatment with antibiotics, has been associated with hemolytic uremic syndrome. However, I also came across a meta-analysis that questioned this in the, the validity of this uh, correlation in adults. Um, and I think if you have shigatoxin E. coli, it would not be totally unreasonable to treat someone with careful observation. But there is that... Uh, at least historic association with causing HUS that makes all of us nervous whenever we see shigatoxin E. coli. In terms of choosing uh, for traveler's diarrhea, azithromycin 
or ciprofloxacin. We can look at the medical center with Herb Dupont, who was one of the authors of the ACG guidelines on this topic that I referenced for this talk. Um, and he's done numerous studies comparing the efficacy of different antibiotic regimens uh, for traveler's diarrhea. And this was a study where it was comparing, where he compared azithromycin to levofloxacin for traveler's diarrhea in uh, patients who were coming back from Mexico. Uh, this study was from uh, it was conducted prior to the advent of molecular PCR-based testing. So just keep in mind that these diagnostic tests that are referenced here in terms of identification of a pathogen are not the PCR-based tests. Um, and you can see here that in about 100 patients for both groups, only about a half to two-thirds had any pathogen identified. If this study were repeated with PCR-based testing, that yield would assuredly be much higher. Um, another thing to mention with this slide is that ETEC, E. coli subvariant, is the most common cause of traveler's diarrhea. Um, and the main point of this table is to show that the efficacy is really equivalent between choosing azithromycin versus levofloxacin for traveler's diarrhea, most of which is associated with ETEC. This is another figure uh, that also shows the comparable efficacy between azithromycin uh, and levofloxacin. Uh, on, the, uh, on the x axis is time, and on the y axis is patients with diarrhea in terms of the proportion. And you can see here that the lines cross and are almost identical, meaning the treatments are also essentially identical. In terms of traveler's diarrhea, now why is azithromycin favored for patients with dysenteric traveler's diarrhea? Um, the, most of the evidence-based base for antibiotics in traveler's diarrhea utilizes fluoroquinolones rather than azithromycin. There are head-to-head -head trials between those two antibiotic regimens, but if you're looking at placebo-controlled data, it really favors uh, fluoroquinolones as opposed to azithromycin. However, there is a concern in numerous parts of the world, particularly in Thailand, that there's more resistance to fluoroquinolone in numerous different bacteria, including Campylobacter in particular. Um, and also there's this thought that azithromycin may just be a little bit um, more safe to give patients in general than fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones have potentially a higher association with C. diff, um, and also, of course, with other side effects like tendon rupture. Although azithromycin, like any medication, does have side effects, including potential, including potential QTC prolongation. Um, but for those reasons, azithromycin is typically preferred for traveler's diarrhea. So if you were to be traveling to another country post-COVID and want to take something with you, probably want a short course of azithromycin uh, for symptom control and impaired treatment if you were to develop an infectious gastroenteritis. Now, the, um, this is a slide in which I say don't read the slide, just know that it exists. So the point of this slide is not to read it, but to say that there are some wonderful guidelines with, uh, authored in part by Dr. DuPont uh, at the Medical Center um, that go through kind of an algorithm of what I also mentioned in terms of when to think about testing and when to think about treatment. And it's guided not so much in terms of identifying a certain pathogen, although that is more um, more available with the novel diagnostic testing, but it really depends more on clinical scenario in terms of travel or not um, and other factors. So uh, in conclusion, uh, the first point I hope to have made is that molecular PCR-based uh, testing is by and large superior to old school uh, culture-based microscopy-based testing for identifying pathogens in infectious gastroenteritis. The second point I want to make is that beyond the utilization of the sodium glucose co-transporter in which oral rehydration solution is the cornerstone of treatment for infectious gastroenteritis, beyond that, in terms of thinking about utilizing these stool tests or in terms of treatment, either empiric or directed, that really depends in large part on clinical scenario. And the clinical scenarios are thought about, at least in terms of this disease entity, illness severity, mild versus moderate to severe, illness duration in terms of 72 hours, less or greater than, diarrheal type, is it watery or dysenteric? That changes your suspicion for this being potentially a viral versus bacterial pathogen. And also, is there traveler's diarrhea? Um, and understand that in traveler's diarrhea, in addition to considering empiric treatment, typically most have begun to favor azithromycin as opposed to a fluoroquinolone. And that's all I have, thank you.
Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ed Chan. Ed is a uh, member of the thoracic division in the Department of Surgery. He has an interest in both uh, uh, reflux disease and uh, uh, advanced pulmonary disease. So he'll be speaking about the treatment of uh, GERD in patients with advanced lung disease. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today to uh, the Underwood family as well as the organizers. Um, thank you, Dr. Rosenberg, for the introduction as well. Uh, my name is Ed Chan. I'm one of the thoracic surgeons here at Houston Methodist. Uh, in my day job, I specialize in thoracic surgery with an interest in esophageal and lung surgery with minimally invasive uh, platforms with the robot. Um, after regular business hours, I also do lung transplantation, so I have the privilege of taking care of our patients with uh, severely advanced lung disease. So in that capacity, I want to talk briefly about how uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease can affect the lungs and particularly our lung transplant patients. Uh, I do teach educational courses for Varen Medical Technologies. I have no other uh, relevant disclosures. So for my talk today, I'm going to review some details about GERD and how it affects our lung transplant patients. I'll talk about our workup to evaluate these patients. Uh, I'll follow that up with a discussion of some of the surgical options we have for this disease. And I'll conclude about talking uh, about a specific population of our uh, lung disease patients with scleroderma. So we're all very familiar with GERD, with gastroesophageal reflux disease. It's incredibly common with, um, in the overall population, about 10 to 20 percent of patients with symptoms. Obviously, it has potential for very serious complications, including Barrett's esophagus, esophageal cancer, or esophageal strictures. Uh, in the transplant population, we don't have great data as to how common it is, although some estimate that about 50 percent of patients with end-stage lung disease have uh, reflux as well. Uh, prior to transplant, and then up to 70% of patients after transplant are found to have reflux. So uh, reflux is highly associated with graft dysfunction as well as rejection. And so clearly this is a different beast from our non-transplant patients and requires a very aggressive approach to manage. So whereas in the general population, um, we're operating to relieve symptoms or to help patients get off their PPIs, in our transplant population in which their outcomes are so closely related to their graft function, this becomes more of an issue of life or death. The data are limited, but more research is emerging. This is a paper from 2020 from the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation in which they correlate higher concentrations of bile acids and inflammatory markers from BAL washings of transplant patients with reflux. So certain bile acids were associated with higher incidence of allograft dysfunction uh, as well as in elevated inflammatory protein levels. BAL markers obtained after, uh, after anti-reflux surgery uh, was performed contained lower levels of these bile acids and proteins. This is a paper from the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, also from 2020, which discussed the role of surgery uh, to prevent graft dysfunction after lung transplant. It found that performing anti-reflux surgery can, in fact, halt or slow the decline of PFTs in the presence of reflux. The authors performed a meta-analysis of retrospective observational studies, finding that anti-reflux surgery <clears throat> may be beneficial to transplant patients with declining lung function. So just to take a step back and review some of the basics, uh, the key to keeping acid in the stomach is the lower soft gel sphincter. Uh, if it doesn't work well, acid flows more readily out of the stomach into the esophagus and potentially up into the lungs. If there's a hiatal hernia, like you see on the right side, where the stomach and the LES are displaced up into the chest, this becomes a major risk factor for uh, the esophageal sphincter to be incompetent because it's subject to negative pressure up in the chest, and therefore the sphincter stays open more often. Our preoperative testing involves a couple of main, two primary tests uh, mainly. High-resolution esophageal manometry involves placement of a transnasal probe that sits across the LES. As the patient swallows, the probe uh, measures along the manometry catheter, uh, the strength and the progression of the peristaltic wave. 24-hour pH impedance testing, which you see on the right side, uh, involves placement of a small flexible probe several centimeters above the LES 
and data are recorded continuously over a 24-hour period to measure the frequency and duration of reflux symptoms, and they use that to correlate reflux symptoms with the symptoms uh, recorded by the patient. So this allows for a quantitative way of measuring how severe a patient's reflux is. Now of note, while impedance testing is usually done off of the patient's medications for seven days, often for our transplant population, we keep them on their, their medications during the impedance testing. So we can see some artificially low Demeester scores because there's very little acid reflux. So in this situation, it's important for us to look at the non-acid reflux events in this patient population because even non-acid refluxate that can reach the lungs can be potentially injurious. We can use manometry to help us decide how tightly we can reinforce or repair the LES. On the left, you see a normal tracing with good progression of the peristaltic wave down the entire length of the esophagus with no significant breaks. On the right-hand side, you see a study reflective of abnormal motility where the wave fails to propagate all the way down. So when it comes to surgery, we perform these hiatal hernia repairs minimally invasively with, uh, I use a Da Vinci XI robot. Uh, in patients with normal manometry, I typically, re typically recommend a Lynx device. Uh, essentially, it's a bracelet that goes around the lower esophageal sphincter. It's composed of individually magnetized titanium beads that can stretch out when food passes through, but then returns to its original shape afterwards. You can see with this cartoon here how the links around the LAS increases the tone of the LAS to prevent acid from escaping the stomach, but then when bolus of food comes down, it stretches out to accommodate. Now, the alternative to a lynx is a more traditional surgery uh, called a fundoplication. And this involves taking the fundus of the stomach, wrapping it posteriorly around the esophagus. Uh, in patients with poor motility, we do a toupee fundoplication, which is what you see on the right-hand side, a posterior 270-degree wrap, um, as opposed to a Nissen fundoplication on the left, which is the posterior 360-degree wrap. With a posterior 270-degree wrap, the toupee fundoplication, we can offer the patient good reflux control without compromising their ability to swallow. Another important consideration is when to do surgery. So there's no consensus across the transplant community and it becomes very institution specific. Performing surgery before the transplant may improve symptoms enough that the patients can delay the need for transplantation uh, and it might provide an optimized environment to go into the transplant such that you don't have to worry about reflux postoperatively. However, it's important to consider that in patients who are very sick with advanced uh, lung disease, putting them through general anesthesia and then a major surgery can put them at high risk for respiratory complications postoperatively, like pneumonia or uh, prolonged intubation. More commonly here at our institution, we perform interventions after transplant. So we usually, it allows us to minimize the number of uh, procedures in case uh, they don't need it after the transplant. Uh, and it can be done more as needed for symptoms and for a decline in lung function. Uh, this is a paper from Annals of Thoracic Surgery from last year from the lung transplant group at St. Joseph's in Phoenix, which is one of the busier uh, transplant groups in the country. This describes their experience with fundoplication early after lung transplantation. They looked at five-year outcomes in 86 patients, uh, and they divided between early fundoplication versus late fundoplication, with six months as sort of the cutoff between what early and late was constituted as. They found that patients who had early fundoplication after transplant had better lung function at five years than those who had late fundoplication. So I want to take you through a couple of case scenarios. <clears throat> this first patient is a 68-year-old woman who had a 30-year history of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, three-year history of worsening uh, interstitial lung disease. When she came to the transplant center for evaluation, um, she was on three liters of oxygen, going up to four liters on exertion. She, had a, she was found to have a five centimeter type three hiatal hernia and symptomatic reflux for which her medication was only intermittently controlling her symptoms. This is our preoperative imaging, uh, which this is a softgram that shows us a moderate sized hiatal hernia. Can I get this to play here? Thank you. Shows a moderate sized hiatal hernia with part of the stomach and the LES above the diaphragm. And, um, We'll see from her CAT scan also that a fairly sizable hyaluronia hernia uh, up above the diaphragm.
if you could play that as well. So here we have some intraoperative video that demonstrates the hernia. She's got a large hiatal defect. You can see a significant amount of herniate, of stomach herniate through that large hiatal defect. And you can see how in this case, you know, you can pull the stomach down, but it won't stay down. You know, it'll quickly snap back up unless we can really free up all the tissue that's holding it up there. So by letting go of it, it just goes right back into the, into the mediastinum in the chest. Oh, sorry, go back one slide, please. And you can play that as well. And so here we fully mobilize the esophagus as well as the lower esophageal sphincter. We've mobilized the whole hernia sac so that um, we're able to get the entire uh, esophagus into the abdomen. We're putting stitches to close the crus to, uh, to close up the defect in the hiatus and reduce the size of it to prevent re-herniation of the, of the uh, stomach. And you can play this as well. And here we've finished positioning the Lynx device, snapping it closed around the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, we place it inside the vagus nerve to help it from migrating, help prevent it from migrating. Uh, for this patient, she did very well post-operatively. She went home one day after surgery with no reflux symptoms, and subsequently her breathing improved so much that she was able to be weaned off oxygen and didn't need to be transplanted at all. So it's unusual for that to be the case, but rarely do we have you know, great success stories like that one. Uh, just one more case I'll present in the interest of time. This is a 51-year-old with scleroderma who underwent bilateral lung transplant in 2020. Um, <clears throat> scleroderma obviously is a very tra challenging uh, disease for, for transplant centers. A lot of centers across the country don't transplant patients with scleroderma, mostly because of the esophageal issues related to their post-operative care. Uh, at Methodist, we're one of, the, one of the few centers that does offer it, and we're one of the busier centers uh, for scleroderma patients. We sort of instituted a, a protocol in which we keep our patients NPO uh, with only uh, GJ tube feedings for six months postoperatively. So it seems like a lot, but you know it, it, it is effective, and uh, patients know that going into the, the transplant that they'll be NPO for six months. Um, in her situation, she had an esophagram that showed us a small hiatal hernia, as expected. Her manometry had zero percent motility. Uh, and on the impedance testing, she had 44 reflux episodes with a demester of 17.8. If you could play that, please. So because of her, her poor motility, we did a partial wrap or toupee fundoplication for her. You can see how we're pulling the stomach posteriorly around the esophagus, and then we suture it <clears throat> with a 270-degree closure uh, around the distal esophagus. So um, this is uh, a, a paper that we put out a couple of years ago in Annals of Thoracic Surgery describing our institutional experience with scleroderma patients. Uh, we described 26 patients uh, who had bilateral lung transplant for scleroderma, comparing it to um, 155 patients that we had transplanted for restrictive lung disease. Uh, and you know, we, obviously, we had the same protocol in place, uh, keeping them MPO and having them uh, on feeding tube feeds for six months, and we showed that there was no difference in survival uh, at five years between the restrictive lung disease patients and scleroderma patients. Uh, often the, the concern for transplant centers is that patients with scleroderma will have uh, significantly worse outcomes because of their esophageal dysmotility, but while we have a pretty good protocol in place, you know, a lot of different centers have different protocols for their esophageal management after scleroderma transplantation, but this has been a a very effective one for us thus far. So in conclusion, uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease is a serious problem in lung transplant patients that can lead to significant morbidity and mortality. Thorough workup with esophageal manometry and pH testing is crucial for determining both the severity of disease as well as the appropriate steps in management. Uh, aggressive and proactive surgical intervention can help to slow or reverse the decline in lung function due to reflux and in some cases can even delay or avoid the need for transplantation entirely. Thank you very much. Whoever speaker is accommodated. 
Dr. Rosenberg uh, presents his apologies. He was called urgently to the operating room, so he, he had to leave. But uh, we'll uh, go ahead and start with our questions. We have a good number of questions here. And uh, Dr. Bougia, the first question is, is for you, I guess. So will uh, antibiotic therapy prevent post-infectious IBS? Um, I, I assume you mean antibiotic therapy for a particular bacterial pathogen. I mean, it certainly makes, makes theoretical sense that if you were to uh, have targeted therapy against a particular pathogen, that would shorten the duration of illness. And in terms of what we think causes post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome in terms of dysbiosis, in terms of changes to the enteric nervous system, Theoretically, you would think that it potentially could uh, decrease the incidence of post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. However, we also know that antibiotics themselves cause a dysbiosis. Uh, so, I, so I think it would probably depend on the certain pathogen, but uh, I'm not aware of any studies that have shown that there is necessarily a benefit. But theoretically, I think there certainly could be. Yeah, I think it would require a pretty large study. Yeah, to, yeah. and to if you think about all the different pathogens for uh, for infectious gastroenteritis in terms of isolating one group of patients to follow them long-term enough just from having one pathogen causing their disease, uh, I think right now it's just theoretically interesting, and I don't think it would be a reason to necessarily treat beyond not treating, but if you have a pathogen from the novel testing, then it's, it's, probably, it's pretty hard to, to not treat if the patient would otherwise benefit acutely, and there may be a long-term benefit as well. All right. Uh I think we should start from the bottom, right, and go, go up, or maybe not. Well, let me, let me ask you this other question since you're, you're on it. What is the false positive percentage of PCR-based stool tests? And we have this, you mentioned that it's such a sensitive test that mm -hmm. may uh, not always represent a clinically significant disease. So should you culture everybody that's PCR positive or? So, so, the, so the, the, both the sensitivity and specificity are very high for the molecular PCR-based tests when compared to gold standard culture. Uh, so I would have confidence both in terms of ruling out and ruling in based on that fact. All right, so you're, you're on a roll here, John. So let me get you for, for the next one. Would you change your recommendations for testing and treating infectious diarrhea if the individual is immunosuppressed? So, so yes, absolutely. Um, and uh, for patients, and, and this is one of the several clinical factors that I did not mention, but it goes beyond just the four or five that I happened to discuss. But there actually have been studies that have given patients who are immunosuppressed and therefore higher risk for infectious gastroenteritis prophylactic antibiotics when they travel to high-risk areas like developing countries. And there actually has been a benefit in those patients in terms of shortened duration of illness and preventing episodes of infectious gastroenteritis. So absolutely, um, the, the, immune the immune status of any given patient does play a role, both in terms of empiric treatment or potentially earlier testing. And given the, the ease of doing the molecular PCR-based testings, it's probably difficult to not do testing in a patient who is, immune, who is immunocompromised, you may have a more unusual pathogen. Um, so as long as it's, it's available in terms of they're in a country or a healthcare facility that offers it, I think it's absolutely reasonable to pursue that for immunosuppressed patients. Very good. And this is probably a quick one. Is Listeria detected in the new tests? I do not know. I'd have to check. Yeah, I, I don't know if it is. Yeah, I don't recall. There are 22 different pathogens there. but. All right, uh, let me uh, move now to Dr. Chan. There's a question about the uh, surgical management of scleroderma patient with gastroesophageal reflux disease, but no lung disease. How do you approach uh, these patients? They're very, uh, very difficult. Yeah, certainly challenging patient population. Um, you know, we would approach them in a similar way to a patient with, with regular reflux. You know, we do manometry testing and, and impedance testing just to quantify and try to evaluate how severe their reflux disease is. I mean, I'd be surprised if they ever had any motility on their manometry study, but if they have, you know, significant reflux from uh, their impedance testing, then we'd offer them uh, a two-pay fund application. Uh, and obviously, there's, there's some, we have to be judicious in terms of how tightly we make the, how tightly we wrap the LES in that situation. Um, one thing I didn't talk about in my, in my presentation, but that we use intraoperatively is endoflip, which you know, many of you might be familiar with. So at the time of surgery, we put the endoflip balloon right at the LES and keep it inflated so that we can have 
dynamic real-time measurement of how tight we're making the LES. You, you keep the endo-flip balloon inflated That's right. So during I've the procedure. So I inflated to 30 cc's, put it right across the LES, you know, as opposed to sort of the old school way of just putting a bougie down, which is one size fits all kind of. This is sort of a, a more personalized way of making sure you've got a measurement that's just right for that patient. And you can tell as you're doing each step of the operation how tightly narrowed the LES is becoming. So often with a patient with scleroderma or with a big hiatal hernia, you'll have a really huge DI at the beginning of the operation after you've freed up the hernia. And then with each step, when you close the hiatus, when you do the wrap, you'll see a subsequent decrease in the DI and its distensible leading index as you do, uh, as you tighten the LES. And we can check at the end of the operation to make sure that's not too tight, that we think the patient will have some dysphagia afterwards. So all these considerations are, are taken into account while we're doing the operation. And, and what's your, and this would be my question, what's your goal as far as the DI on, on, on your patient during surgery? Do you keep it at one, two, three, five, six, it's, seven? It's a good question. I think that there's a lot of research still being done on the endo flip. I don't think we have great standardized numbers. Maybe a year or two ago, we used to aim for certain goals for each step of the operation. What we've sort of evolved to now is making sure it looks good clinically, like it doesn't look too tight, and then making sure the DI is not too low at the end of the operation. So if it's usually above 0.8 or so for a DI, then we're satisfied that that's a pretty uh, good wrap without being too tight. Uh, if it gets below that, then we can always cut a stitch out or, or redo part of the repair at the time of surgery. So we, we know you know, before the patient leaves the operating room that they'll have a good outcome. Very good. Dr. Raza, you're, you're, you're next here. There are several questions regarding the pancreas. The first one is, is there any decrease in life expectancy with chronic pancreatitis? Yes, we have known that chronic pancreatitis has decreased life expectancy in the long run, as well as decreased quality of life. Multiple studies have shown that that's why the emphasis is on early diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. Uh, with minimal changes so we can intervene. Does on. it get any better if you treat the chronic pancreatitis the way you described? Yeah, if you treat it early, then the life expectancy uh, significantly does not improve, but it improves compared to if you do not treat it. Okay. All right. Next question is, uh, when do you consider refer for total pancreatectomy with islet autotransplantation? Very good question. Uh, you know, the different surgical management for the chronic pancreatitis, which should including pancreatoduodenectomy, fray, and burn procedure, when the, the, the chronic changes in the pancreatitis is severe enough and diabetes is uncontrolled and the duct is not very dilated and pain is not controlled with initial endoscopic management, for example, stent placement or with the removal of stones, then that is, that is a patient, if he is young, then he should be referred for uh, total pancreatectomy with auto islet cell transplant. I think one of the data suggests that uh, you should try something for two or three years and, and uh, then send it to, before the, to the pancreas is completely destroyed and you don't have any islet cells. cells left. Mm -hmm. uh, could a couple of questions about uh, pancreatic insufficiency. There's been uh, quite a, the question says there's a, quite a bit of promotion recently to suggest we are underdiagnosing exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And uh, the other question that we had here is the use of these uh, enzymes. I think you mentioned that as far as Spain. But, uh, yeah, there is uh, some enthusiasm for enzyme replacement for pain control, but that has subsided. Uh, right. Uh, so, any comment on that? Yeah, so uh, as I explained, that when you start someone on the pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, part of uh, symptomatic improvement in the patient is from IBS symptom improvement, bloating and distension improvement. Now, they do not have that much malabsorption. That causes some improvement in the pain, but the pain per se, which comes from the pancreatic inflammation uh, and the celiac plexus inflammation and the perineural inflammation, that does not get improved with the uh, enzyme replacement therapy. Very good. Now, a very important question, I think, the link between new onset diabetes and pancreatic cancer. Can you comment on that? I mean, I think that's a very important question, particularly for the primary care doctors uh, yes. dealing with these patients. That's a very important question. As you know that, uh, especially in the elderly population, if this is a sudden onset, new onset brittle diabetes, uh, then the, the concern is that there could be a primary pancreatic malignancy, especially in the tail of the pancreas, which usually is asymptomatic. So that's the rationale behind it. So these patients should be screened for a subtle mass in the pancreas uh, by doing cross-sectional imaging 
um, to define if there is any lesion which is causing that. Now, primary pancreatic adenocarcinoma can do, do that, as well as neuroendocrine functional tumors can cause hypoglycemia too, uh, or hyperglycemia, depending upon the type of the uh, neuroendocrine tumor. So I think pancre pancreas needs to be investigated in this patient population who are middle-aged to elderly for any pancreatic lesion. Excellent. Very, very good. Well, uh, anyone has any additional questions? Uh, Dr. Quigley. So, to, to, for Dr. Chan, um, you alluded to this in one of your slides, but I just wondered if there is a lot of data on the relative contributions of acid and non-acid reflux to lung deterioration in the lung transplant patient. It's a good question. I, from what I found, there is very little written about the difference between acid and non-acid reflux in that, in that population. Um, <clears throat> I think that individual centers sort of develop their own protocols. What we do here is, like I said, you know, we look very carefully at the impedance testing, and we really you know, give a lot of credence to the non-acid reflux events because our patient population is so specialized and because they're really not doing the test the way that, that, uh, that most patients are, you know, doing it on their PPI so that the demeester is artificially low and there's very few acid reflux events. Some, um, some of the literature I've seen has, has set a cutoff of about 80 reflux events um, over a 24-hour period to be significant. Uh, I would say that you know, that's, that's a relatively high number, um, and I think that we're a little bit more aggressive in intervening, even at a, at a lower number. Um, and you know, one, one of the nice things about our transplant population also is that they're, you know, very eager to, to participate in their own care, and so we are able to, to gather a lot of data, uh, you know, pre and post fund application, pre and post transplant to sort of remeasure how they're, uh, how many episodes they're having. And so we're in the process of, of accruing a, a large body of data to, to see what kind of impact we're really having on, on these patients uh, after surgery. I just wonder if you use Bravo testing for say up to 72 hours or do you prefer to do pH impedance for the, that reason? So for the transplant patients, I almost exclusively use impedance because it's reported as both, reflu as, as both acid and non-acid reflux. And then for my non-transplant patients, I'll use Bravo almost all the time because they don't have the discomfort of having the tube hang out their nose the whole time. But, and I, I don't know the details of this exactly, but I don't know if Bravo will occasionally report acid versus non-acid, but at least in the, the reports that I see from our lab, it right. doesn't distinguish between acid and yeah. non-acid. So that piece of information is pretty key in my assessment in looking at the transplant patients because of their PPI usage. But my non-transplant patients, most of them prefer the Bravo to impedance testing. And I'm sorry, question for Daniel about, you mentioned Guillain-Barre, which has been linked to Campylobacter. Yeah. Um, again, the same, you know, the same question, there was an earlier question about antibodies preventing PIRBS. Can if treating Campylobacter, which we don't usually do, um, would that make a difference in terms of preventing Guillain-Barre? It's, it's relatively rare, so it's probably hard to know. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a tough question to answer because of the rarity of the outcome for any potential study, um, although there certainly is a theoretical mechanism behind that. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's unknown at this point. Um, and I think it's tough to make definitive conclusions in terms of treatment of a particular pathogen, infectious gastroenteritis in general, because it is so varied. Oftentimes, the culprit pathogen is not identified, um, and if, especially if you have a rare outcome, it's, it's tough to power a study to truly answer that question. And Dr. Chen, I have a, one question, which is not really about the esophagus, but we see a lot of uh, gastroparesis or delayed gastric emptying in the lung transplant population. Is there a consideration for any intervention in the stomach to accelerate gastric emptying at the time of transplant? Yeah, that's a great question. That's something I didn't address in the, in the, um, in the presentation either. You know, uh, it's true that we have a very high instance of gastric uh, emptying delay after lung transplantation. Um, and I think it's really uh, um, an iatrogenic process because as we do the transplant and we explant the lungs, you know, the vagus runs directly posterior to the hilum and when the lung is severely scarred down and we're trying to take out the lung, it's very difficult to, to preserve those, those nerves as we take it out. You know, we're trying to be as quick as possible. Sometimes we're on cardiopulmonary bypass. So a lot of times the vagus gets injured um, or 
you know, severed even at the time of transplant. And so as a result, we have this really high instance of delayed gastric emptying afterwards. So it's a challenging population. It's a challenging uh, issue to, to address. Um, I routinely get gastric emptying studies in those patients to, to assess their gastric emptying. And you know, at the time of a high hernia repair or some sort of intervention on the LES, if there's a delay in the gastric emptying, I'll usually inject Botox in the pylorus at the same time um, and sort of see how uh, the patient responds to that. And sometimes it's driven by patient symptoms also, if they're having more bloating, if they're having more early satiety. Uh, and oftentimes the, the Botox injection will work you know, obviously for a few months at a time. Sometimes they'll resolve it as the function of the vagus returns, if it hasn't been completely severed or if it has only been damaged a little bit at the time of surgery. Um, and then after the Botox injection to the pylorus, once, maybe twice, I'll usually have a conversation with the patient about whether they want to continue doing that every three months or something, whether, you know, uh, a lot of times we involve our GI colleagues to, to uh, start doing that as well. Um, and then if, if we see an improvement in their symptoms uh, as a result of the Botox injections, a lot of times we'll do either a pyloroplasty or a pyloromyotomy um, uh, as a more permanent solution to it as well. Or sometimes we're doing endoscopic, endoscopic GPO on these Exactly, days. sometimes it's, endoscopic it's, as well. It's, it's available. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Uh, I don't think we have any more questions. So we're out of time. Time's up. <laughs> right, thank you very much for all your participation, for all of those that uh, stay with us so late to talk quickly. Thank you very much. So we finished absolutely perfectly on time to the second. I'd like to thank both speakers in this panel, our chairs, and thank everybody for, for being here. Um, the majority of people who have attended this have attended online. Um, and I thank all of you who are here and say hello to all of you who are online and thank you for being with us. And before I leave, just again remind you that as regards CME, an electronic evaluation will be mailed from Houston Methodist CME to the email you use to register, complete the course evaluation, and you'll be prompted to, pay, to print or save your certificate. And again, finally, I want to thank our exhibitors, AbbVie, Boston Scientific, Bristol Myers Squibb, and Takeda Pharmaceuticals USA. And thank you all for being here. <laughs>